We're live from River Valley Room. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to July 11th Community and Public Services Committee meeting. I would like to start by doing a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit and now settlers from around the world. Next, we will do a roll call. I'll start with committee members. Councillor Rice? Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Knack? Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Paquette? Good morning. Good morning. And I'm not sure if the mayor has joined us this morning. Mr. Mayor, are you there? No? Okay. Councillor Wright? Good morning. Good morning. And I will just see uh, if we have any other councillors online here. I don't see any online. If there are any, please make yourselves known that you're joining us today. All right, maybe we'll have some join us later. So I, I'll ask um, one of my colleagues to please uh, move adoption of the agenda. Madam Chair, I'm moving. Be please. Oh, Oops. go ahead. Oh, I'm moving. Adoption of the agenda? Yeah, I move the adoption of agenda for July 11th Community and Public Service Committee meeting. And be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, any questions? Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Uh, approval of the minutes. Councillor Knack, would you please? Thank you, Council Principal. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the June 19th, 2023 Community and Public Services Committee meeting. Thank you. Any questions, omissions, errors? Seeing none, I'll ask you to please vote. I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Next, we're going to move on to protocol items. So this morning, we have a community peace officer graduation. You might be hearing some bagpipes in the background as they uh, may be doing a little bit of practicing. So I'd like to take this time to commend the peace officers from class 40 who will be graduating at a ceremony in City Hall today. Each of them will play a key role in strengthening security across our city, from our downtown to our transportation networks to our parks and our neighborhoods. And their work to prevent crime and connect those in need with resources will help revitalize our economy and re rebuild our city's vibrancy. This is truly important work. It is val valued very much so by all of council. Edmonton, like many cities across North America, has experienced an increase in crime and disorder. Our city council is working hard to push forward community safety efforts, including adding more peace officers to Edmonton's ranks. In fact, we are investing more than $13 million to hire additional transit p police officers, expand the community outreach transit team, and enact evidence-based crime reduction strategies. The peace officers graduating today have heeded our call for more boots on the ground to improve the safety and well-being of all who call Edmonton home. They are key players in the city's Healthy Streets Operations Centre, which is already showing positive results with a significant reduction in crime severity. I'd like to thank each police officer for peace officer, sorry, for doing this and police officers for doing this important work while showing compassion towards our most vulnerable and commitment to keeping Edmontonians safe. Congratulations, and I'm looking forward to seeing the impact of the lives on all Edmontonians. All right, and next. Here is um, another protocol item. I'd like to take this time uh, to honor the legacy of former manager Cyril Sai Armstrong, 
who passed away on June 24th. On behalf of City Council and City Administration, I would like to extend my condolences to Sai's family and friends who are mourning, particularly his wife Joan, his sons Dave and Jerry who are watching via live stream. Sai was born and raised on a fruit farm in Beamsville, Ontario by parents who immigrated from Northern Ireland. He graduated graduated from Royals Road Military College as a flight officer and received his wings in 1949. In 1952, he graduated in civil engineering from the University of Toronto and went on to work in local government for almost 40 years. When Sai headed west, he served as the city manager for Edmonton between 1986 and 1990. Without Sai's past contributions, our city would not be what it is today. His dedication to public service, integrity, positive energy and kindness were traits that served him well in his role. And Sai set a standard quality of work that all Edmonton city managers now embody. Sai leaves behind a legacy of accomplishments that Edmonton was so grateful to experience many years ago. His family shared some of his most impactful memories here in our city. I'm going to share some of those with you this morning. The tremendous support he received from the mayor and council to make difficult yet necessary decisions. And this is, uh, thank you for sharing. I'm so happy that the family shared these with us because um, it helps us to get to know who he was a little bit better. So this one I quite liked reading. The jaywalking ticket he received during his first week on the job. Meeting the incredible Edmonton Oilers. Working for a day as a laborer on a garbage truck to better understand the job. What, what leadership, that's very impactful. And another um, special moment, I guess, uh, also for his son Dave, when he called his son Dave from a helicopter while surveying the destruction caused by the 1889 uh, tornado. But more than this, Sai remembered all of the great people he worked with. He was so proud of his time in Edmonton. Last week, Sai's life was celebrated in a private service in the church his family has attended since 1924. Following the service, uh, RCAF Harvard, the type of plane when Sai gained his wings, flew over the church with Sai's flight jacket in the back seat. It circled back twice and tipped the wings. To the family, friends, morning, I hope you take this time to reflect on Sai's incredible contributions to public service, both here and across the country. I know we are all um, celebrating his legacy with you. And thank you and rest in peace. And thank you to the family members to join in, for joining us this morning online. So carrying on with our agenda. Could I please ask my colleagues to sign up to select items for debate? Councillor Paquette, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I will just uh, select all the items. Okay. Seven one, two, seven three, and eight one. Okay, great. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Yep. Vote on reports not selected for debate. There are none. Uh, request to speak. So we do have um, some requests to speak. And I will make the recommendation that Community and Public Services Committee hear from the following speakers and panels when appropriate. 
on item 7.1, assisted snow programs. We have Laura Cunningham Shepley from Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. Laura, are you with us? I am, and I'm here just to answer questions only. Counselor. Just to answer okay. questions. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you. And Tonya LaRiviere. Good morning. Good morning. And then on item 7.2, cost sharing partnerships with organizations to increase small scale community amenities. We have Punita, Punita McBrien. Punita, are you online with us? Maybe she'll be joining us later. For item 7.3, community park amenities program, we have uh, Jennifer Janvier. Oh, hi. Hi, welcome. Uh, Shelly Bell. I am here. Good morning. Jennifer McDonald. Benjamin Schroeder. Heather Langenhan. Hi, good morning. And Laura, we already sp spoke with you this morning. And Holly Leader. All right, and then on item 8.1, the current status of city-enabled and city-provided Indigenous business supports, we have Brooks Hanowich. Hi, I'm here. Hi, good morning. Okay, great, so I'll just ask my um, colleagues, or we don't need to vote on speakers, correct? We do need to vote on speakers. Oh, we do need to vote on speakers, okay. Well, I'm sure I'll ask my colleagues to uh, vote on speakers. Please. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Oh, yeah, I was quite confident that would carry. All right, next. Request for st specific time on agenda. I don't believe that we have um, any time specifics. Councillor inquiries. None. Reports to be dealt with at a different meeting. None. Requests to reschedule reports. None. Unfinished business. None. So we'll head over to our reports and our administration on item 7.1. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Good morning and thank you. I'm Jennifer Flamman, Deputy City Manager for Community Services. Today I'm joined by David Jones, Branch Manager of Community Standards and Neighbourhoods, and his director, Keith Scott. The report presented to you today is for information only, outlining previous assisted snow removal programs provided by the City of Edmonton. There's a jurisdictional scan of assisted snow removal programs across Canada, including looking at the current program implemented by Calgary for the Specialties Assistance for Seniors Benefit Program, and a summary of potential opportunities for assisted snow removal programs for Edmonton, including a rough estimate of resources and cost implications. Since 2014, the City of Edmonton has managed two snow removal programs to support Edmontonians who were unable to remove snow from their sidewalks. The Snow Angel program was a volunteer recognition program that ran from 2014 to 2017 and focused on community nominations and a city-led recognition program. The second program was the more recent Snow to Go pilot program that was a grant funding program run through community leagues. As neither program was considered core service at the time, both were unfunded and there are no plans to continue with either at this time. A jurisdictional review was completed and attached to the report. The scan found that other Canadian municipalities provided various types of programs, including grant funding, volunteer-based, and contracted social enterprise initiatives. Some of these programs provide partially or fully subsidized services based on demonstrated financial need and were funded with ranges from $100,000 to $520,000 per year. Three options for developing an assisted snow removal program for Edmonton have been identified and presented in the report. High-level budget estimates range from approximately 109000 to 777000 annually, with some mitigation for funding offset by leveraging the Provincial Special Needs Assistance for Seniors Benefit Program. Given the existing funded government of Alberta program, administration will amplify communication and increase information avenues in order to maximize and leverage that provincial special needs assistance for seniors benefit program, which is approximately $1,300 per year for seniors over 65 that financially qualify, and other external snow removal programs online via 311 and through targeted communications campaigns to support Edmontonians requesting snow removal services. Thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Wonderful, thank you. We're going to go uh, next to our speakers. 
uh, Laura Cunningham Shepley was only for uh, to, for questions, so I'll go to Tonya Riviere. Please go ahead, Tonya. Um, actually, let me go through the uh, um, the speaker's uh, speech. How how we the process. So for each item, administration uh, may provide opening remarks as they just did. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Speakers will be heard in panels and when each speaker will have five minutes to present, the clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The timer turns on the, the tur timer lights on the podium will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow for the last minute and flash red when five minutes are up. If you're participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions or you, of you or other panel members. So for this reason, we ask that you uh, remain in the meeting if, uh, so we can ask questions. Uh, if you are participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function as this creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, you can reach out to the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation or at uh, city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you are here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it is your turn to speak. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate and city staff will direct you to your muster point. So having said that, please, uh, Tanya LaRiviere, please go ahead. You have uh, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tanya LaRiviere. For those who don't know, I chair the Accessibility Advisory Committee, which I will refer to as AAC. As an advisory board to Edmonton City Council, the AAC strives to understand the community's accessibility needs and prioritize them in the context of City Council's strategic objectives and policies. Snow and ice control is a priority concern for the AAC. For years, this committee has spoken about the impact snow and ice has on individuals with disabilities and seniors. We know that each member of this council is aware of the concerns and sympathetic to the need for improved snow and ice control to allow for independence and safety of all Edmontonians. We all know the risks are heightened for seniors and those with a disability. Seniors and the disability community cannot be overlooked during the winter season. It is a matter of life and limb. We are here today to express our support for option number two, the expanded snow program. It leverages provincial funding for eligible seniors, reducing the financial cost for the city. Hiring three full-time employees contributes to a structured organization and service delivery system. As a committee, we often talk about the importance of coordinated efforts. We agree that using existing data via DATS and assisted waste collection is the most direct cost and labor efficient method to determine need and the opt-out system automatically removes a barrier to communication and service. We feel option number one, leveraging the provincial assistance snow program, although an important benefit program for seniors is narrow in scope as the benefits only apply to seniors and not individuals with disabilities. Option number one, three is the Snow Angels Volunteer Program. Our concern is that this is a recognition program that would lack a structured approach, accountability and reliability. Even with a renewed approach, history has shown that a recognition program has not been successful. Snow removal is the responsibility of all Edmontonians. As you motioned, the AAC will work with Snow and Ice Admin on an educational campaign for business and neighborhood snow and ice control. We must take a multifaceted approach to service, education and responsibility to ensure everyone's independence and safety. The weather quickly shows independence is hampered by snow and ice but it is also hampered by the city's and community's inability to deal with it. Obviously, this will not address all snow and ice controls, uh, control concerns, but it is an important step that will positively impact those who need the service and the broader community. Thank you to the council and admin for considering and researching assisted snow removal program. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I will ask my colleagues to sign up for questions. Councillor Paquette, you selected this item. Would you like to go ahead first? Uh, sure, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Tonya, for coming out 
Uh, it's good to hear your voice every single time and it is meaningful. So thank you. Um, and I hope that we can demonstrate that it's meaningful through action. Uh, so um, maybe uh, just a quick question for Laura. Um, does EFCL have any information on how many leagues were consulted on snow to go and how many leagues were using the grant? There was quite a few leagues that signed up for the snow to go program. And so I think what that says to me is that there's a lot of interest to Tanya's um, comment that, that it's a community responsibility. I think leagues want to help out their neighbors with this program. Yeah. Yeah. And in the report, it's been indicated that sort of that's a program that, uh, you know, maybe wasn't incredibly subscribed to uh, citywide in an equitable equitable fashion, I guess you could say, for people who might have need. Has that sort of been the EFCL's experience as well? You know, we weren't very involved with it, Councillor Paquette, okay. so yeah. I, I can't speak. I, I, I know that we have asked that there be another um, approach looked at, and I really appreciate the report that administration has put forward. Um, the snow to go program did pose a few uh, liability concerns for leagues that we've talked to administration about. And so we're hoping that then some of the new approaches will address that. Okay, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Now, uh, Tanya, just a, a quick question. Um, so of the options that, that you saw in the report, um, is, there, is there a preferred option for you? Option number two. That's number two. Without modification, just let's go with number two. I, I'm not too sure exactly what modifications would be beneficial. That would, you know, require more more conversation. But as it stands, option number two is a really good choice. Okay. All right. Which is interesting. I'm going to have to go back to uh, this Cunningham. Uh, Shpeli, if it's okay, then on that response, um, in our report, it says that EFCL, uh, or it says um, that uh, communities wouldn't necessarily support that option. Do I have that right? I think my understanding is that community leagues could be positioned to help advertise and support the program to their neighbors is my understanding of that option. So they wouldn't be accountable, like leagues wouldn't be accountable for that work getting done. They would encourage their neighbors to sign up for the program and it would run through the city is my understanding. Yeah, okay, so that makes sense because I've got a, I've got a community league that really tries to go all in on this and it's, uh, um, but, they've got the alternate program, like the current program that they're accessing funds from that isn't as holistic. So I can, do you think that that's sort of, that experience is what is maybe has a chilling effect, no pun intended, that uh, community leagues sometimes feel like they're doing this, uh, generally organizing it all on their own? I think that, that can be part of it. And I think there is a liability concern. Slip and falls are really a, a huge liability and for community leagues who can have programs that are on licensed land, when they start doing work and programs off of that licensed land, Councillor Paquette, it gets really complicated. And so that's why we really want to encourage them to support this sort of program that the city is responsible for and accountable for, and that the leagues can then ensure that their residents can access. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, that's a good point, because then there we have communities who really want to run this program. And so uh, some interesting conversations ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Love. I don't know if it's Ms. or Mrs. in these days. Uh, Tanya, I'll keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, public speakers here. I just want to see the snow removal specific for assisted snow removal program is really important uh, for our citizens for this some special needs. So I am I'm, I'm very glad I brought this motion uh, last year and asked administration and the council supported this motion and that is how we see the report back to us in front of us today. So I want to say that, uh, I want to express my graduation uh, first for that. 
Um, so my first question and to Laura and from Community League Federation. Uh, so what I heard from many Community Leagues during the past few months, I was attending Community Leagues AGM. Um, I heard some like comments regarding the challenge and for community leagues to implement certain programs, including uh, Assist Snow uh, program, the pilot program, and say the existing and finish by end of 2022. So can you tell me a little bit more about what you heard, uh, what's a challenge for our city to continue to implement existing uh, pilot program for the snow removal to support some special needs uh, or Edmontonians need those? Yeah, I, I don't know specifically, Councillor Rice, what concerns um, the leagues had. I think, you know, as you can hear today, there, there are varied needs across the city, depending on the demographics of each neighbourhood. And so I think that going forward, this is what the EFCL really appreciates, is the city taking the lead on this program, leagues then understanding how neighbours can connect into that program and really supporting that program that way. You know, community leagues have a lot of work on their plates already to do just with the work that's involved with the events, the, the amenities that they manage on their tripartite land and looking after the snow removal on that is, is their responsibility. And so we really want to say, how can we ensure that they can connect residents in their neighbourhood to appropriate services that are supported through the city? And that's the way that we want to see this program going forward. Uh, I, I understand and I think the from positive side and even from my uh, my personal view and we really uh, I hope our city and it could put lots of effort and to support this snow removal program and then in particular we are discussing today and for the special needs including seniors <clears throat> that is my hope on the other hand I heard uh, community League actually faced lots of challenge for the volunteers shortage and also liabilities and some like the insurance uh, some challenge and I I say I say the law hate lot and in the room right now and for this so that is why and then there's three options in front of us I think we will based on discussion to decide which option will be the better option for us to continue this program. So thank you, uh, that's my first question. And the second question, I'm going to Tania. So Tania, thank you very much for coming to speaking. I think that is really, really important. We have the voice from our advisory, accessibility advisory committee to bring the leads and in front of the council. Um, so. In your speech, you mentioned provincial special needs assist, assistance program only focus on the seniors. And I just want to get a clarification. Based on my research, I found this program, special needs program, actually not only for the seniors. The, cover, the scope of the coverage is bigger than only seniors. They also cover on some like special needs and including and some people with limitation, with limited accessibilities. And uh, that is my understanding. So can you provide a little bit more clarification from your understanding how this uh, provincial program? Uh, you know what, I might be mistaking a uh, provincial program with the well, and maybe Keith can comment on this a little bit more. The um, assisted program that Calgary is using for uh, individuals with seniors, and that um, includes some light housework, um, lawn mowing, some snow removal. Um, so I apologize. I was un I assumed that that provincial. Coverage okay. included like included that. So, but maybe Keith could comment on that a little bit more than I. I could. Uh, okay. No, no apologies at all. Uh, need it, and then because we are all learning about the program, and then from what I learned, and this program actually covered uh, more scope than just only seniors. 
uh, that is my yeah. understanding, and I will confirm that with city administration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, Laura, I'm just wondering, so some of the challenges were the insurance and, 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 and getting volunteers to go out and do the work? Yeah, yeah. that's correct. So, yeah. so when you say um, the city taking the lead, would, would that be to provide the insurance coverage as well? That would be preferred, yes. Okay. I'll ask if that's a possibility. Um, and then how do you think we could generate more volunteers? If there was like, and I think you said there was, there was many community leagues that signed up. That's right. What, what challenges did they have in getting the volunteers? Um, I don't know if it was a challenge in getting the volunteers, Councillor Wright. I think the challenge is making sure that those volunteers commit to the snow removal requirements, right? Okay. We know that it's not always fun to have to be out there every morning at seven in the morning to remove the snow, right? And so when you lean that heavily on volunteers, unfortunately, not it's not going to be done in the consistency that I think some of the residents are looking for. And so that's why I really like option two that really provides a little bit more around that structure, structured program. We do have residents in our community that need that sort of snow removal. And that's really important. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair to just assume that volunteers will be able to pick up that sort of commitment. Definitely, we always know there are great neighbors out there who will go and just keep on shoveling when they're out there, yeah. but they might not be able to do it on the schedules that some people require it to be done. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah, people's good intentions don't always <laughs> materialize, okay. Um, and Tanya, um, so last night at our AAC meeting, um, we talked about this a little bit, um, and I'm just wondering, is, is this enough, like, any of these options, is this enough to, to make our, our sidewalks more accessible for people? Or is, is there more that's needed? No, there's definitely more that's needed, but we think that this is a very important component uh, that will go a long way and help those individuals with disabilities or seniors who can't, but also um, clear those walks for those who are in the community who are more vulnerable. And, and, and I, I, I say that um, with, you know, specificity, but all Edmontonians in snow and in the winter when it comes to snow and ice are vulnerable as well. So this is something that will definitely benefit the community, but there needs to be that multifaceted approach. So this is a component. This will make it better and better is good, okay. um, and then there needs to be education around it as well. And education for who? For businesses, for neighborhoods, for neighbors, um, on the importance of snow and ice, and also um, how, like specifically for businesses, how to control, um, remove snow so that there are accessible paths. Okay, and... So the educational campaigns for um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask, I guess, Mr. Jones afterwards about enforcement. Um, would that, would that help? It, like, would it, would enforcement of those that don't clear their sidewalks help with the mobility of, sorry, of Edmontonians? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's directed to you. I, oh, I'll have to yeah. wait to ask Mr. Jones later, but I'm just okay. wondering. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And thank you okay. for bringing that up. Okay. And then, um, yeah, because I know we had talked about it last night too, about it's, yeah, it's, it's not just people that, um, that need help shoveling their snow, it's, it's others that need to, to get out there and shovel too. Um, I think that's all I had for both of you speakers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette. Oh, I'm just on the board for questions of administration to make things simple. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions to our speakers? It doesn't appear so, so please go ahead, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and may I say you're very cheery this morning. It's nice. Not that you're not always cheery, you actually are. And that can be annoying. But anyway, to the questions. I'm kidding. 
so this is a great report. Um, thank you very much for it. And thank you to uh, Councillor Rice for asking for it. This is uh, fantastic and a great idea. So um, I am wondering if we're making uh, some kind of, um, well, let me put this, put it this way. Can you outline what option two would include? Um, and just to, to give you my thinking, I've got a little bit of a um, request from people in my community to actually expand um, the snow to go. Um, but maybe that's, you know, I'll let you go. Can you just help find what option two to include now? Continue after that. So the difference between option one and option two is that both leverage the seniors program for the GOA. The difference being that in, in option two, we align more with Calgary and actually provide operational dollars that augment the GOA funding to the okay. tune of around 450,000 is what we've suggested here. So in option two, do we see a potential for community organizations to also participate? Or would it be uh, referrals and education to a city-led program? No, this would, <clears throat> this would just be um, city-led and leveraging uh, the GOA program dollars. Uh, if you wanted in some way to insert um, the community in, in terms of a volunteering thing, that would have to be uh, explicitly required. It's not, um, it, it's not part of the program that we're putting forward in option two. Yeah, so how challenging would that be? Because I know that some community leagues, they really value the volunteer opportunity and the opportunity for um, that connection between young people who are helping and seniors in the community. So um, that sort of community building and generational uh, connection aspect. Well, I think as Laura has, has shared that when we did this program before, there were 49 out of over 150 community leagues that participated, that there were issues around um, you know, um, insurance and liability. And over time, we saw uptake wane. Um, happy to work with Laura and, this, and the community leagues um, to see if there's another way to resurrect a, a recognition or volunteer program. Um, but I think that in the past, we've, we've had some difficulties that we would have to work through. Yeah, okay, so some challenges, but there's the potential for that, a little bit of a pocket that uh, we can have. I mean, what it frankly looks like would be a small hybrid uh, because there might not be a lot of communities that want to participate, but there might be some. Yeah, and I would offer there's nothing preventing community leagues to be proactive and to reach out to their communities. It doesn't require the city to, to intervene at all. Um, online, there are a number of um, volunteer programs that are Canada-based um, yep. that try to connect folks uh, that want to participate. So um, I would just offer that community leagues need not wait for us if they are feeling very motivated. Okay, and do we have any information on why interest uh, was waning over the years because I know that, uh, you know, I do have uh, yet another community that uh, has had to turn people away because they simply don't have the funding to get to everyone. So was it sort of like that decline in uh, funding that led to a decline in the service, which, you know, created that snowball effect? Again, no pun intended. Yeah, so when we um, did, you know, some informal inquiries about um, what some of the reasons were. Uh, there, there was a lack of awareness of the program for some, that they did not have volunteer capacity to support the program, uh, that there were no requests for assistance in those certain leagues, so those, that volunteer um, pool dried up, um, that uh, there was some planning issues, that some felt there was too much work for the community league to organize, and it was a capacity issue. Um, so those were some of the reasons that we are aware of. Okay, so... Constrained resources all around. Uh, okay. Um, I will leave it at that. I'll come around for an, a second round. Um, I would put uh, option uh, two on the board as a motion, but I think that Councillor Rice might want to be doing that. So if not, I'll come around and do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice? Uh, thank you. And um, first, uh, thank you for this report. Uh, the first question, and then in the remark, uh, opening remarks, and uh, I heard the mention about this 
this assist the snow uh, removal program is not identified as a core services. That is why in the 2023 and the 26 budget was not uh, considered for this. So I, I would like to know the reason why this is not considered as a core services because this is so important <clears throat> for our Edmontonians with the city, winter city, <laughs> that factor. Yeah, for sure. No, I was only saying in my in my remarks that the previous programs were unfunded because they were not seen as a core service. But I know with Op 12, there are upcoming core and non-core service discussions that uh, council will be having, and we will absolutely take direction uh, from council on that. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that. And specifically uh, <clears throat> for the uh, existing Snow to Go pilot program, and then I notice in the report and for our city, over like 160 or over 200 community leaks. Uh, I don't have a sp exactly a number, but only 49 community leaks applied for that snow to go program. That is another factor actually demonstrates how challenging for the community league to continue to implement this program, even leverage this program to support people and who actually needs assist assistance. So I. Even based on this one factor, I would like to put the option one and on floor. And because this is, we don't want to put something and it's not working well and continue to put something there. And I, I think that is the reason uh, I noticed in the report very clearly. Is that right? Yeah, and I would offer that of the 49, only 26 yeah. fully used their funding. Oh, wow. So that is a larger fact and that, that mistreats. We need to change the way we, we are put on the floor how we support the Edmontonians who has this need and for the snow removal assistance. So that is my second question. Uh, the third question is about the three option. Um, the option, the three option, not only difference between the FT request because three compared to one FT is. I just want wondering how did you calculate that three FTs? Because for option one and option two, the both three FT required, yeah. We uh, worked very closely with Calgary. We determined that the seniors population in both uh, communities over 65 is very similar, around 13%. And when we uh, thought, when we worked with Calgary to understand their uptake, uh, because they have extended their program to work um, on the seniors benefit program with the GOA, including their summer work, when we um, you know, worked with them, we identified that for the city of Edmonton's need for snow removal for seniors that would be in scope, uh, that we were comfortable with three FTEs. So that is just the initial like estimate. Number. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. And also, I want to confirm the scope of leverage and a provincial fund, and then. It's my understanding scope for that, not only for the slow removal, uh, for seniors, and also for other uh, Edmontonians who has special needs on that as well, right? It is only for seniors over 65 years of age, but the um, program is not only for snow removal, so that's the distinction. We would leverage it for snow removal, focusing on the scope of this particular motion, but the program itself is for individuals that are 65 years of age and have um, a financial qualification um, that also puts them in a place of need. So is there any possibility we can uh, do the amendment for the option one to including some like special needs, not only for the seniors? Then you would be actually adding operating dollars. Uh, option one does not have any operating dollars. From the city. Correct. From our, is a, every uh, donor and all from provincial. Correct. Option two adds the 450000 in operating that would then expand uh, the scope uh, that, than what is that is what originally is um, assumed in option one. Okay. So you, uh, is that option two also will cover not only for the snow removal, will cover about other like grass cutting or other type of help? No, as it's currently um, scoped, is just for snow removal as the motion requested. So that means if we go option one, we, we will not have opportunity for the people who need like spatial uh, accessibility and access and for that. Both option one and two are focused on seniors because we're leveraging the GOA uh, 
program, which is focused only on seniors. If council wants to direct us to expand the scope of this to folks that are not over 65, that would be a different um, exercise. That's different exercise. I may come back for the second round. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright, go ahead. Thank you. So just for total clarity, these options presented are only for seniors. It does not include anybody with disabilities. I'm incorrect. Option two does include. Oh, okay. That's, that's my mistake. What Sorry. I thought. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm just wondering, um, for, the, for the seniors portion, why are we adding three FTE to be sort of the middleman for the provincial program? Like, can, can seniors not access the provincial program on their own? Yes, they can, and that's what we would intend to do. If, we, if you receive this only for information, we would augment and amplify the communications to all of the senior serving organizations so that seniors would know, because I think that's part of the issue, is a lot of seniors don't know about this provincial program. Yeah. What Calgary has done is they are a navigator, so that's what we would suggest as option one, that if you feel that seniors are unable to fully access and leverage this provincial program, then we as a city would be a navigator and would also assume some of those granting um, functions uh, to make it easier for seniors. And that's why we're putting forward the, the, the three. But I would maybe turn it over to Keith if he'd like to offer a bit more detail. Thank you. Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, one of the key aspects here that Calgary does is um, they, they work with the senior to fill all of the applications, send it to the province, they're their intermediary. But what they also do is, instead of going back to the senior and saying, now go find a vendor and, and do the work, and then send in your bill, the city actually sends out the vendor, does the work, and then works with the province on the, the financial background. So it really takes that red tape um, emphasis on the senior doing all the work, and we take that on. And so that's what those three uh, positions are for, uh, developing the program, working with vendors, and, and collaborating with the province and, and the seniors. Okay, but the GOA can't do that themselves, or they don't, or? The GOA does not, but a senior is free to phone them or email them and initiate that contact, and they will work with them. I think that what Calgary has demonstrated is that uh, they've been successful in getting more seniors on board through this navigation supports. Okay, and, um, and then I, I read something um, about direct billing. So... Calgary direct bills than the province, or can contractors direct bill? No, so um, there's a, an MOU that has been signed between the city of Calgary and the government of Alberta. If we were directed to do this, then we would embark upon the privacy impact assessment and all of that work to get an MOU signed between us and the GOA, and then everything would flow through us, again, um, assuming that red tape on behalf of seniors. Okay. And just to add, uh, Councillor Wright, right now with the province, they'll only work with the municipalities. So it's either the senior or the municipality. So no third-party organizations or nonprofits. So that's the current setup right now. Okay, because I think there was also a comment about um, um, social enterprise groups and and, and um, contractors, but they won't. They would have to charge the senior up front, and then the senior would have to request reimbursement. Yeah, I'm I'm uncertain how it would flow between the senior and the GOA. We don't have line of sight on that. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, and then, and this would work then the same way. What sort of qualifications would we have for um, those with disabilities? Just the ones that receive the, the waste services? We would leverage our current understanding of those folks accessing um, the waste and the, and the DATS and then um, working with them to uh, assume those services. Okay. okay. And then, uh, Mr. Jones, I, I said I was going to ask you about enforcement. <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I think this is great that, you know, to help seniors, those with disabilities, but I think overall, you know, we need to make sure sidewalks are cleared across the city for people. Um, how is enforcement for sidewalk clearing in, in the winter? So it's largely on a complaint basis, but uh, when the officers do, uh, when they're in an area, they will also, you know, look at other sidewalks, and if they haven't been cleared in the same amount of time, then they will put out of warnings, like a door hanger, um, I know the report talked about just over 11,500 uh, complaints for snow on walk and um, that's covered by our 23 municipal enforcement officers. So they're pretty busy come, uh, come especially heavy snow 
uh, season. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, you know, there's, uh, there's this warning period where people are given the last opportunity to shovel their snow and then we will ticket and we'll also hire contractors to clear that snow and, and bill it back if I'm correct on the tax roll. But um, what I will say is of those 11,500 and some odd complaints, we don't know how many of those are generated from folks who aren't able to clear their walks and need to rely on other, other people. We just don't have that data set. So just one caveat uh, on, on, on that level of complaint. Anything to add there, Keith? Yeah, and I'll just add that with the snow and ice uh, report that was brought forward, we had the additional 15 temporary officers that we hired uh, this last year. So in addition to the annual 11, 10, 11,000 that the MEOs, uh, municipal enforcement officers do, those additional 15 officers did another 14,000 proactive complaints. So not just reactive from the community, but in high pedestrian areas and commercial areas in an attempt to try and address what I think Councillor Wright was uh, indicating about people who need that accessibility or those, those areas where we would see that high traffic. So we felt like that that was a very successful opportunity for us to, to do more than just being reactive. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, I missed the uh, the members of the public meeting presentation and the questions from my colleagues. I was really interested in the uh, the Calgary program on uh, assisting seniors apply for the program. But I heard I saw some data that we were able to gather. I don't know if you have access to that data. Is that in in Edmonton, 636 seniors already accessed the uh, uh, the permission program, and in Calgary, number is only 700. So it, there has not been a huge uptake, despite uh, the efforts from the uh, from the city of Calgary and uh, expanding resources. So I just want to get your sense on that. Like if they have not been really successful in um, uh, in uh, sign having more seniors sign up, because the difference between 700 and 636 is not a not a huge at a cost of almost four hundred thousand dollars, right? So I just want to get your sense on that. I think one thing we know is that, that, the, that the demographic that we're dealing with, with seniors with uh, low income or some type of disability is, is, a pretty small, uh, is, is a pretty small group. One thing we don't know, we, you, you're correct in those numbers, but one thing we don't know is what the uptake in Calgary was before Calgary put their program in. Mm -hmm. It could have been much lower and they've helped to, to bring that up, but we, we don't have that data. So the provincial program only applies to seniors with low income and special needs, right? It's not across the board that once you turn 65, you qualify for this program. It comes with conditions. So maybe only a small percentage of seniors actually qualify, right? Yeah, that's true. Do we know what the gap is? Like, do we know what the gap is between 636 at Mentonia Supply and uh, who might be eligible for this program? We don't, and that would be getting into personal information mm. for which we don't have access. But your right. point is well made about what is the current uptake, and it could really speak to how effective our senior serving agencies are in already connecting seniors to these programs. We yeah. just don't know for sure. I know, like if, if only a thousand seniors are able to qualify for the program, we already have 636. I don't know if it's 1,000 or 2,000 or 800, I don't know. I think without, with, without having that data, it's really difficult to assess like what the uptake will be uh, if we hire three people, right, to expand that program. And one thing we could track this year is that, is that if this is received for information, with a more targeted uh, communication strategy to amplify this program through the city of Edmonton, which we have not done before, we could track the difference between what it currently is this year to what it might look next year to see if our efforts um, on the amplification and comms plan yeah. makes a significant difference. Okay, got, I think that's a good idea. And is there any support available for people with uh, disabilities from the provincial program or any other provincial program other than this that will allow them to access some support? As we were focused uh, by the motion on seniors, that was what we focused on. So we could uh, look at that information and get back to you if there's other GOA programs for people with disabilities. Oh, so there might be some, right? I, I don't we know. Don't. I'd have to we look. Don't. Okay. But we have not explored that yet, right? No, we have not. Okay. I think that'll be good information because then we can highlight that, uh, that too. Because there's a need. I think there's a value in having... Uh, a program uh, that will help seniors 
with physical uh, yeah, difficulties and I would say broadly Edmontonians who are unable to clear their own snow because of uh, you know, physical barriers, right? So I think it's worth exploring, but just understanding the, if, if programs already exist, what's the value of us adding? Uh, so option two, if no program exists, right, uh, at the federal level, oh, sorry, provincial level, um, uh, for seniors and people with the uh, mobility challenges and uh, disabilities, then option two is more inclusive, right? Uh, that includes seniors and people with disabilities. And if I may just add, I just did a quick check at the Government of Alberta website, and there are four programs for folks uh, with disabilities. There's the Alberta AIDS to Daily Living, AADL, which supports Albertans with long-term disability, chronic or term terminal illness. Uh, to, there's also AISH. There's also post-secondary grants for students with permanent disabilities. And there are residential access modification program, otherwise known as RAMP. So, so there are some programs that we could actually explore whether they will help people with disabilities. Correct. Okay. okay. Well, listen to the conversation. Okay. Thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Prince Faye. I just wanted to uh, ch check. Um, did we chat with the Seniors Coordinating Council? Uh, and because I'm, I'm just a little confused why we would need to do our own three in, in any of the options versus expanding home supports, which we already uh, provide funding towards and expand that solution. So we have spoken to Seniors Association of Greater Edmonton as well as the Senior Home Supports Program. And uh, I, I can't speak to their capacity or what they have or have not done with regards to amplifying this particular GOA program. But our plan would be that um, once we've had this discussion, regardless of how we're motioned, we are going to proceed to continue to work with those two organizations in particular, and any other organizations council would advise to amplify the program that the province already has in place. Yeah, I guess because I like I, I'm I'm good with the sort of the concept of option two. I just I, I'm not sure we need to be the ones to administer that when home supports um, already does that for seniors. In terms of getting folks connected and and supporting them, uh, and, and again, that's a program. Uh, I can't remember how much we fund every year uh, to to that as the city, but we already fund that, so we're already funding staff positions in in senior centers across the city. I think it would just be a matter of expanding those positions, or or maybe adding a few more to to expand those who can access that. So I, that's just the one thing I. I wasn't sure about it, it, that that option or that that idea of just expanding the existing structure that's already in place that we already fund versus starting our own structure. Yes, Councilor Nack, it's uh, Keith here, and uh, certainly we've had some of the initial conversations uh, with the um, coordinating council uh, in the fact that they're just starting their the new governance and whatever program we would develop, we would certainly work in collaboration with them um, because you're right, maybe some of the initial assessments and form filling is stuff that is already being done by that council, and we would uh, certainly amplify and, and uh, collaborate with them on that. And again, I think what I'm suggesting is not us creating our own program. The, the program is created. It, it exists. It's it's home supports. And so that's what I'm just wanting to make sure that we wouldn't like, and, and we've been funding that now, I think, since 2014 or 2015, if I remember correctly. And so I, I, I just want to make sure that if we go down a path of something like option two, I, I, what I'm trying to suggest, and I, I guess I want to just get confirmation of is, like we don't need to create our own program because there is a program it already exists we just need to maybe expand on it we maybe need to resource that program further but but we actually wouldn't need to recreate the wheel when it's already already started well option two though has us uh, playing that intermediary role which these programs could not so if we're interested in reducing red tape and ensuring that seniors um, are able to access the provincial program more smoothly uh, the only role that the Seniors Home Support Program or SAGE would uh, have is amplifying and, and doing the comms piece to let them know the program exists. They can't be the intermediary uh, like we can with the province as a municipality. Uh, well, I'm, I'm curious if that's the case, because again, we, we already, I, I, and it's been a while, so, so forgive me, and I'm just, that's why I'm trying to remember. I think we're the primary funder of home supports. Um, and so I, I don't know if that's officially considered a city program 
but I think it's either primarily or exclusively funded by us. And, and they already connect people to all of those services. So I, again, that's just why I'm trying to, and, and maybe I'm nitpicking at, at a point where, where we haven't got a motion on the floor yet, but I guess I, I would just, like, I like the idea, but I just, I'm, I'm really concerned that we would actually be creating a structure that, that, is, that has been in existence now for a number of years and, and rather we could expand on and, and tweak and modify. And, and ideally, I imagine, engage the province to say, this is something we already fund. They already do this work. Can, can that be treated like the city because we already put in the funding to it. Yeah, fair point. Uh, we will have to look at the governance and see how the city can direct their work. But thank you for raising that. Perfect, yeah, I think so. If we're gonna go down that path of option too, I just, uh, I, I put a caveat or, or and maybe I'll wait, wait till the motion just so that we're not creating three new positions for something that I, I think we could actually just use what we have, maybe expand on it. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, so I had actually a similar string of questions as Councillor Mack. Um, although I don't know if you have this number off hand, uh, like, do you actually know if the home support worker uh, program coordinated through the seniors coordinating council? So it goes beyond just a single center is uh, covers across the city. Um, how much of that is city it, it is in Sac City and how much is that? is uh, pro uh, provincial. We would have to go back and look into that information. We don't have that available now. Yeah, because I would be actually quite hesitant on funding additional uh, FTEs when, uh, I mean, I know the program is actually uh, in high demand, but has been underfunded over the years. Um, my understanding is actually it's on the province as based on most of the senior serving um, or um, aspects. Uh, but uh, I I also like the idea. I also like the 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 idea of using you know dads and our current waste collection data, um, and having people do an opt out uh, process um, for especially for people with disabilities. Um, anyways, I I actually realized most of my questions have been have been uh, been asked already. But that was sort of the lingering piece for me um, is the seniors coordinating. Uh, council aspect. How are we? How are we, we? You know, if if we go with, I guess the alternative, you know, if we go with something like option two, how will we actually work with existing home support workers, uh, like the one that we already have? Um, and then the other question I had was, um, so in the last snow removal, um, in the last snow removal uh, report. I had asked about sort of communication and public awareness raising campaign, a bit of a low hanging fruit, but public education about the importance of um, removing snow for your neighbors, for seniors and people with disabilities. I guess in, in formulating this report, I'm wondering if you've taken that into consideration. Um, because I think we've all also heard, you know, we need kind of multiple tools and I see this as one of the tools. Yeah, this, that is absolutely part of the comms plan to ensure a greater public awareness of being a good neighbor, cleaning your, your, your walks, and, uh, and, and leveraging the programs that are in existence. So that comms plan will be, you will work, uh, like that will happen regardless of option one, two, or three, is that right? That's correct. Okay, That's, that, is, um, that is helpful. Um, okay, uh, that's, that's it from me for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rutherford? Hi, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I, I just wanted to follow up on a response to one of the mayor's questions because it, it just it really didn't sit with me. Um, with regards to the data, so I really believe in inf data-informed decision-making and uh, Ms. Flannan, you, you answered with, you know, getting some of that data gets into personal information, but there are a lot of data points that we have that would give us a pretty solid understanding of what that Delta is with the intersections between low income seniors, which StatsCan has data, disaggregated data on low income, 
and you can cross tabulate it with age. And additionally, we know the percentage on average of seniors, for example, that have a disability. So I, I'm really confused as to why we, we can't or won't get that information. Oh, I did not mean to uh, say we wouldn't. I was just trying to manage expectations. Uh, happy for us to look into um, however we can slice and dice current data to have uh, the information for your decision making. Yeah, I mean, but, but we're at a point of decision making right now and we don't have that data. And your, and your response was it's, it gets into personal information. So I guess, what, did, what were you understanding from the mayor's comments about personal information in terms of data points? I'm always just trying to err on the side of caution, um, okay. but uh, happy to take direction from our legal folks who will keep me on the right side. Yeah, I mean, any information from Stats Canada, and we just have the recent census data, is, is absolutely fair game. Um, I guess my question is, you know, do you ever consult with like the social planners within the city to get uh, their, their data and their information in preparation for these reports? Uh, yes, Councilor Rutherford, we, we do. And, and we had uh, a lot of discussion on trying to figure out what that delta you're talking about is. Um, you know, we looked up uh, information on how many seniors are, are within Edmonton, you know, um, how many um, low income from, from the perspective of, of StatsCan. Uh, what we really relied on was information from the GOA and Calgary. Uh, to try and set some of those expectations and, and provide the best estimate that we can. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm missing that, that gap and that, okay, so if we have, you know, a certain number that are already registered for that GOA program, what's the delta, uh, you know, similar to the mayor's question, what's the delta of seniors that have those intersections that we're missing, right? Like, so if we are to do a targeted, you know, communications campaign, what are our targets for for signups, right? Like, or if you know, if you option two, what what gaps are we filling that the GOA program doesn't cover, right? Those are just things that I I feel like I'm missing in that information in this. Can someone speak to that? Yes, certainly, Councilor Rutherford. Um, what I can say is that. Um, the estimation that Calgary has is, is approximately 700 that sign up for the SNAS program within within the province. Within uh, the GOA has given us information saying, as the as the mayor indicated, 636 have applied for the SNAS within the Edmonton area. Um, when we look at the demographics as to how many seniors are in Edmonton, um, we can certainly take a look at that and see if that we can provide just a bit more of a narrowing of that. Uh, scope that you're looking for to provide that for you. Yeah, I think it would be really helpful in, in a, you know, future conversations, both around making sure we're thinking about snow clearing um, and accessibility for both seniors and people with disabilities. Like, I really feel like there's some data out there and data sets that we're not fully utilizing for our decision making purposes. So I would really appreciate that. That, that's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Mayor Sohi. Okay. I just want to follow up on that uh, questioning from Councillor Rutherford. Like, I I would really understand to uh, like to understand the gap, right? Uh, both for seniors and for people with disabilities. Are are we talking about two thousand people, three thousand people? based on whatever data that is available or whatever other data we can can gather. I think without that type of information, having a program may not be as effective. That's what I understand. Maybe that could be the next step for us to uh, uh, gather that information, bring that back. Then at that time, we can make an informed decision, uh, knowing that 636 people already qualify. and recognizing there are four provincial programs that uh, people with disabilities may be eligible for, right? Uh, and then identifying, okay, if they're all eligible, why are they not applying? And other part, if they're applying, uh, they're not eligible, what the gap is, right? Uh, I think then we'll be in a better, at least from my point of view, then we'll be in a better position to, uh, I think there's an, I, I would like to have a program if there's a identified 
need that we cannot fill or we cannot leverage other sources uh, to fill, right? That's what I would like to get, get a sense. Is that doable in a short amount of time uh, uh, before we get into fall budget discussions? Just wondering, is, is it too, how much work is there to gather that? I maybe have some uh, preliminary data to help us understand the need better. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely um, take this away. We'll get in contact with the government of Alberta as they would be the owners of some of those programs that we're talking about to see what that uptake is. And we can work with our uh, colleagues in city operations to see if we can further uh, dissect that debts and uh, waste um, programs right. to get a better sense of, of the delta that you're speaking of. So the, see, see the, the DATS program is more of a universal program, right? People with disabilities can access that program uh, regardless of their economic circumstances, right? Uh, they may have, you know, resources to hire someone to clear their snow, but because they can't move around in, in winter, so they rely on DATS, right? So it's, it's a universal program. It's not an income-tested program. For sure, right. and we'd also then have to look at folks that have um, a door, you know, that they're not living in a in a larger congregate uh, situation because then we're we're removing snow from their sidewalk um, in a in a in a residence situation. How does the waste collection part uh, works? Like, is it income based, like, or is it universal? Somebody applies to have their uh, well, we have that assisted. We have that information. I'm not sure if anyone from city operations is on the call with us to respond. Um, if they aren't, like, we is could, it income tested? Like, I, I don't know how does it work. Like, is yeah, I wouldn't want to speak for their program, um, but we can get that information for you if no one from city operations is on the call right now. Okay. We'll come back yeah, to you. Uh, oh, sorry. Dennis Bell, I am here, and sorry, was the question how many people are in the waste program or how they apply? Yeah, like, how do they apply? Is is, is it based based on some criteria uh, that screens them in or out? It is on a criteria, so we have them complete an assisted waste application form through their health care provider that confirms they need the assistance, and we have approximately a thousand people part of our program. Is is income a criteria? Their ability to, uh, well, like it's a it's a it's a it's a fee that people pay. It's just people can't take take the garbage out, right? Is that what it is? There's no fee, okay. and so it is included within the waste utility. And uh, to apply, you have to have a form completed by your medical professional who okay. confirms that you're not able to collect your So it's, your it's solely based on their ability uh, or physical ability, but that's not like the, the provincial program is more income tested, right? So that's what I want to understand, because if you want to create a program, we want to create a program that is income tested, not a universal, because people can afford to hire uh, their contractors if they if they have the resources. If a wealthy senior living in their own home, uh, they need uh, uh, can to clear their own snow, they have the ability to hire someone, right? That's correct. The provincial program is income tested. Yeah, and our program, I sense, is our, like both DATS is not income tested for right reasons, and the waste program is not income tested for the right reasons. But something related to snow, we probably want to have income tested criteria, right? as council would direct. Okay, I see, okay, got it, okay. I would be interested in that information. I'll be if prepared if somebody can help with the, we can get if no other motions are coming forward, maybe that's could be a motion to generate more information. We could provide that via memo if that was suitable. But it has to come to council for further, committee for further discussion for budget allocation if that's the desire of committee. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Rice. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the first question about, and because the existing uh, assist snow program already ended in 2022, we don't have the budget and it started in 2023, right? Yes, that's correct. We've been just pulling it from our operating budget and trying to find some money uh, as we have yeah. a little bit of variance. And because, because we didn't continue to consider that uh, snow to go and the pilot program and so that's what if we are not moving forward today based on decision making point that means we will lack of any assi assistance snow removal program and for seniors and also for the people with limited abilities yeah we would not have another pilot program we yeah. would just rely on our communications and amplifying the GOA program to the communities okay uh, so 
give the factors of many other major cities across Canada already and ahead of us to provide this assist through the program. So if we're not make any decision today, so we're end up right now. And if we're not take any option and from the three option, and we're end up right now, we don't have program move forward. So I just want to confirm that. Okay, I, I, I saw the uh, hate lots. Thank you for that. Um, so also for the current state challenge, implementation challenge I, I mentioned earlier. So is that a new FTE um, proposed will fill off some implementation gaps to support uh, our animatorians with limited ability and also support the seniors? So that is why we need that additional FTEs or so what specific those FTE, additional FTE needed and for the uh, option one and option two? So those three FTEs would um, work with uh, seniors. They would intake that information. They would work with the province and work with the vendors to connect uh, the services that the seniors are requiring. So it'd be uh, fully administrative work that they would need to do. Um, that, was, that would be the vision that we were thinking about. Um, another thing, uh, I just want to follow the data gap. But what I heard from the current steps, the program we already uh, implemented for the city for many years, since 2014 to now, that data gap should not be the barrier and for us to implement any of the option and you provided here. So that's my understanding. Even though if we can explore more data, but uh, based on what the program already existing in the place, and with this data gap, will still not stop us to implement the option one or option two, right? So that is my understanding, because that data is, does not say, because lack of this data, we cannot do the assist snow um, removal program, because that's what we are already doing, and since 2014 to the last years. Council is free to make a decision with whatever information is in front of them, um, okay. is what I would offer. Um, so based on that, because I really want to reflect our city's value, we are care caring about our Edmontonians and uh, our seniors, our people with limited uh, accessibilities. I'm going to put Option two, but before I put, I do want to confirm one question. So option two already includes all the items in option one. That means allow us to extend the scope for the existing cities program that ended in 2022, right? So extending that scope, including leverage provincial government funding, and plus the existing uh, enhanced um, assisting program that and uh, that was ending in 2022. No, there was no existing program. The the previous oh. program was volunteer based, utilizing community leagues. Okay, so that means we will option two will extend the scope to leverage provincial government funding, and also and provide the opportunity, and for our uh, senior agencies or community leagues to leverage this program and to support the seniors and the people with limited ability. When I use the word leverage, I'd be careful. We would be using those other organizations to amplify the opportunity. Uh, mm. the, they wouldn't have a place um, in operating or okay. operationalizing that. So I'm, I, because my time is out, I'm going to put this motion on the floor and then so we can have the question on it. Chair, Mayor, may I? Please go ahead, Councillor Ace. Okay, so the um, an administration bring forward an unfunded service package for consideration during the fall 2023 supplement operating budget adjustment for the city to, opposition, to oppositionalize an ex Expanded snow program, which also includes leveraging the provincial special needs assistance 
for seniors benefit program as outlined as option two of the July 11, 2023 Community Service Report, CSO 1783. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Tang. Please go ahead, Councillor Tang. It appears, Hi, Council yeah, thank you. Oh, hello, yes. Hi, thank you. Um, sorry, just, just so I'm, I'm really clear. So there's a four, about four programs you had mentioned for people with disabilities, um, but a lot of them are like, you know, age is people's monthly income and that they pay towards housing and that kind of stuff. And there's none that's similar to the one mentioned for the seniors that's sort of a dedicated, uh, you know, service. Is that right? I am only uh, reflecting what is publicly available on the Government of Alberta website that features those four programs for financial assistance for people with disabilities. Right. Okay, yeah, um, and then you might not have the answer for this, but I, I figure I'll ask anyways. Um, I mean, provincial, the province also has a similar body, like the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if anyone knows there has been history of advocacy there for, uh, you know, a particular assistance program like the one with seniors that's dedicated to particular services. We don't, don't have that information that. readily available. Okay. Okay. That, that might be something I'll be interested in following up on um, because I think there is something there. And then, and then just one more thing about the, on the communication side. Um, uh, so, so there will be a robust communication uh, rollout and, and work plan and whatnot. Um, and would that also include, would that include the, the communication effort that you're talking about to raise awareness about some of these programs or is that will be encompassed in one of these options, one, two or three? It's going to be done regardless of if there's a motion or okay. not. Uh, accepting this, whether okay. you accept this uh, report for information or not, that is the work that we're committing to doing because we see it as a really great opportunity. Okay, okay that's great. Yeah, um, you know, I know we're going to have a number of, uh, of, of, of packages that might be coming forward. I don't necessarily feel like I have all the information to make that decision right now, but appreciate that the motion has been put forward for further discussion. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette, go ahead. You're muted, Councillor Paquette. I was on mute. All right, thank you. So, I'm wondering if it would make sense to add a, an amendment to this. Um, and I put it in the chat. Um, with, with your permission, Chair, I will just, uh, I would read that out. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, that administration also provide a report to committee with one potential options for expanded snow program with base data points identifying current utilization and integration with current city programs and two uh, and that the scope of this service package be expanded to include an option for a dedicated budget allocation for continuation of the snow to go grant program for communities in support of assisted snow removal um, and uh, just quickly introducing that amendment uh, it uh, doesn't stop the work, but it also provides the information that council, uh, the councillors have obviously been asking for in committee today. Um, and I'm just, uh, I guess my question to administration would be um, to provide those base data points, I think would be probably a very quick turnaround. Uh, we would have to look into that. Um, and my only other question, uh, flag is just uh, resurrecting a snow to go. We'd have to work very closely with the EFCL to ensure their comfort. Yeah, and so that would just be um, potential options, right? So, um, and maybe the option is, we don't see how it works, but it might be, here are some ways that it can work, yeah? Sure, we can take that away. Okay. And uh, as for those base data points, uh, I think that the questions were, were basically like, what's the utilization? What's the uptake? Um, you know, that 
we already have the contrast compared with Calgary. Um, and the reason for that, and I'll see if you understand it uh, the way I do, is that if we have those base data points, then if we have a program such as this, then we can measure against that to see how successful it actually is and actually start to build um, a bit of a picture of of what the the real need is once people start actually becoming aware that these programs are available. Is that sort of your read as well? Yes, we will. Um, we'll, we'll dig into the stats can especially. We'll get our, da our data gurus in there and, and see what we can uh, bring forward. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm not expecting uh, the data set to end all data sets. It's just pretty high level stuff, I, I would imagine. Um, so uh, is that possible then to bring that, uh, uh, some information like that forward um, in a timely fashion uh, so it could be part of that, uh, uh, that budget discussion? I would imagine that would be part of the service package. Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. Or do you want this yeah, in advance? It cuts it a bit close, but I am open to all options. I, I certainly don't want to make people uh, <laughs> develop uh, uh, anxiety on this one. So, yeah. Um, and just, uh, I did have a, a quick question. I wrote it down here um, about the uh, home supports, um, the services for hire. So. Pardon me. I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. So the, yeah. The question is, um, so snow to go allows a community league to cover costs themselves. So when it comes to the services for hire with uh, people with mobility issues, we can refer seniors to these contractors, but then they receive a bill. That's the part I'm not clear on. So are, are you talking about uh, the uh, special needs assistance and, and that process? Yeah, and uh, my apologies, I, I yeah. wrote the question down very quickly thinking I would get to it much sooner. So. Sure. So I, th I think what you're what you're indicating is, if a senior uh, with low income uh, wishes to have snow removal, they can apply through the province. Once the province approves their uh, application, the senior then finds a vendor, has the vendor clean up the property, and then when they receive the bill, that bill is then sent to the province. And, and so that's the process that's in place right now for, for the provincial program. Uh, Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And um, I, I did send uh, my amendment to into the chat, so I'm just wondering if, uh, for the sake of debate, if that can be put up on the screen. Councillor Bacat, we're just preparing that motion. I can share it with you to verify its accuracy. Okay, perfect. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bacat. I just wanted to clarify, you are putting forward uh, those amendments? Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Hi, thanks. So I'm just, I've taken a quick look at the, um, the supports for, um, um, for those with disabilities through the province, and there doesn't really seem to be anything um, under H. There's maintaining your home in a remote community. We aren't considered a remote community, right? <laughs> Um, doesn't really seem to be anything aids to daily living is more your medical um, PDD I can't really find any supports for um, for home maintenance and that but so but because the province has the the funding for the seniors and and should be managing that as best they can what would be the possibility of, ju of us just having a separate program um, for those with mobility issues that's what option two assumes, that that's why there's the extra $450,000 in operating, which would allow you then uh, as a council to expand beyond the senior scope of the provincial program to augment service to meet the needs of those with mobility issues that use DATS and waste. Okay, but if, if we didn't have that seniors program and just let the province do what the province does, promote it their way, you know, you know, maybe try to increase that 636. So then just the 450,000 would be enough for to assist those with mobility? Um, in our rough estimates uh, in this moment, that's what we're comfortable based on what we're seeing, um, uh, what Calgary's done, but we'd have to refine it um, for a service package for you. Okay, that's what I'm sort of 
you know, because there is the provincial program, now what can the city do for those that aren't supported by the provincial program? Okay, okay thank you. I just want to see if we'll have that separated out in the service package. Uh, we, we will uh, do our best and, okay. and we can uh, test that back with you uh, to make sure we're meeting your needs. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice? Um, just want to clarify a few things here. I, I didn't expect we take this long for this item. <laughs> um, so even though uh, GOA has a center's program, but however, and based on the Calgary's experience, and then seniors actually, without city's help, uh, the if, uh, effective access to this program is really limitation. So that is why and the city of Calgary and put their effort to help seniors. So in other city, the majority, and based on the report information provided, there are major cities across Canada, they're doing this at municipal level to help seniors to leverage provincial funding. I think if other cities can do, why our city cannot do it? And then I, I just want to put a question there. And then this option will reflect that leads and for our city seniors at our city level to provide that support for them to effectively leverage the program, right? So that is the option one. So right now, for the option two, I heard the answer for the question. Uh, for the option two, we already um, consider the seniors and the press, help seniors and also help, help people with disabilities. I, I'd rather use the words limited ability and because many emails I received and from my word and people talk about after the surgery, after certain things, they're still under a limited ability to do the certain snow removal and cut grass and he said, right now we're just focused on snow removal. And I, I think I'd rather use limited uh, ability to ac access certain services. Uh, so with that type of sense, I think the uh, option to cover both purpose to support seniors, and uh, also to support um, the people with limited ability. So that's, I, I saw the last head, right? And then my question and to the um, to the amendment. So the first question uh, is about the data. Uh, the data about or oh, the changed the base data identify current utilization and integration with the current uh, city programs. So this report already provided the current city programs for two programs exist and already utilization and integration, all the information is already in the current report. Is that redundant work and is repeated work and to ask you to do it? And because the data already there. That's his first question. Is that to administration or yeah, to the yeah, mover? to administration. The question to me and then the snow removal, like slow to go program and, is, and also the first program, the two, the angel, uh, Snow Angels, the two programs, you already provide all the data and in this report. Yes, we have provided that report. So that, to me, that's, that part, that request for the amendments and is redundant, is repeated. Um, so thank you for that confirmation. And the second for the scope of the unfunded service package to expand it to including strategy for the Cooperating community leagues participation currently under, but this information already provided in the report very clear and how many community leagues use this. And do we need that information more? And that's one question. And the second question to include dedicated budget means additional budget or is already including under option to the budget? Based on the amendment here. So I am asking question for the amendment. Yeah, I, I don't have access to that wording of the amendment. Uh, maybe it might be better to ask the mover if the current information provided is insufficient. Okay. 
And just to clarify, the amendment's not been formally moved? Oh, Councillor not, not moved. Has okay, to move so, it. so to me, and then the part two, and thank you, Councillor Percat, and for, amends, uh, for amendments. And so part one is already confirmed is redundant information, and the part two to include the dedicated budget is additional budget request beyond the option two, or is, is a part of option two? Councillor Pricat? Uh, I'm not there's sure. not an amendment oh, on the floor okay. quite yet. Okay, so I just yeah. was a clarification to you. Okay, so I will I will just leave there. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, just a quick question. Do we know how many people uh, uh, utilize the Snow Angel program, the pilot? I missed that, probably I missed that presentation. Yes, on average it was around 202 to 250 that were utilizing the Snow Angel program uh, before uh, we moved away from it. Okay, and that would be on top of about uh, 636 that enrolled in the provincial program. Those are two separate things? Two separate things. Yeah, okay. the Snow Angel was simply a rec yeah. employee re or a volunteer recognition Water. program. No, no, the. Uh, Sorry, the snow to go pilot, what I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, the, so the snow to go pilot yeah. was working with uh, the EFC, community yeah. leagues. Yeah. Yes. How many people participate? How many people utilize that program? So know? there was uh, 20, well, there was 49 that had applied, yeah. about approximately around 29, as, as Jen had indicated, uh, uh, received the money and used the money. Yeah. And I believe that there was around 960 um, individuals that used that program okay. uh, in the last year. Okay, I see. Okay, so when you come back with this unfunded service package, would you be able to, I am not interested in uh, spending $327 million, $1,000 that will only help 60 people based on the data from Calgary and to us, right? Because that's the optic number is, right? The difference between us and Calgary. But I, want, I would be interested in accept, uh, more information around if we are not becoming intermediaries between provincial program, what would be the cost to have uh, help available to those who are not eligible for provincial programs, such as people with mobility issues, right? Would you give us that breakdown? You talked about $400,000 for that program, right? Would you be able to give that kind of breakdown for the service package? For sure we can. Okay, and would you be able to kind of give us the breakdown on no, no, I mean better data on the need and what the gap is between the seniors program from province and how we can fill that gap, right? What the cost is going to be for filling that gap. Yes. Because that data is very, very important. Like if we can demonstrate that we will go from 646 to 1,000, I think it's worth investing $322,000. But if we only, only go from 636 to 700, that I, don't think, that I don't think that's a sound investment. Yeah, we can get that. Yeah, we can definitely find out the eligibility and to see what, uh, what, what that delta is for you. Right, and also, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and also some advocacy role. Uh, you can maybe you can identify because the seniors program is a great program, right? Uh, why would province not have a similar program for people with the mobility issues, right? So advocacy options that uh, could be identified as part of. Uh, uh, the work ahead uh, as through either through Alberta Muni's or uh, or uh, through mayor's office, right? Uh, any any options you would be able to uh, kind of identify as when you bring that forward? Absolutely. Okay, if you could take note of that, right? So, uh, uh, okay, because I look forward to it. I think this will generate more information for us to make an informed uh, and better decision. And uh, yeah, well, I'll leave it that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Paquette, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, so, so to um, state the amendment, uh, that the motion on the floor be amended by adding the following two points, that the unfunded service package include potential options for an expanded snow program with base data points identifying current utilization and integration with, uh, with current city programs and that the scope of the unfunded service package be expanded to include strategies for incorporating community league participation currently under the snow to go program and to include a dedicated budget. 
and uh, again, just to introduce again, uh, even uh, more briefly, is that um, I believe that uh, the motion that uh, Councilor Rice put forward is excellent. This just adds to the ability for Council to see uh, a response to the questions that have been made here in committee before making a decision uh, on a budget. That's it, that's the introduction. So um, I guess uh, a quick question to administration is, um, uh, so for example, uh, throughout it, in the report it says, uh, throughout its four winter seasons, the pilot provided over $60,000 in grant funds to community leagues, helping approximately 750 Edmontonians each year. Um, so to the mayor's uh, concern, that really is kind of, Pretty good bang for the buck for a program that maybe not a lot of people even knew about. Yeah. Um, yes, I think that uh, if 750 seniors uh, were able to uh, leverage their their programming and volunteers through their through their various community leagues, that was a good outcome. Yeah, and um, just we may not know this, but. Um, with Calgary's numbers and with potential for Edmonton numbers and something like this, um, what is what would be the communication strategy so that people would actually be aware of this and can avail themselves? Well, being aware of the demographic that seniors might not be as savvy on social media, we would augment any social media with um, some paper stuff. So door hangers, we would work with our city operations folks to leverage any of their mail outs that we could get that messaging out there. But uh, the, the tactics of a larger comms plan would still need to be finalized. Okay, and similar to uh, people with mobility concerns, I would assume. Yes. Yeah, okay. Great. Okay. Uh, those are all my questions. Um, just, uh, that's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Now we have an amendment on the floor. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, appreciate the amendment. I uh, just want to make sure, uh, you know, because one of the things I heard was that this will come back with the service package, not prior to the service package. That would be our preference, but if uh, council needs it earlier, we would do our best. If there's a different timeline you'd like to provide? Yeah, I think for me, the one thing I'm struggling with, um, I mean, I support this motion and maybe it's, it's a question to the original mover when, you know, depending on what happens with this amendment on the floor. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna wait to ask that question depending on what happens with this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice, go ahead. Uh, so to answer uh, Councillor Rutherford, uh, your question, if we come back with the data, but I confirm the data for already including in the reports, in front of us already. Um, that means it's a repeat work for you to come bring the almost the similar data. Because already and on the page three it's said very clear and for the snow and your data and also slow to go data. Uh, could it be possible if we get this motion going and waiting for this motion come back to make a decision for the decision for we should bring source package that would be too late from the time night perspective. So is this could be part of that on um, funding pass service package? Well, service packages are due at the end of August. So, so August. In terms of timing. But um, service package is, what the service package is for the, for the full uh, budget supplement, that's his long member. Yeah, but they're due at the end of August. So the work is, is happening right now. So in terms of timelines to get this information to council, we are targeting an end of August for service packages. So I, I want to respect every uh, opinion from my council leagues, and, but how we balance the timeline to make sure we don't have that gap, service gap for this winter. 
and we, we still want to make sure uh, the seniors and also the Edmontonians with limited ability to have that service in place when October snowing come in. Well, just to be clear, with the fall SOBA timing in November, uh, if council was to approve it, then we would go out and um, you know, recruit FTEs, so uh, there would be a lag in terms of implementation. You know, if you, if you approve a thing on November or whatever, I'm not hiring the person on the ground the next day. Like, there's going to be a gap in time for us to operationalize just to manage expectations. Uh, can, we, can we have the balance? And uh, including this two and it was original motion uh, on the floor, option two together, come back to the August. So is that possible? Are you asking for us to bring a yep. service package earlier or with no, no, information? No, 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 the same time. Same time with those information. So we can make a decision with those information and as a service package at the same time. I'm not sure if that's part of the finance. I don't want to usurp the financial processes that already are in place. Um, I might have to defer if anyone from finance or financial services are on the line just to determine. I don't want to, I don't want to be outside of process, that's all. Maybe we can take that away and, and have a discussion. So what I'm thinking, and uh, Councillor Picard to the mover, uh, if we add these two parts to the uh, orange motion on the floor, that means all the information come back at the same time and the council can debate to make a decision based on um, that service package and also based on those information together at that moment. And we will not, we will not miss the opportunity to create that gap for the service provided in this winter. So is that? Right, okay. So my understanding is, um, so my amendment actually doesn't impact your original motion. And so your original motion would actually come back as an unfunded service package at the end of August that yeah. we would debate for the fall budget. So regardless yeah. of the amendment or not, um, there would still be that uh, um, period where uh, administration would have to hire after the budget was approved and we won't have that discussion until budget time. So even though the unfunded service package report comes back um, or the unfunded item comes back at the end of August, um, we don't actually have a mechanism well, to make that decision before budget. So that's sort of where we're constrained. Uh, we can make a decision right now uh, and even say, have it come back as a funded service package. Well, that's the option we could do. You could say, have it come back as a funded service package but that would mean that we don't actually have the debate um, at budget, and then administration could hire a little bit earlier in advance of that, but they probably wouldn't because there's no guarantee that that wouldn't be removed during the budget mm -hmm. debate. So really, it, it, it's all moot. It has to come back at the end of August, and we can only make the decision at budget time. If it helps at all, sorry, if it helps at all, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to really uh, amplify our comms in advance so that we get the word out to all seniors about the provincial program. So that could be one mitigating factor that we could do immediately uh, to assuage the angst that we wouldn't be um, ensuring that all the eligible seniors in Edmonton were aware of the program offered by the government. That could be a, a measure that we could take now. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, I'll just take a turn here now. Councillor Paquette, I just wanted to ask you a question to the mover of the amendment. Uh, the data points and current utilization integration with the uh, current city programs, can you expand on that a little bit? What is it that is not in this report that's missing that you would like to see? Right, so some of the things that uh, Mayor so Mayor Sohi was asking, um, weren't actually included in the report, and so that can be expanded on some of the things that Councillor Rutherford had brought up about the ability for the city to actually gather some of those, some of that data. Um, you know, we didn't see that reflected in, in this report. Um, and uh, then uh, there's the issue raised by Councillor Knack about uh, some of the programs that we already offer and the potential overlap there and how we can uh, sort of tease that apart in order to ensure that we're being most efficient with our programs and our money and how we roll that out and what the needs might be uh, when it comes to additional FTEs. And uh, so just listening to the whole uh, debate and uh, seeing that there are a lot of questions about the different uh, data and utilization of our programs, um, I think 
would help to clarify these things for all council so that when we have that budget debate, uh, those questions will already be answered. We don't have to spend time during the budget asking those same questions all over again. So sort okay. of, a, you know, streamlining. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. And so to administration then, uh, that is your understanding, you know, um, what information, what further information is being requested? I think as we um, do the work and find the data sets, we will uh, go back to councillors Rutherford and Knack just to socialize what we've got to make sure, um, just early testing to make sure we hit the mark. Okay, great. And councillor Paquette, yeah. Of course, my apologies. <laughs> yeah. And councillor Rice. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. That's it for me for questions. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, go ahead. Yeah, just listening to the debate here and the sequencing of time, um, I'm just wondering, Councillor Paquette, do you think your amendment is actually better as a referral motion to come back to committee in August? And that way, if we want to direct a funded package, we can do so. Uh, we can do that and the ball can start rolling with that um, rather than like the current sequence of time is, you know, they'll, they'll come back with the service package as you mentioned, but we're not gonna debate it till November. So we're really gonna miss this year's winter season. So I was just wondering if you think, you know, what, if you, if what your thoughts are on potentially having your amendment be, a ref, be changed to a referral motion for the August committee. Yeah, and that's a good question because it is something that uh, I had considered. Um, however, I feel like we've had a pretty good debate today, a pretty good conversation, and that uh, there's just some lingering sort of questions that have to be answered that can be answered um, with this amendment. And uh, then when it comes to the service package and we get this information back at the same time, um, you know, it sounds like the will, and we'll, we'll know with this vote in committee, uh, is to actually send this uh, uh, back as a unfunded service package to be brought forward during the debate. So then it just becomes a question of like, okay, so now have we covered all the bases, looks like we will, and we'll have an opportunity to ask more questions, um, both offline with administration and also uh, through the process of uh, the budget debate where we can ask, uh, we can actually have written questions and we can literally have a conversation uh, again during uh, the debate, but I hear what you're saying, but I also feel that maybe we've we've uh, had the conversation today with just some lingering questions that we can clean up. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I'm convinced of that because, for example, you know, one of one one of the underlying assumptions that I'm hearing from this report is that there's a lack of awareness. So let's increase our communication but I don't even have full information about, is that actually the barrier? Um, I think I need to dig in a little bit more to know if that's actually gonna be what we need to really best optimize um, supports for seniors and people with disabilities. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but just from my perspective, I'm actually not convinced. So I feel like we might actually have administration do a lot of work on creating a service package that this information might actually, for me personally, change what I would want to see. I think the debate about whether we have a service package or not and that there is absolutely a gap and we need to do more for seniors is, is, is a will for sure I can feel in this room and, and with council, but the how, I'm not convinced that this, this service package is the right how uh, without okay. this data. So what are your so thoughts on that? I know I'm not on committee though, so like I, I do defer to committee, but just wanted to get that, those thoughts out there. Right. Okay, so just so I'm clear, your preference would be that this comes back um, uh, as a separate report, we debate it again, then we send it to uh, budget for another debate. I think we are prematurely giving direction to administration on the, the how we're going to support people with disabilities and seniors with snow clearing. I, that, that, is, that is what I'm saying, but that is just my, my perspective on this. Okay. Thank you. All right, I hear you. Um, I kind of see that, I, but I don't agree. <laughs> so That's I'll fair. That. Okay. That's the beauty of debating council. <laughs> That's a good point though. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Mayor Sully, go ahead. Yeah, so if committee wants to have 
further debate on this prior to SOBA deliberations, right? Then we cannot give you a direction to bring forward unfunded service package because unfunded service package can only be brought forward during the SOBA discussion. Am I right in that? I think there's no distinction between unfunded or funded service package. Yeah. I think or any, any fund, oh, any, I any, any funding request needs to come to SOBA. Correct. So this, if it's unfunded service package, it needs to go to SOBA. Correct. Right? That's my understanding of the process. But if we want to have this debate prior to SOBA, then we cannot give you the direction for unfunded service package. It has to be additional information required at that time in August, we can give you a direction for funded or unfunded service package from the process wise. Am I right, Chris? That is correct. Right. So if we want to have this debate in August, then we may need to take out reference to any funded service package or unfunded service packages. Yes, if you want to continue this discussion in August, I'd recommend withdrawing the amendment and original motion and putting forward a referral motion as yeah. recommended by Council. I Robert. think that's the proper process for us to get there. Otherwise, we will lose, if the desire of council in SOBA or is to have a program for next winter, then we need further discussion in August. At that time, we can give a direction at the will of the committee to, to bring forward uh, or give that direction at that time to fund it, right, in August. Then it doesn't have to be part of SOBA, right? So I think if we want to, don't, if you don't want to miss a season, then we need to have a discussion in August and give direction for the discussion of funded package. If we, may, if we come back in SOBA, I heard from you, Jennifer, that you, you won't be able to hire people on time. So you'll probably have a program in February or March instead yeah. of. Yeah, and, and regardless of when the discussion happens, when the decision is made, we are all still um, working with the, the fall SOBA um, process. Um, so that's the other, that's the other thing to, to flag. Yeah. So something for mover and the amender to consider. Otherwise, uh, this if this passes, this will come back as part of SOBA, not in a, not, not in a, uh, August, because that would mean, wouldn't be the process. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Oh. Just to for speak. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Any questions? Yeah. Just to, uh, just process clarity. So this comes back in. August as a report um, and unfunded service packages need to come back at the end of August. I'm just wondering about that timeline. Uh, we would attempt to do both simultaneously so that we would meet the, um, the deadlines for the extensive review for, for service packages. So I think we might be getting into some very odd weeds here, um, Madam Chair, in that um, if it comes back in August and then we debate it once more um, and council chooses to go ahead with an unfunded service package, uh, we are debating this issue now three times on what will essentially be the same information with small variables. So that's my position. Um, I'm not sure if we need to have three debates on this. And I think that uh, there may be I, I, I think the governance here is super important, but we do not even have um, a year over year sort of indication of success or failure or adjustments or anything of such a program. And it might be smart to just move ahead because we're going, I can't assume what council is going to do, but it seems like a good idea to me to go forward with this program and gather the data as we go and add to it. But I will just leave it there. I'm not comfortable with pulling uh, the motion, or uh, but if we do, the amendment uh, basically serves as the referral. So it depends on the will of committee, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, is anyone from finance online? We had asked earlier, didn't hear from anyone. Is anyone joined us now? We haven't managed to get someone to join us yet. We're trying though. 
my concern is that we are not following the proper process. That's why I would like to get an opinion from finance on the unfunded packages or, or funded or unfunded service packages to be considered. My understanding is that uh, it has to be, go, it has to go to SOBA. I, I just need to understand the process. If we fall in the process before I vote on it. I'm not sure, Ms. Lemon, if you're able to give any direction on that. Yeah, I'd like to channel my inner Stacey Padbury, but she's way smarter than me when it comes to the dollars and cents. But I do believe, Mayor, that your understanding is correct um, regarding the timing around Falsoba and that that is the vehicle through which any kind of budget decisions are made. Um, but I will defer uh, for someone from finance to confirm. Clerk Martin, do you have anything to share? We are trying to get someone online from finance right away. Um, if committee wanted to postpone this items later on the agenda, you could do so and proceed with the next items, um, or we might be able to get someone from finance momentarily. Okay, and so I would like to ask uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, would you like to speak to someone in finance before you yeah. make a decision I, I on just want to make, uh, absolutely, I think we need to have a clarity on the process because uh, this will, if this is not the right process, then we're breaking the process. That will set a bad, 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 bad precedence. Regardless of support for the, pro the desire, I absolutely understand. We just need to make sure that process is properly followed. So I would have to get that, I need that opinion from finance. Well, I So feel maybe we can put it. Yeah, maybe we, we can, can postpone go to the next it. Item I, feel, I feel that if you're not comfortable with, uh, you know, getting enough answers from uh, administration or finance, then yeah. we'll postpone this. Actually, I'm just getting a note from uh, Stacy Padbury that she can jump in um, from a different meeting to uh, to respond to these questions. Just one moment. Lovely. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Paquette. Do you have any questions? Uh, just process question. We can wait. We can wait. I just I, I've said it before. I don't know how many times we have to debate okay. the same issue. Yes. Yes. So. Thank you. Councillor Rice, did you have any questions? No, co just to speak? No, co no question, just to speak. Okay. Ms. Padbury, are you on the line? The link is being sent to her right now. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wright, any questions or to speak? For Ms. Padbury. For Ms. Padbury, okay. So we will just give that a moment. Stacy Padbury has just joined the meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, Mayor Sohi, do you have any questions? Yeah, just want to understand, uh, Stacy, if you get a chance to look at this motion and also the uh, original motion from uh, Councillor Rice, uh, it is a request for unfunded service package. My understanding is that unfunded service package will come to fall SOBA. Uh, but if the desire of council or committee is to have a further discussion in August, can our unfunded service package be brought forward in August instead of SOBA, uh, fall SOBA? So the service package itself is the mechanism to have the budget discussion. But if you're asking, I think what you're asking for is, can we bring a report that gives you the same information on the service package in August. I think that we can do. That you can do. So, yeah. it, it, so in your mind, if this motion as written is fine to have uh, a unfunded service package come in August, or or would that to be, or this needs to be reworded differently? I, I think it would probably be preferable if you of saying that we bring an unfunded service package in August, that we bring back options for service enhancements in August. Oh, I see. So that would that would be the amendment required that instead of unfunded service package that we say, uh, sorry, say it again, what that would be? Options enhanced for service, service enhancements. Uh, options for enhancements 
would be the proper way of doing it. Okay. Uh, I would move that amendment to this amendment, wherever is applicable, clerk. Let's just get some wording there so we could add an additional point that says um, to that we bring back options for service enhancements. Actually, let me just please work on that just for a moment. Yeah. And then if I may just jump in, that assumes, I assume that you would make the budget decision though in the context of the larger budget discussions in the fall. Or when this come to committee in August, if committee wishes to start a program earlier, committee could give a direction for a, a funded package instead of unfunded package. That way it's a clear direction, even though it still has to be debated during uh, the fall SOBA, but I think it'll be more clear direction uh, to administration. So based on the information, yes, you so may based... direct us to bring a funded package. Yeah. I would just clarify that until the budget yes. with the funded package passes, we cannot assume that it will pass. Yeah, it would still has to go to SOBA discussion, right? That's correct. Got it. That, I, I understand that part, yeah. Yeah. I'm done. You're done? Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, Mr. Mayor, did you make an amendment? I think Chris is wor working He's on it. He's working wording. on it. Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. come back to you. Uh, Councillor... Right, go ahead. Ms. Padbury, how much is in council contingency fund? Uh, I just need to double check to be sure, but I think it's in the, I think it's around 400,000, but give me a minute to double check okay. that. Because we could access that then if we wanted the program to go, to get off the ground for this snow season. Uh, potentially, but I'm, I'm not sure that's going to be enough funding for you. To get us going for October, November, December, and then budget will take over from there? Sorry, I'm not, I'm late to the meeting. I'm not sure which enhancements you're debating, but it's quite possible that whatever enhancements you are looking at will be significantly more than 400000 Okay, and I, and I guess that'll be debated, but so there is around 400. If we wanted to just sort of jumpstart the program early before fall SOBA. Yes, potentially. Okay. Like if, you, if your question is, could I allocate council contingency to jumpstart the program? I suppose that is, <clears throat> that is something that you could do. I'm just flagging that I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Okay. Okay. And Ms. Flamman, would that? Ms. Flamman, the total package that you indicated, like over and above the, the seniors, was about 450. So to do option one, we would estimate three FTEs at 327,000. If you're interested in option two, it's paying for those three FTEs in addition to 450,000 for operating costs, bringing to a total of option two to 777,000 as our rough estimate. Yeah, but that would include if we manage the seniors program as well. But if it could be less if, if we let the seniors, if we let the province manage the seniors program, right? We would still need FTEs. That this is not something that we can do with current um, capacity. See. Just to remind everyone that in this branch, uh, these are municipal enforcement officers. Uh, that's the core part of the work. So we would be requiring FDs to do uh, and create a program that currently we don't have. To do the administration. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice? Do you have any questions, Councillor Rice? We, we are at 11.39 and we're still on our first item, so I would, requ I would request that uh, we try to speed things up here a little bit yeah, and, Madam Chair, and make I a decision. That, so, I, I believe that the mayor had uh, 
one more bullet point to add to the subsequent, mm -hmm. and then that, that should cover it. We should be able to vote on it and move on. Mayor Sohi, did you yeah. want to move an so amendment think, to the amendment? Uh, I think there's some, I think, I, I let me give uh, some clarity. It's seeking, I'm seeking clarity. So if the desire of Councillor Paquette, is your desire to have a report come in August for further discussion at committee? My desire is to move on, <laughs> however, uh, yeah, if, if it's the will of committee, no, no, what is your desire? Is the will of council, then what would have to happen is uh, Councillor Rice would have to withdraw her motion. I would have to restate what is the amendment as the new motion with your amendment added to it, which I can do all in one. So you wouldn't have to make an amendment, but I can just throw that all on the floor. And that way a report comes back at the end of August. And at that time, council can determine whether they want this to be an unfunded service package or a funded service package to send to budget. Okay. But what is or your, what nothing are your at all. What are your intent of this motion to come back as part of SOBA as presented? That was my intent. Okay, that's um, fine. Then if, if, if it's coming as thing? part of if it's coming as part of SOBA, then we won't have any discussion in August. I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay, so then yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So we will speak to the amendment now and the motion together, if that's And possible. just to confirm, we'll, does committee wish for this item to come back in August or wait until the fall SOBA? And from my understanding that if it is uh, an unfunded service package uh, that comes back to the fall SOBA, we will get that information end of August as all unfunded service packages need to come forward at the end of August, is that correct? I would also defer to Stacey Padbury on the timing. Um, I know that there's internal deadlines for when uh, administration has to provide these service packages, but I'll defer to Stacey to, to share when that information will come to council. So in terms, <clears throat> if, if the question is, when do you need to give direction on a service package? I think we can take that direction up to um, the weeks before the budget. And when would we receive the information from this motion? We so, heard that it was going to be at the same time as the, at the end of August. Okay. Pardon me. The way I read this motion now is that it, it doesn't seem to tell me where to bring the, un, sorry, I'm just reading it quickly. It doesn't tell me where to bring the unfunded service package. So I would normally then assume that the budget when it comes, it will include an unfunded service package. So as written, I think that I bring the unfunded service package with the budget. Okay, and when would we receive the information of that unfunded service package, the, the amendments for the extra information? When would we receive that or when would we be able to access that information? We were under the when understanding that possibly end of August we could access that information. So when the budget is released, if you want it to come in August, that's where I think you'd have to, and maybe I'll, uh, look for help from Ms. Eesbrick, but without, I, I wouldn't normally bring a service package early, but if what you're looking for is the information that will tell you what you want to do with the service package, we would, we could bring you a report back in August that does that. Yeah, so if I can just build on what uh, Ms. Padbury, the CFO has said here. So if, if committee is looking to have a, a bit more information before it directs the creation of a service package, I would suggest the amendment and the motion on the floor be taken off the floor and that administration pass, or sorry, that committee pass a motion to ask administration to come back to the committee meeting at the end of August with all of the information that you're looking for. From there, Councillor Rice or Councillor Paquette, um, Stacy could then prepare a service package. What's presented right now would be coming back to the uh, fall SOBA and those dates were just amended at council last week. So it'd be coming back to council released at the end of October for a November discussion. 
Okay, so there's a little confusion here. We understand that it would be coming back at Falls Soba in November, but when do we receive the information on the service packages? Yeah. So, Is it so just at full, that time, or do yeah. we get information prior to? No, so the full package for Soba and SCUBA, and sorry to use the acronyms, again, we'll coordinate with the budget office, but those would be released off the top of my head. It's the end of October, beginning of November. So if you're looking for an interim step and you're looking for, as I think Councillor Paquette was indicating, they'd like to have a conversation in August, you don't bring service packages through committee. That's not the process. That's a council process. If committee would like an interim step, I would suggest you remove the motions on the floor and provide clear direction to administration to bring forward the information you're looking for that would then inform a service package um, follow-up motion. Right. It is my understanding that it, we weren't expecting it to come back to committee. That was not on the table, but we did think that we would get information, just uh, a, a public information on the motion uh, prior to the actual day it comes to fall SOBA. Well, you would get that information would be included in the budget that we release. And when is the budget released? At the end of October for deliberation in November. Okay. All right. Councillor Rice, go ahead. Uh, so it's my understanding uh, we have many presidents already and at the committee level to make a decision to bring unfunded service package and for for SOBA. So. Uh, I just uh, struggling here why and we cannot uh, add these two points into the main motion and then as usual we make the motion to bring unfunded package and to the SOBA for discussion and uh, by that way council only ha will have one time one more time debate instead of have two more times debate, as indicated very clear by uh, Councillor Picard. We do not want this debate over and over because last year we did we did the comprehensive debate back to February to accept the motion bring today, and today we have all morning debate again. And then if we separate August and to Soba. Now remember, that means we will have two more debates. So I'd rather move this to motion, uh, add to the main motion, and then to move forward directly and for the unfunded service package as usual with it, and then to have one more time debate and to make decision, we provide the funding, we budget this or we not budget, we will not budget, and instead of the information already there and put together as a budget. So with that say, uh, Madam Chair, and may I just do the quick quick speak, use my time. Please do. And because we are already 11.47 for the entire morning debate for this, yes. for this item. Uh, I, I would like to say, and our item to, our item to is Winter City. And everybody, every my colleagues, probably already know how important to support our seniors and also our Edmontonians with limited ability for the snow removal in the winter. And then the program, and in the past years and years, so many years, the city already existing program to support the seniors to support Edmontonians with limited ability. And right now we are at the point to make a decision how we look at the gap in the program we have provided in the past and to fill the gap to make this program more effective. And I understand some points brought by uh, my colleagues. Those points are all valid more valuable point. But we cannot just wait year by year and create that gap and for lacking of services in the place. And give the, all the work administration already did, 
already the data provided in this really comprehensive report in front of us and give the, all the analysis, three options already provided here. That demonstrate administration's work is already to move to the next stage for us to fill the gaps and to provide enhanced services to seniors and to the Edmontonians and with limited ability. And why we need another two debate and then on the same information and over and over. So I really don't understand for that. So I, I'm going to support Councilor Bricat's amendment for this two points to add into the main motion and put the main motion as a one unfunded package and for us to debate, to decide, for our council to decide, we are budgeting these services or we're not budgeting these services. I think that is the proper way and the effective way and efficient way for us to move forward. And instead of come back August and to do another debate, like this morning, and on the same information over and over. So I did not say that is proper governance approach. And for this well-known topic and the well needed demandings and then identified gaps and how we can fill out the gaps. So that is my uh, speech. I encourage the committee to make the same decision and to vote on this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rice. So just to confirm, I, I heard you suggest we're speaking to both at the same time right now, and, and we are in the speaking to section. Yes, please. Wonderful. Excellent. I'll be quick then. Uh, uh, I'll support the amendment. I'll support the main motion. I, I just I want to reiterate uh, what I talked about in my questions. Uh, I, I think generally speaking, we, we need to do something. I'm very concerned with the idea of us needing to hire FTEs ourselves when we have an existing program in place that I think can be modified. So I just, I want to stress that a million times over that um, I, I hope as part of what comes back, uh, there is a conversation with the seniors coordinating council and the senior centers who are already doing this work and determining uh, if if there is a better way than us, what, what would feel to me like recreating a new system or a, an existing system uh, versus modifying the existing system that is already in place and has been in place now for close to a decade. So um, just, I, I wanna make sure that I didn't, I don't think I need to amend anything. Uh, we, we've spent a lot of time on the discussion, um, but, but I don't think we need to hire our own FTEs. I think there's good process and structure in place. I, I would just encourage them in as part of that, that body of work that's identified in these motions that you bring in those who are doing the work every day, because I think they can, they can fulfill that at a much, um, lower cost, uh, even if they need additional resources to help supplement that work, I think it will be at a far lower cost than what, what we're proposing on our end, um, which then allows us to either redirect that money to providing additional financial support if that's what's needed, or just to not use that funding and put it towards something else that might be important as well. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, uh, I, I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to chat about. So uh, thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll support these, uh, the, both the amendment and the main motion, and then we'll discuss it uh, at budget. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Mayor well, thanks, Councillor Rice, oh, by the way. Thank you, Councillor Rice, for making the motion in the first place. Just want to give you credit for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Mayor Sohi, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I know I, I look forward to this information coming for a fall SOBA for discussion with additional information on the data and the gaps that exist in the data, uh, because at this time, if I look at the number of takers for the Alberta program in Edmonton, 636 people use that program. In Calgary, 700 people use that program with all the additional support that Calgary City Council provides through additional dollars, right? If we were to add three FTEs and just get to Calgary numbers from 636 to 700 numbers, that's almost $5,000 per applicant. That's a lot of money being spent uh, on, uh, 
on, on outcome that we can probably achieve as Council NAC has suggested through other partnerships with uh, uh, community organizations. But we need that data. Uh, I look forward to uh, that data. We deeply care for our seniors. Uh, we deeply care for people with uh, mobility challenges and we do offer them support. I just wanna make sure that people understand that uh, 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 that in the past, snow uh, programs have been provided. Some were successful, some were not successful. Some relied on community partnerships. In this case, the, uh, the snow to go pilot uh, was a partnership with community leagues. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we'll see if that can be revived or not. Uh, uh, but I think uh, I just want to make sure that uh, the uh, uh, that people understand that. Uh, the uh, snow removal is only one of the many, many programs that we provide to seniors to make them make their life uh, life life better. So look forward to that information. But there got to be more physically responsible ways of delivering this program. Uh, there got to be more cost-effective ways of delivering this program. Uh, at the at the onset of this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, but this if if the option is to spend three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Uh, and hire three people just to increase the number by 64, that is not a responsible use of taxpayers' money. I also look forward to uh, some of the other options that, are, that will be generated as part of the service package. Good. Uh, okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rutherford? Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to take a few minutes to speak to this, I think. You know, one of the things I'm hearing from my colleagues is frustration over the amount that we've debated this this morning. And I think what we have to always remember is that when we're debating something so extensively, it's because it's important. And it's important that we get this right because this is something that keeps people with disabilities and seniors in their homes and not able to live a good quality of life in the winter if we don't get this right. So I, I, I understand the frustration and I'd also just say, you know, I think that that reflects how important, important this is. Uh, second of all, I am not convinced, as I had already alluded to, that the, the path forward is the correct approach. And I think that more data is going to be insightful in actually making sure that whatever we put in place isn't just looking good, but actually effective and making a difference in the people's lives. I think about you know, $450,000, and I think about how right now we're at 22 days to clear our transit bus stops. That's our service standard right now. Is that $450 better used to enhance that frequency? I don't know yet. We'll have to debate that at budget, but I think it's not to, to suggest that getting more information to doing due diligence to having a diverse opinion is bad governance is really frustrating and I'm really tired of my colleagues weaponizing governance and uh, as uh, a tactic to uh, dissuade debate. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette to close. Uh, yeah, just, um... I didn't make a point of order there, but uh, that deserved one. Uh, ascribing motive to uh, other counselors. So um, I, we've had a long conversation about the, the, the process here. Um, I think that what we've come around to is uh, the original concept. So I'm happy about that. And um, I'm happy to uh, hear that there is probably going to be support for this motion. Um, long and short of it is we have these uh, conversations because they're important and uh, our whole job is governance and the importance of uh, unrolling that uh, in a way that serves the public. And in this case, um, we are asking for an unfunded service package. I would prefer a funded one, but I think we need to have that uh, last debate on this and um, uh, I just look forward to the information uh, that will come back to us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Please vote on the amendment. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That has carried. Please vote on the motion.
participating on one vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. All right, we are done. Item 7.1 at 11.59. So we'll see you all back here at 1.30.
We're live from River Valley Room. Good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. I would like to call this meeting back to order, and we are going to uh, start on item 7.2. Uh, do we have uh, a, a presentation from administration? Just a verbal comments, introduction. Okay, lovely. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Councillor. And good afternoon, committee. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That was very rude of me. I forgot to do a roll call. Thank you, Councillor Rice, for reminding me. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'll do a roll call. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. She is here. Hello. Good afternoon. Mayor Sohi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And we have joined with us today here, Councillor Stevenson. Hello. Hello there. And I'm going to just check and see if we have anyone else online. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I don't see any other councillors online right now. If you are there, please let me know. All right. So now please go ahead. Thank you. Not a problem and thank you so much. So good afternoon, committee members. My name is Alyssa LaLiberty. I'm the branch manager of Economic Investment Services. With me in person today is Brett Latchford, Director of Strategy and Emerging Economy, and Tom Gervin, Director of Downtown Vibrancy and Safe C City. Joining us virtually is Lori Angus, Acting Director of Neighborhood Services, and Shan Svensson, Manager of Neighborhood Services, and Rana Bremer, Director of Partnership and Event Strategy. As directed at the November 2nd, 2022 City Council meeting, administration has provided a report on pursuing options for cost-sharing partnerships with organizations to increase small-scale community amenities, recreation, and leisure spots in the downtown area. This includes options for joint implementation of a pilot program for small court-style activities, corporate sponsorships, and similar initiatives. The city has many projects, plans, and policies that provide direction for small-scale community amenities and recreation in the downtown area. Edmonton's Economic Action Plan aims to create the conditions for a resilient economy by maximizing the potential of existing city land, assets, and physical attributes. Current projects create more spaces for Edmontonians downtown to improve their overall wellness, providing spaces for recreation and leisure, either as places to exercise, to be passive, play or move through. For example, Warehouse Park will be built by 2025 and it will have a number of different active and passive recreation activities built into it. Centennial Plaza is currently being upgraded. There are future plans for McDonald Drive and Beaver Hills Michael Fair Park is being refreshed. It's administration's position that there are already processes and mechanisms in place to support the creation of new downtown amenities using existing resources and that these are sufficient to encourage the creation of amenities through partnerships. We encourage organizations to continue to work with city administration on current and future proposed projects. This report focused its attention on the Downtown Vibrancy Fund, which can be used to enhance spaces or create downtown events. The Downtown Vibrancy Fund already has an intake process and is suitable for the creation of amenity spaces downtown by businesses or community groups. In the report, administration proposes two different options for using the Downtown Vibrancy Fund. The first option is to add an unfunded service package of $300,000 to the fund. This option would require a fall supplemental operating budget adjustment. The net new funds would allow for greater flexibility for funding more downtown amenity projects. The second option was to use existing Downtown Vibrancy Funds and not add to the fund. The Downtown Vibrancy Fund currently has $5 million and the Meet Me Downtown Fund has $1.5 million. This option increases the competition for funds, thereby reducing the number of amenities that could be funded. A third option, which is not recommended, is to create an entirely new fund for downtown amenities. This option requires not only a budget adjustment, but the creation of a new grant process and associated staff resources. In addition to the Downtown Vibrancy Fund, the City has a community-led construction projects process which can assist community groups that want to enhance, um, enhance amenities on City-owned land. However, this program would require additional resources in order to accommodate additional projects and that maintenance of these sites usually falls on the community group. In instances where maintenance and operations don't fall with, with the community group, the city's operating budget would need to be adjusted and funding would be sought as part of the budget process. 
There is one community-led construction project currently exploring this process in the downtown core. The project being considered is a refresh of Veterans Park. Furthermore, nonprofit organizations and community groups may apply for third-party corporate grants and sponsorship packages as another way to fund improvements, either to their own land or to city-owned land, once permission has been granted. Administration explored the possibility of making the former Bill Reese YMCA site into a hard surface basketball and, or, and a tennis pickleball site. However, a decision was made that this site would be required as a laydown site during the construction of the LRT line. Unfortunately, another site downtown was not available that is city owned and large enough to accommodate several hoops uh, and or a tennis or pickleball court. One small site nearby um, could have one or two hoops, but it's adjacent to Warehouse Park, which is likely to have hoops or other activities. There is also another uh, city-owned site uh, near the Chinese Seniors Lodge. However, previous attempts to animate this area with temporary skateboard equipment did not garner much interest, possibly due to its location farther from the core. Chinatown stakeholders had mixed reactions to the suggestion of using this site. There was opposition due to social disorder, but there was also some interest in outdoor fitness equipment for seniors. Uh, with the acknowledgement that the area might need to be fenced to prevent vandalism. More engagement would need to be done to find a partner and suitable for this site should Council want to pursue this as an option. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll move to our speaker, Punita McBrien. Are you online with us? I am, yeah. Hi, great. Thanks. Uh, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Uh, my name is Panita McBrien. I'm the executive director of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. Um, I mostly today just wanted to reaffirm that um, these types of projects are really critical to downtown vibrancy. And I know uh, that's why this, this motion was moved originally. And we appreciate that this was a priority for you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And um, I think it's important to consider the economic payoff of these investments. So when we talk about amenities downtown like these, um, the work that that does to attract residents and retain residents pays off tenfold. Uh, and it's just not quite the same payoff when you look at those kinds of investments in other neighborhoods. Obviously, there's lots of reasons we want to put these kinds of amenities in every neighborhood. But when you have um, a whole bunch of overlapping reports coming up, including I know tomorrow at Urban Planning Committee, you're talking about family-oriented residential development. I know we've got residential incentives coming up uh, at a future council meeting. Um, these types of amenities, we keep hearing again and again from the development community that we need these amenities downtown in order to create a complete downtown um, and, and to actually make it a desirable place to live. And that's uh, every bit as important as any of these other conversations we're having about downtown development. And I think you'll see that in the letter from, from UDI that came through for, for tomorrow's discussion. Um, there's two other uh, quick things I wanna add, three other quick things. Um, just want to reiterate that out of this report, um, administration did cite several um, projects underway that will satisfy some of what I think council was looking for. So for example, like Alyssa mentioned, uh, Warehouse Park will include basketball hoops, will include a new playground for kids. Um, that is so critical. And so getting the Beaver Hills House Park and Michael Fair Park renovation and the Warehouse Park construction all completed on schedule is our highest priority right now. So as much as these other opportunities are great, um, we're really hoping that those projects get done and get done right and get done as soon as possible. Um, that's, that's mostly what we're, we're concerned about on this issue. Um, and then the other opportunities that exist, I think are adding amenities to existing parks. Um, I think many of you would have seen at Downtown Spark, we put some swings in at Alex Dakota Park and it absolutely transformed how that park space is being used and who's using them. Um, we typically only have budget to do those things on a temporary basis, but adding permanent infrastructure like that to existing public spaces can be really transformational. Um, and I don't know that that was really explored as part of this report. Um, and the other two pieces that I think we're missing from this report are indoor amenities. This is really top of mind right now because a couple of my board members were just in Calgary um, and walked through uh, the Devonian Gardens in the middle of downtown Calgary, which takes up the entire top floor of city center of their city center mall. And 
it's a it's a like 2.5 acre uh, indoor amenity. There's a kid's playground in there. It is always busy and it is actively managed by the city as a city park. Um, and it's used year round by residents and visitors and office workers. So I think, you know, we've got a similar opportunity in something like the, the park in Citadel. And I think the city really could and should do more to actively manage that park space and promote it and, and use that asset that we have. And I know City Centre Mall here in Edmonton would be very, very eager to be a partner in creating similar indoor amenities in our downtown. And the other thing that I was that I think was missing on the corporate sponsorship and funding opportunity side is philanthropy. And the Devonian Gardens is another example of that in Calgary. So that was donated to the city of Calgary, Calgary in the 70s by philanthropists. And then the city just recently spent $37 million to renovate it. But you know, I've seen this in cities all over the world. I think in Edmonton, we used to have way more of this where rotary groups or the community foundation or other philanthropists would invest in things like parks and amenities. So I think we need to get back to tapping into that and the Edmonton Community Foundation might be a good partner for that. And the last thing I, I have to talk about on this issue that um, I think is mentioned in the report but needs to be top of mind is that we can't have this conversation without talking about the importance of adequate maintenance, cleanliness um, and safety of our public spaces and amenities downtown, because every time we went to our, our members and our downtown community to talk about this report, um, there's still this attitude of sort of defeat that um, why are we talking about adding new amenities when we don't even seem to be doing a very good job making the ones that we have usable for, for everyone, usable and safe and, and attractive for everyone. So that's, I think, a really important consideration in all of this. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll just ask my colleagues to sign up to ask questions of the speaker. Councillor Paquette, you selected this item. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Panina, for coming out. That was amazing. Um, so I guess my first question is more of a conceptual one. It's a little bit more challenging. Um, but um, every time you try to do something good and talk about something great that's happening in our downtown and the efforts that are being expended there, especially by you and your organization, you will immediately bombar be bombarded with people who are more than eager and almost uh, as if it's their job to point out all the bad things that are happening as well, as if to negate all the good things, as if to sweep all that away as if it doesn't matter. So how do you feel we can approach that when it comes to uh, these types of programs and these types of ideas in order to tell a much stronger and better and more positive narrative that doesn't deny, you know, the challenges we have, but also doesn't deny the good things we're doing. Uh, so an easy question for you. Yeah, I think we just have to keep on trucking. Like, I think that's what we all do. And I know, I know I see council um, trying to do that too. Like it's, um, a line that I often use is that one of the biggest differences between downtown Edmonton and every other major city that people want to point to and say, well, they're doing better and they're doing better is that density is one of the biggest differences. And so unless we're doing all these things that encourage density, we're going to keep having the, the safety conversation. We're going to keep having the, you know, all of those negative conversations um, because a, a busy and a dense downtown is a safe downtown. Right. Okay. So, um, I'm hearing, and that's interesting because basically what you're saying is like, if we have these messages that we know work for city building, but we deliver them with a unified voice, maybe that becomes a stronger and more compelling voice. Is that what I'm hearing? A bit of a leading question, but um, I do have a question about, um, yeah, because I also uh, walked that area uh, on the top floor of the Calgary uh, Mall, which was quite beautiful. Um, but I'm assuming that was a private investment. No, it, it was not. It okay, was, great. Please it tell was me originally that. way back in the 70s, um, built by philanthropists and then donated to the city of Calgary. But it has been actively managed by the city of Calgary since then. And the city of Calgary just spent $37 million completely renovating and rebuilding it uh, about 10 years ago. Okay, that's fascinating because I would have assumed that it was private, which is really, really cool. 
the the okay. least space is free from the landlord, but everything inside it is is invested and managed by the city. Wow. Okay. So that's basically an installation the city made in a private facility. Yeah, and they call it Calgary's only indoor park. Okay. I mean, we do have Wysam Tamal, but I'm not sure if we count that. We do have the Matark, which is similar um, it, to our credit, but but something like that in the downtown that's designed for play and leisure and has a playground and all those things would be huge. Yeah, so that brings me to my other uh, concern. Uh, as you were going through the list of some of the things that Calgary has, it's like, wow, that's all very centralized. We also have a Devonian Gardens, uh, but it's far out of town. As you mentioned, we've got uh, the Citadel. Uh, which is great, but there's uh, it's not really embedded in retail or commercial. And uh, so we've got a few challenges here. So um, reading this report, what do you see as maybe some prime opportunities for centralizing some of those efforts? Uh, I don't know that I do, to be honest. Like, I think the biggest okay. thing would be to maybe approach some of these landlords um, and, and, and like the report indicates, like the downtown vibrancy strategy is, is probably the place for them to go and access funds. But I think with most of this kind of thing, I just think we're thinking really small, like the sheer amount of money that other cities are spending on their downtowns relative to our, you know, six-ish million dollars a year on downtown vibrancy is we're not even in the same ballpark. Now you look at Warehouse Park and that's more of the dollar amount that we're talking about. So that's why I really want to yeah. emphasize how important that is. Um, Absolutely. But, but creating these kinds of things, indoor or outdoor, does take a, a lot of money. Yeah, so, and I just want to end uh, by thanking you, full credit to you. There used to be a debate uh, in surrounding suburbs, like why are we investing in downtown? Now the debate seems to be why are we not investing more so full credit to you and all the all the work you've been doing thank you thank you madam chair thank you councillor paquette mayor sohi thank you chair uh, uh principal uh i'll start with uh, your first uh ask finish current projects on time on that are, are, are you flagging any concerns not really, more okay. preemptively, just wanting to make sure that, I know there's an upcoming funding vote um, where uh, I'm hoping it's just a formality for council to approve the funding for yeah. Warehouse Park. So yeah. I just really wanted to stress the importance so of that all, project. But good, good, good thing to remind us, absolutely. Yep. And uh, we will follow with the administration on that. And your second point, add amenities to existing parks. Uh, these are small amenities that can be accommodated through the existing vibrancy uh, fund, right? through partnership with private sector. That's uh, what's tricky. Yeah, that's what's tricky because existing parks are city assets. And so the private sector, I don't think is really gonna do that. I suppose it's an opportunity maybe for us to say, you know, we wanna access the downtown vibrancy strategy to put some permanent pieces into city parks. So DBA, um, could, do you think DBA could access vibrancy funding to add amenities to city owned parks? I think so. Yeah, I think that's maybe something for us to explore. But it is tricky that it doesn't, it's not really a private sector op opportunity, but right. it's, I think, something that us or the community league would have to, yeah. to we, figure out. We, we, we all, I'll ask that question to administration about the possibility of partnership with DBA and the, and the downtown uh, community league. And your third one, Devonian Garden, I think an exciting idea, but that would require absolutely a separate funding profile uh, and vibrancy funding is not going to be enough, or is not enough, right? Uh, and it'll take away from other projects, whatever money we have. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask those questions too. But do, do you see possibility here uh, for some something similar to Devonian Garden that could be a year-round attraction for people to come downtown? Uh, uh, could involve community foundations, uh, could involve private sector, uh, could involve you know, city, other orders of government. This could be a bigger conversation, uh, at least having a conversation about having a similar, uh, that type of amenity in the downtown. I think so. I think that's what's so inspiring about that project is that, um, yeah, it. I, I do think that philanthropy piece of, of this is missing in that scan of corporate 
uh, partners, because I think um, if there's a vision and an opportunity that we can all kind of latch on to, mm-hmm. there are there are people who really care about the downtown and um, it's a really, it could be a really cool legacy thing. So okay. I think. So what, what, um, what would you suggest as next steps on, on, on uh, having, initiating that conversation? Yeah, I wonder if maybe um, Tom's group at the city could convene a conversation with the community foundation and a couple other um, prominent philanthropists and find out um, if there's interest and appetite to take something like this on. Okay, maybe they'll, maybe I'll I'll consider that as a as a motion, uh, giving some direction, or if if it, even if it's required, maybe having earlier conversation or reporting back in some way, right, Tom? Uh, something to uh, to think about as we go through this conversation. And I want to come back to your last point. I think it's a very very important point you're raising is maintaining what we have, right? Cleaning it up, making it usable and enjoyable. Uh, do we, do we do we have permanent funding available for that kind of uh, ongoing maintenance and cleaning up? Like, what where, where's the gap? Why are we not maintaining and cleaning? My hope is that that new um, project uh, that's being undertaken, the the center city um, operational funding for parks and roads, should be making a difference. Um, just hearing from my team, I think some of the challenges we're having definitely have not gone away yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're still trying to work through what that looks like. Like for example, we were doing uh, yoga in the park last Saturday morning, the first day of, of Alfresco and my team had to spend the first two hours making sure there was space to do yoga because there was people smoking meth where mm-hmm. the yoga was supposed to be happening. So it's like, that's that's still just a, a daily reality of, okay. of public spaces and, and leisure spaces in our downtown that other neighborhoods don't have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we added more resources, but we'll confirm that with the administration. And need be, then we need to add more, right? Because we need to make sure that uh, existing facilities that we, I heard, I think, 35 facilities or that park, small parks that we have, that uh, they should be well used if uh, they're not currently because of cleansiness and other issues. Okay, uh, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for joining us and your, uh, and your work, Vanita. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councilor Rice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Polina, and join us and to give us opportunity to ask you questions. I do have the f- few up questions here. So the first one, because right now the item we're discussing is about the caster sharing uh, mechanism to in- increase small scale and community amenities. So I just want to get your perspective on this caster sharing uh, Mike Lazen, what does that mean to you, to your organization, and other business organizations um, on this cost sharing financially? I would like to get perspective from you for that. Yeah, I think that's what administration was trying to explore. Um, I think the challenge is that organizations like us are are quite underfunded, and we usually rely on grants either from the city or other orders of government uh, to take on projects like this. So that's where you'll see their their corporate scan. You can ask questions of administration, but they're looking at major corporations that might um, be willing to sponsor uh, these types of projects. And then that's where my suggestion came in too, that there's also um, philanthropists and and charitable giving out there that could maybe be directed to these, these kinds of projects. So I think there's just, I think there's just still more work to be done to figure out where the cost sharing opportunities actually are. Okay, so do you see, do you see there any uh, opportunity will come out in the future and if city add more amenities in the downtown area, so that means uh, the organization, business organization and other organization will uh, increase their financial investment on those amenities. Do you see that way? I, th- I think so. I think part of it is um, making sure that whoever is going to be contributing is confident that the asset, that the amenity will be well maintained and well used. Um, there's actually another really great example I forgot to mention, the, the Chinese Garden down in Louise McKinney Park. That is entirely a community driven uh, initiative. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. a recreational amenity, but yeah. it's um, a really valuable um, part of 
of our downtown parks yeah. and that's actively managed, maintained, you know, added to by the community group who decided to take that on, um, which is the, the, the association that um, is the Chinese Garden. Yeah, um, Chinese Garden. Yes, he is a good yeah, piece. So, yeah, so I think there's, but when I say philanthropy, like I think there's lots of different ways that communities could be mobilized to take on this kind of thing. Yeah, um, so, but they do need a lot of city support and a lot of confidence in the city as a partner in order to take So I, I really like the, your point about the confidence for the investment and then even work with the partnership with city as well. So my next question, I, I would like to go in back to the economic payoff piece. I, I want to get better understanding. You, you did some comparison difference between the investment in downtown area and other uh, community if we do. So what I heard here is if we invest more in downtown area, we can get more return. Is that, is that what's my understanding correct? Yes, absolutely. So that mean, does that mean if we invest more, we will attract more people living downtown or we attract more business? How that, uh, I still try to figure out the uh, connection here. And because in downtown area is more commercial area, not residential area. So I just try to figure out what's the uh, distinction between there. And because other community amenities in a different community will be more residential uh, track in, instead of commercial. So what do you mean specifically here? So we have about 13,000 residents in the downtown core right now, which makes us by far the most densely residential populated area in the city. So, um, and it is a lot of commercial development, but a, a vibrant and sustainable downtown in the future requires a lot of residential development. So we're way underperforming other major cities in terms of residential density downtown. We have to have more residential downtown because the, the property values that we have right now that are based on offices are not sustainable. And, okay. and the entire city budget relies on densely populated, highly utilized space okay, downtown, so, yeah. and residential is the only way to get there right now. Okay, so what I heard here is is just more investment and attract more residential, not business. Okay, thank you for that clarification. It's both, they'll come both. together. Okay, so my yeah. next question, my next question is about the usable maintenance and for the existing of facilities. Um, so my question to you is based on your experience and as a leader of the business community in downtown area, uh, in for the maintenance is uh, adequate and sufficient, do you, uh, do you think and then we have enough facility amenities in downtown area already if we keep our maintenance work and in the good, in the good position? So I just want to get that sense very clearly. Yeah, I think with the projects that are planned right now, there's a couple of community needs that aren't being met. So one, tennis courts, for example, people are asking for pickleball courts. Those kinds of things would still be really great to achieve. But oh. with the projects that are planned and the amenities that we have now, if maintenance and cleanliness and active management of those spaces were sufficient so that they were welcoming and usable for all, that would make a big difference. That alone is a huge part of the challenge. That's wonderful. That is what information I'm looking for. Thank you so much for that clarification. I have one more question. I will come back to the next round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Ms. McBride, for being here today. Um, you know, I really appreciated hearing you confirm that, you know, um, those bigger investments that we're making in Warehouse Park and in, in Beaver Hills and My Health Fair are really on track to, to meeting our, our amenity needs. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, just, just the, you know, individual little additions that are mm -hmm. planned. Like there is three on three basketball courts planned for Warehouse Park and, you know, there is a playground and there's, you know, more, more dog park space planned. Like those things are being integrated into these plans. Yeah, well, you know, and that's a good reminder too, just in case we ever get to a, you know, a budget reduction scenario, but just recognizing that those facilities really are, are critical to keep in there. Um, 
I also, you know, I, I think what I really took away from this report is that there are, that, that there is funding, that there are programs uh, that can be used for, um, um, you know, making additions to park space. I just wanted to make sure that um, the mayor, the mayor touched on it a bit, but just that, that I, I don't want us to both be, like I don't want the city and I don't want community partners to each be waiting for the other to take the first step. So I, I just wanted to confirm that, um, you know, is it clear to you that, that I think the city's doors are open, but I think the, the approach, and I'll confirm this with staff, is that we're waiting for community partners to, to, to come forward with their ideas for us to fund? Yeah, I think so. Like, and I think, you know, I'm, I sit on that um, committee with um, uh, city administration for the, the downtown vibrancy fund. And all of us have been trying to go out to the community and make sure that landlords and businesses and community groups, like everyone knows that this money's there uh, and that the city's door is open. The two main barriers I think we have when it comes to getting those businesses and landlords to, you know, step up and do this one continues to be and i hate i hate to say it again and again but it continues to be just fear and lack of confidence in you know how well the public spaces are going to do and just fears about disorder and crime and and how costly these things are to manage in in our current context so that's one big barrier uh, when it comes to public amenities and public spaces and the other one we had one pocket park that a landlord was really excited to do and my understanding is it kind of fell apart on the legal side they didn't like the city's legal requirements that were coming with the the grant funding and i frankly i don't understand nearly enough about it to speak intelligently about it it would be maybe a a question for you to ask uh, administration uh either today or in the future but that was one that had some potential and then and then when it came down to getting the funding agreement signed um it, it was just not going to work out Okay, that's that's incredibly helpful, and I'll for sure follow up with uh, with our staff about that. Um, but it sounds like, because I was wondering if if the gap is maybe in information sessions, but it sounds like the awareness is there, um, or or would information sessions help with with Decal with other community groups? Do you think? Uh, potentially, yeah, I think so. I think, uh, yeah, there are probably groups out there that still don't really understand that the money's there for them and that and how broad and you know flexible it is. I know Tom is trying all the time <laughs> to get that message out there, but um, yeah, maybe info sessions or something like that would help. Okay, perfect. And then you know, I also really, really appreciate your point about some of the the corporate sponsorship or corporate involvement. And I think we're seeing some of that happen. I'm thinking of ATB Plaza in terms of the investment they're making in, in animating their open space. And again, just wondering what, who, who leads on this, right? Because I don't know that the city often sort of does fundraising campaigns, for, for lack of a better word. Um, but again, it's also a huge, huge thing to put on an organization like the DBA, for example. So what do you think is a good mechanism to, to have those conversations, to bring bring people together who are interested in investing in the community, what's what's a good place for us to to start? I wonder if it is, um, yeah, my my colleagues on the Downtown Environment Sea Fund um, core group, whatever we're calling that group, might hate me for saying this, but I wonder if it is more like we could do more as almost more of a steering committee. Mm. Um, we've got some really great partners around that table and I think if we treated it more as a board or a steering committee um, and did more of that work as like as conveners, hmm. uh, maybe maybe that's part of the answer because I think it has to be a partnership approach and we've got those people at the table already. Great. Well, and I think, you know, the ways that the city can support that too, happy, to, you know, happy to have those conversations, but really appreciate the thoughts. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice. So just a last quick question regarding the social disorder concern and in the reports. Um, I do want to get your sense right now among the stakeholders and because they did lots of engagement with stakeholders um, about the associate with the cost and for this cost sharing program, that is one concern with the, with the concern about the social order remaining still. And another one is uh, required security. And does this concern, 
does this concern will um, make uh, our business community and really uh, hesitate and to have more investment in the downtown area. So can you comment on that a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. We're still, we're still losing investment. We're still losing office tenants, retail tenants, um, creating economic hesitancy, all, all because of the, the ongoing challenges with um, social disorder and um, mental health and addictions issues. So what I heard here, uh, is, that, is that fair to interpret as a way and like this, say, um, because of the safety and also social disorder concerns and the security concerns for the business community still remains in the downtown area. So right now, instead of invest more money to add more uh, like uh, amenities and rather, and then we spend some money to resolve those uh, type of concerns first and before we, we invest more money to do something. And with the other factors, we already have other several projects uh, underway and to really resolve some other issues regarding um, amenities. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, Councillor. I've seen other cities, including New York City, where their parks and public spaces are staffed all day and then they close at night um, because that is the way that they make sure they're, they're usable and functional and safe and welcoming for everyone. Um, so that, and it's a lot of money to staff parks seven days a week, but that's an investment that a lot of major cities have had to make um, in order to manage these issues. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. That's my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette. Oh, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Panina. You're building a lot of questions, and I've got some more for you. But um, I thought this was, this was going to be a pretty quick one, but. <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, we, we consider uh, places like Little Italy or 124th Street still sort of in the downtown concern, right? Yeah, okay. So I was just, uh, I made a little list of like these little pockets of like amazing opportunity we have. Little Italy, Chinatown, the Churchill Central Shopping Culture Area, Ice District, Warehouse Park upcoming, uh, Jasper Avenue, of course, 104th Street, uh, the uh, Downtown Universities area, um, Brewery District, 124th Street. We have all of these pockets of exceptional opportunity um and so do you feel like what we're talking about today is part of that sort of interstitial connection between these places because i think if we could and i'll get your opinion on this like can we really maximize all these areas by creating like a natural connection to to each and every one so that, like if you're at one place you know, will naturally potentially flow to another to another to another but right now there's not actually that natural uh connector yeah, that's a really totally valid observation. And we've talked about that a lot. I know our board even had connectivity as one of the DBA's priorities, you know, five years ago, like how can we um, encourage more of that and make it a better experience from one sort of mini district to another? I think, unfortunately, what when you see those areas get stitched together in other cities, it is development that does it. Like if you have empty space, you know, undeveloped space um, in between districts, like it's really hard to fake it. It's really hard to like create vibrancy where there's nothing. So incentivizing development um, is really the easiest way to do that. Like we can even see, you know, the city's tried really hard with the quarters um, with, you know, everything that's been invested in, you know, park and infrastructure over there, but because there's no people that live there, or work there, that are, that are filling that space day to day, those investments are, are I hate to say this, but it's, it's a bit of a waste because you're not investing where the people are. Um, and then we've learned firsthand through that, that like just investing in infrastructure doesn't automatically make the people come. Right. Uh, yeah, so this speaks to some challenges because um, part of that was ice district taking attention away from that part of the downtown, right? And so there's only so much investment dollars that can go around. So the question is, does it make sense to utilize this conversation today as part of the, uh, you know, 
the the steps or the the way to create that uh, convening sort of board steering committee that you were just talking about so that we can develop with the city and with the province and with our uh, private partners and with our community leagues and all of these organizations, a larger vision of what downtown could and should be, the investment required, the efforts we're already making that we can build on, and to actually have something that is cohesive and strong that is exciting and will make all of us as Edmontonians proud. Like that's that's sort of what I would like to see come out of the, not just this discussion, but every discussion we have now. How does it strategically fold into everything else we're doing? Yeah, so what you're describing is the new downtown plan, which we do need. And I know I'm, I know Alyssa's team or, or um, the, the economic investment urban planning team knows that. I know it's in their work plan. You know, their city plan, there's a district plan. And then our capital city downtown plan is from 20... 10 I think or 2000 I think it might be from 2000 um it's very old um and and it it needs to be put to bed and we do need a new downtown plan so that's definitely very high on our priority list for for the city yeah and not just in a vacuum but taking the best of what we see in other cities and saying does that work here does it not work here what comes out of this is that sort of like what you're talking about yeah absolutely yeah okay so um and then I guess the next question would be then uh this sounds small what we're talking about today in that in comparison to that but it's an essential building block so do you feel that you have uh the ability to dream and to strategize that big as big as we need it um, i mean we also have the the zoning bylaw renewal that should help with the development investment you're talking about so do we have enough that's a big question that I don't know how to answer. <laughs> right. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions to our speaker, but I'd like to thank you very much, Punita, for joining us today. And thank you also for all the work you do uh, for Edmonton and Edmontonians. We do appreciate it. So next we will go to questions of administration. I know, uh, Mayor Sohi, you have some questions. You can go yeah. ahead. Uh, let me start with the kind of a big visioning idea about uh, something similar to Devonian Garden in the heart of the city. Uh, as you progress on the, uh, on the new downtown plan, maybe that's a, that's a place to uh, convene the right players and uh, have that discussion and bring something uh, forward with the viability, if it is viable, uh, uh, through initial discussions. Is that possible? Absolutely, Mayor Sohi. That's something that we would look in to look for those big, bold ideas, not only a park like was described today, but other things in terms of what's going to take Edmonton's downtown in the f into the future. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's absolutely something we can look into. So that doesn't, that means there's no direction required at this time because you're just having those initial conversations, but you'll, you'll undertake that as part of many other creative ideas that visioning session that's that correct have. okay got it okay that is good because I then I would not be making any motion at this time maybe future absolutely look at that I want to come back to the maintenance of existing amenities and parks uh, uh, what is the reason that we are unable to properly maintain and make them enjoyable and clean them up uh, before I pass it to my colleague Craig, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we're unable to maintain and clean them up properly. I or think maybe adequately. Yeah, I think it's a it's a resourcing question, um, and I'll I'll pass that to uh, Craig, who can speak to that. Yes, sorry, I uh, I am on the line. I did miss the question though. So why cannot we adequately maintain? the existing amenities and parks that we have in the downtown and keep them properly cleaned so people can use them. Well, one of the, um, one of the things that we have going on right now is um, we've, we've just launched a, uh, a, new, a new team leveraging some of the money from uh, our province. Uh, so we got another $1.3 million added. Um, with that, we'll be, we're adding and we have added an additional 23 new people to focus on the center city. Um, so 
we expect this year in comparison to, to last year uh, to see a noticeable difference, both like qualitatively, quantitatively. Um, so we're calling it the center city optimization project and, and it's intended to do exactly what you're asking for is adequately maintained. So, so is like it how, how long you have the funding for that? So that funding only goes until uh, February of 2024. Uh, so it's it's taking people and having a single point of contact, a structure that can specifically look at the center city uh, to maintain um, to ma maintain infrastructure uh, in the uh, in the center city, and we we linked it to the center city to connect with uh, the language used in, and and the boundaries within uh, the city plan. Okay, and do you have those teams now? We do. Yeah. So and teams so have been they're hired. already out there uh, properly maintaining and cleaning up our uh, amenities and parks? That's right, so the team is, is it's new. Uh, we're piloting it, we're getting it off the ground, uh, and we're expecting that this, this summer and fall will, uh, that, you know, BIAs and, and residents and those visiting uh, in the center city uh, so will then, notice uh, a difference. Then why would uh, DBA would have to spend two hours cleaning up a park for yoga class, right? Or, or we are not there yet as far as we're just initiating this, these new teams. Uh, teams are, are off the ground. Um, I would say there has been a noticeable improvement okay. in terms of, of cleanliness. I think it's going to be difficult to stay on top of all messes and uh, uh, the service levels are improving, um, but there certainly will be instances where uh, uh, we'll have to be reactive. Um, but the level of proactiveness has yeah. dramatically increased. So what happens after February 2024 that the, if there's no funding available, then you would have to... So it's, it's a one-time funding, right? It's a one-time funding. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, the, the funding was uh, taken from the $4 million provided by the government of Alberta for yeah. downtown revitalization. So we directed 1.5 million of that 4 million to support cle uh, cleanliness so, efforts and the majority of that funding went to this project. So the, but that funding, funding will be completely that's expanded. A one, that's a one-time, yeah. By February twenty. That's correct. So next year. There is no funding. To, okay, that's something I'm interested in bringing forward a motion to have that discussion during the budget, because uh, otherwise we will have a similar situation that we experienced with adding one-time funding, then going back and, uh, you know, scaling down the uh, some of the work. Okay. Uh, I'm out of time. I might come back next uh, for second round, depending on the conversation. But I'll bring forward a motion, yeah, unless you want me to bring the forward that now, or you want me to wait. Uh, uh, yeah. You can go ahead if you'd like oh. to bring forward. So a I'll, motion. I'll move Keep that uh, that administration bring forward an unfunded service package for consideration during the fall 2023 supplemental operating budget adjustment to continue the city center optimization project, including an increased focus on maintenance of parks. And uh, uh, brief introduction, uh, it is uh, what we heard from DBA, this heard, we heard from our administration that there's one-time funding available that is making a difference, people are seeing the difference, but we need to make sure that uh, we need to have that conversation. Uh, by November, we will have more data, more information on the, on the effectiveness, and if that effect effectiveness is demonstrated, then council can debate whether to carry on with that uh, uh, that maintenance program uh, on on a permanent basis. So that's the intent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Councilor Rice, please go ahead. So, uh, thank you, Mayor Sohib, for putting this motion regarding the maintenance is not at new community maintenance. Okay. So, thank you for that clarification. And my question is, what's the funding source? Um, are you going to expect to, to support this maintenance? I think uh, we would have to identify a funding source when we uh, discuss this uh, uh, during the SOBA, fall SOBA. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's, there could be OB12 reallocation depending on where we are, or it has might have to be tax levy, right? To depending on the, the conversation that will take place during uh, the, uh, the fall. Uh, budget discussion. Then my question is, the funding source could be the existing uh, downtown vibrance fund, and because we still have five, I, five, I, I, we still I, have five I, million dollars there. I would not recommend that because that five million dollar is uh, needed for many other uh, investments that downtown 
requires, maybe that, that discussion will take place uh, okay. in, in the fall, but I, my preference would not be taking money away from $5 million, then, then we're gonna set back some of the other initiatives that are in but that debate would occur, yeah. occur when we come So back. if, uh, okay, sure, and I just want to understand, Benny, why I'm asking for the existing and the funding, the Downtown Vibrance Fund, if we still have $5 million there, and then that funding could be used for the maintenance related to vibrancy, and instead of add additional tax levy, and then right. as a, a result. Maybe administration can yeah. answer that, but my understanding is that $5 million is also one-time funding. It's not ongoing funding, right? So well, is that one-time funding as well? No, we do have $5 million, um, per year in the next four-year budget You're cycle, ongoing. but I would, okay. um, I would stress that there are a large number of priorities yes. uh, in support of a, of a vibrant downtown and reallocating funding to core services would not be a priority, meaning, you know, the cleaning side of things. The funding is very much focused on leveraging additional investment from community and organizations. For instance, last year we leveraged 8.4 million in private investment for the 6.5 million in funding that was given out. So. Um, Okay, uh, thank you for that. So indicated that his ongoing funding, and then we can have further discussion on that piece. And I'm going to ask Lake's question related specifically um, the statement and um, indicated in the report the existing status quo and is the best to suit and to the downtown amenities. So. And also indicated very clear the additional cost sharing mechanism and it's not a lot recommended and for that three options. So then my question is for those three options uh, in the report, do those options apply for city owned mind only or apply both city owned mind and then private line as well? Councilor Rice, just to clarify, you're talking mm -hmm. about the three options in yeah. the report the, specifically. The sharing, yeah, cost yeah. sharing mechanism. Yeah, yes. they could apply for either. So this okay. would be looked at, um, it would depend on where the funding is coming from, downtown vibrancy, if that was an opportunity that someone from the community came forward with. We are open to working with any partner on a project that's going to have an impact on downtown vibrancy. And, and Panita talked about that core group that is working very heavily to promote those types of activities. When it comes to cost sharing with the corporations, the um, list that's in one of the attachments of the report, those options are um, projects that would be led by an external organization. But again, um, we would be able to work with those um, individual organizations to secure that funding, would look at those projects to see again, is that a funding mechanism that would co come through um, the city? And if there is land that we can be a partner in it, we can look at all of those options. Really, we're looking for partners who have a great idea, who want to work with the city, and then we can help pathfind the avenue that's going to be the best fit. So it could include city land, it could include private land, and really it's dependent on the project that's going to have an impact on downtown vibrancy. Oh, okay. Uh, then my, my next question, I just use a few seconds here. So if Mayor saw his motion here is to focus on the maintenance, mm -hmm. and do we still need to receive the information for the report? Because Mayor saw his motion is talk different sense. And information one and the reports, one is talk about caster hearing mechanism. So there's two differences. Do we still need that? I would defer to the clerk's office on process. I, sorry, can you repeat the question one more uh, time? I said uh, Mayor, so his motion um, is different from the reports we are talking about the caster hearing mechanism. And it, do we still need motion to receive that report as information? No, if the motion on the floor is passed, this action would be carried out and the remainder of the report would be received for information more or less. So, so there's we don't not need a separate, to ask. no, no. Okay, okay, sure, that's my question, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just uh, for everyone's information, there can be motions made after this as well, if anyone wanted to bring any forward, so. If there are things in the report that you want to see motions made on, you can also do that in this 
conversation. Okay, so uh, to administration, um, first of all, thank you for this report. Uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. I uh, I understand uh, the mayor's concern about uh, maintenance and cleanliness. So um, I just want to touch on that really quickly. One of the things we've talked about in the past is uh, the responsibility of uh, businesses for uh, cleaning up in front of their business. So if it's dirty on the street in front of their business, that's actually, you know, partially or majorly, primarily their responsibility. So when it comes to uh, these parks, um, my understanding is that these are all private or uh, public parks. Like we're not talking about private parks here. Yes, that is that's correct. correct. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, and uh, like further ask questions on the motion on the floor. Um, as the mayor was, was talking, I was thinking about how businesses try to make their business look attractive in order to attract customers and to present their, um, you know, the quality of, of their establishment. And that cities are basically no different. So when we're talking about the challenges of keeping things clean, if we're looking at from a from a business minded perspective of attracting people to our uh, downtown, um, is there a proactive effort on uh, administration's behalf to bring these issues to council's attention so that we can adequately address them? I think I'm going to ask Craig to answer that question, please. Um, how we would exactly bring forward like maintenance and cleanliness issues in public parks downtown, how we would adequately bring that to council's attention. Yeah, in a proactive manner. So, for example, look, we just don't have the resources to keep things clean. Here's the state of things. Um, just a, this is a memo or this is an update, just FYI. I think we we attempted to achieve that with the Centre City project. It, it originally started with just a simple reorganization of existing resources. Concurrent to that, working with Tom Jervin and the Urban Planning and Economy team, um, we were talking about the provincial funding, and so then that kind of amped up what we were able to do. Uh, so we were, over the last couple of years, looking at how do we better improve this and how do we better reorganize ourselves to have a single point of contact that can look at not just graffiti and cleanliness, but potholes and traffic signage that gets left behind and all of those things that annoy everyone in the center city. How do we better organize ourselves to uh, better maintain with the existing resources, trying to be as, as frugal as we could. And then this injection of, of uh, provincial dollars really helped amplify that. So, um, the uh, the media release we did, uh, I think, was a part of this. Um, okay, uh, I think we might be straying from the question a little bit, and that is how how does council get proactively informed that there aren't enough resources in order to ensure cleanliness in our parks? How does council proactively inform? Um, because how can we uh, be how can we be responsive to situations if we are not made aware of them? I think, I think the best thing we can do is continue to work on articulating service levels and, and expectations. Um, I think the demands and supplies uh, side keep, keep fluctuating. We're, uh, we're involved with a number of projects to help define what we can adequately do with our resources, similar to what we do with snow and ice. Um, so with the budget of yeah, people- Okay, have, so maybe a dashboard, something like that updates i don't know i don't i'm actually genuinely asking because uh we hear these complaints across the 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 entire city but also particularly in the downtown about cleanliness it's something we all care about but without being told that there are not enough resources to keep things clean and what those resources would be required we cannot be responsive does that make sense it does yeah and so and so really i see that as you know, articulating here's our service levels and expectations. When there is graffiti, how long should it take before that gets cleaned? Um, and being clear on what those service levels are. And then from there, if those service levels are inadequate, 
uh, then that's a budget discussion. Um, and if the surface levels aren't being met, then that's an administration concern. Like, how do we better uh, hold ourselves accountable to those service levels that are clearly and publicly transparent? Yeah, I'm out of time. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson? Thanks very much. I'll do a, a rapid fire round, but really appreciate the report. I think the recommendation um, is, is very sound. Just wanted to confirm, though, the Vibrancy Fund isn't oversubscribed? It is not. Great. And the projects that are listed in Attachment 1, um, the partners are aware of these funding opportunities, and would these projects likely rank well in a, in a Vibrancy Fund review? Yeah, I think in terms of uh, any activities related to attracting more people downtown to live, work, play, and visit, they're always welcomed and very highly prioritized. So. Great, and, and I think also the focus was some of those permanent installations that would be um, you know, a legacy, and it seems like these projects align with that, that intent of the Vibrancy Fund. Yeah, the shift really last year, more fo in the last few years, more focused on COVID um, response and recovery to a more longer term strategic view on how we can achieve sustained vibrancy um, is aligned with this type of work. Great, and I and I heard from our speaker just some concerns around the legal requirements uh, for this application. Is that some follow-up discussion you can have to understand how we can remove those barriers? Yeah, I don't believe that to be a barrier. Uh, if you'd like further discussion on that, I'd suggest that we would do that in private. Sure. Well, and and we could we could follow up, but but good to know that there's ongoing dialogue to understand. How yeah, to I can tell you that in terms of in terms of um, the funding program and how it's been designed on all levels, the design the intent is to make sure that it's accessible, and that the speed is a, a, as quickly as possible while maintaining the integrity of the program and the and the public funds. So. Great. Great. And then it sounds like you're already doing a lot of proactive outreach to let people know about this. Um, have we done an information session with, with DECL or? DECL is acutely aware of the, uh, of the funding, uh, a really strong relationship with, um, with the group there. They are one of our core partners. So for clarity, our core partners committee was established to support evaluation of applications. That includes the Downtown Business Association um, and DECL. Um, and Yes, lots of conversations with a wide variety of stakeholders about this um, and always willing to get into the details about ideas. Excellent. Maybe just shifting quickly now to the maintenance question. So, you know, I heard a few few questions from my colleagues around around service levels. I think what I, what I didn't hear discussion of was that a lot of this is driven by some underlying causes um, that, that these funds are not designed to address. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, and we heard that from the stakeholders we engaged with for this report. Yeah, so recognizing that, um, again, we, we want to do better. I, I'm noticing a difference. I'm hearing a difference in terms of what we're seeing in maintenance in a, in a positive way. Um, but, you know, recognizing that we can only go so far while we have some of those underlying conditions there. Um, but maybe to, to the mover, um, you know, I heard sort of that combination. It's, it's both maintenance and then also sort of the programming of those spaces. So just wondering if your motion... Um, is intended to, to capture some of that, that animation and programming, or, or if, if city staff have another perspective of, of how we might cover those resources? Well, that's one of the questions I have. Like, how do we, if more amenities needs to be added to existing parks that are city owned, how does that happen, right? So if there's a possibility of you know, removing some barriers, that would be a great idea. Well, yeah. I think too, some of that ongoing programming, like we see that on Churchill Square in terms yeah. of the activities, the equipment that's brought out. Um, would this motion, would that unfunded service package maybe include some of that, that programming funding, or do you see that coming from another source? Uh, so this motion as it stands is just around the maintenance piece itself. The programming stuff comes separately, and items that would come on existing public parks, I believe is the next report, 7-3, uh, in the community framework there, community park framework will be discussed there. Do you think that there is scope to expand this motion to include some further programming dollars, or do you think that we have adequate uh, resources through the Vibrancy Fund or, or other initiatives? I think Tom can speak to the <laughs> I mean, Vibrancy dollars. But. Yeah, from a resourcing perspective, we have them. If we want to do more faster, we could use more resources. I think the existing framework in terms of how we program public spaces and parks well, largely through community partners is sound. You know, we've got a large demand and a lot of events happening um, on public 
space and downtown. Part of that is through incentives from the Downtown Vibrancy Fund. Um, so I think the mechanism is strong at this point. Um, you know, the, the recommendation um, is as is. Okay, that's really, really helpful. Um, thank you and thank you to the mayor for putting this motion forward. I think it's excellent and, and appreciate, uh, appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Mayor Sohi, please go I ahead. I just have one question remaining, which Benita raised about uh, if uh, a d new small size amenities are needed to be added to existing parks, mm -hmm. and there's a possibility of partnership with the private sector or uh, you know community foundations and others. How do you make that happen? That it's not or I know vibrancy funding cannot be, is, is vibrancy funding eligible for that? Yeah, so we, we've already done it actually. Okay. So um, last year we awarded uh, 350,000 to Jekyll to support Michael Fair Park. Okay. Um, and that's an aug augmentation of services. So you'll see the polka dot mural, that's one of the pieces. Um, there's future lighting in a stage um, um, to it. So the mechanism is the Downtown Vibrancy Fund and we welcome conversations okay. about ideas to support better parks. That's that's great. That's all I needed to know because then you can get the word out to uh, community organizations, part, private sector, if they want to um, be partners in that. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, quick question. Um, we've got the Mayor's motion on board, which is... Uh, um, connected to the report, but um, I one thing, Madam Chair, I don't know is if there's a motion coming that addresses the actual content of the of the report as far as um, uh, what was uh, asked about in in the uh, uh, instigating motion in the report about uh, pilot programs for small court style activities, corporate sponsorships, et cetera. Yes, and I believe that Councillor Rice was mentioning that as well, uh, if we would still need to accept the report for information. But it is my understanding that that would not be necessary to do two. But it, it is possible to still do I, I don't need to, but I'm just curious. And so I guess to, yeah. uh, thank you for that. Um, to administration then. Um, Accepting the rest of the report for information, um, what direction does that give you to continue with this effort? I think what it gives us is the ability to keep working with our partners uh, through the Downtown Vibrancy Fund on these types of initiatives. We've received some feedback today around communication. We don't need a motion to communicate what we're doing with the fund or, or look for other partners. We heard from Panita, you know, philanthropy and, you know, other corporate sponsors. That's another thing that we can explore under existing mechanisms. So no further motion is required to to take the feedback we've heard here today and incorporate, in, incorporate it into what we're doing under the downtown vibrancy work or the capital city uh, downtown plan that is uh, slated for uh, um, updates as well. Yeah, okay, so understood. Um, uh, just for the sake of um, the fact that council is responsible ultimately for these things. Um, is it possible to get uh, some quick memo updates uh, periodically on how those efforts are going? Uh, so that we don't have to make a motion, we don't have to set a whole like, uh, you know, alternate work for administration, just some updates on how it's going. Absolutely, Councillor Paquette. We have um, monthly updates that Downtown Vibrancy is a part of. We can also right we can also send memo information that gets into these details in more or specifically. Or just in the updates, like a section like specifically geared to, by the way, you know, here's the work in this particular uh, sector or section that uh, um, was of interest. Yes. And then that way we can see how these partnerships are evolving. Yes. Okay, great. Now, speaking of partnerships, um, and speaking of the fact that this is a part of a larger vision, I'm just wondering, um, you may not be able to speak to this, but one of the frustrations that we've had uh, over the past uh, four and a half years is our ability to speak the same language as the provincial government in some areas and how we understand each other 
about what our efforts are, because I think that we have a lot more in common than maybe is seen publicly or even in private rooms. Um, and so when we're talking about, uh, you know, small scale community amenities and recreation and leisure and uh, cleanliness and all of these things, obviously, as Councillor Stevenson alluded to, it's tied into some of the social pressures that we're also feeling. Are we developing partnerships also um, with our downtown partners in the same room as our provincial partners so that we can start working out of the same uh, glossary and using the same lexicon in order to establish better um, cooperation and, and investment in these areas? Because ultimately, a healthy downtown uh, space and economy is a healthy Alberta space and economy. Absolutely. We, uh, we couldn't agree with you more. And we are, as we have secured previous funding from the provincial government for downtown vibrancy, it's an ongoing conversation. We've got obligations with that existing funding that we need to meet. And we haven't lost sight of future potential opportunities. As it okay. is a yeah. one-time fund, that's a relationship where we continue to foster um, with other levels of government to speak that and same language. And that's just at the ongoing because, yeah. you know, hopefully we don't have concurrent emergency situations. Instead, we have an ongoing commitment. Is that sort of your understanding as well? That's the target. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. I would like to follow Councillor Paquette's point. That's a very good point. And I heard, I also heard that we have lots of funding, uh, different type of funding source, and different program and project are underway right now to support our, uh, our downtown's uh, vibrancy. And I, I also record uh, I also record and back to the budget deliberation, we actually put some like investment to support downtown's vibrancy as well. And then there are a few, uh, at least how many million dollars there. Uh, so I just, yeah, I saw the hit lots here. And so really, really great news to hear that. And then we actually really take our downtown very seriously and try to add this as our, the one key area to attract more investment and to attract more business and come in as well. So I, I just want to say that very clear. And also my related question uh, is about the 7.3 when we talk about the community amenities and then because that is open to the, all the areas and including downtown areas. That is a general strategy and we're looking and we will discuss and how we do that in the way and for some high a priority area and some some underserved area as well, right? So if my understanding is correct, that means our con conversation will move to 7.3 and for the further. So 7.3, you're yeah. correct, uh, Councillor Rice, in terms of being applied to areas across the city and not focused on just the downtown core. So in that report, it's my understanding they're going to look at, um, at how, uh, um, additional um, amenities could be added to existing parks. That's a part of that report okay. is my understanding. So I can't answer details yeah, specifically, yeah, but we'll move to that's discussion. correct. But that's where yes. they've, they've looked at that, but Wonderful. across all parks. Wonderful, that means, and I, I think that for the 7.2, we really achieved the points that we discussed the reports and also uh, our mayor saw he and provided this maintenance piece. That's good, thank you, that's my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Maybe just a final reflection. Uh, you know, attachment three, I thought was a really great inventory of the amenities that exist, but I actually, you know, found that there's there's even more. There's, you know, the dog park in Alex de Goto, the Splash Park, the dog park in Ice District, uh, Dick Mather Park, um, EPL, law, and, then, and then not even to mention some of the private amenities. So all that to ask, do we have, um, do we have a location where maybe we have all of those amenities and opportunities in, in one spot um, as something that we can share with, you know, maybe businesses moving downtown, residents looking to move in, uh, or we could share with landlords who are, who are looking to lease out their spaces? 
Yes, we do have that inventory and not a problem providing it, Councillor Stevenson. That was part of the work we did with the original report from which this uh, motion mm. for this report came. So um, not a problem. We can follow up and, and provide that to you. Great. And, and just in terms of one of the other amenities that I think was alluded to and we didn't dig into too much was just around uh, community gardens. Um, just wondering if we have a sense right now in terms of the demand for gardens in the, in the downtown. It's my crystal ball, I guess. Um, I don't believe we have any of our colleagues um, online. I do know that the, um, you know, the pop-up garden program is available to downtown residents and was very successful overall. That's information we can get, get back to you. Sure. To no, no problem. We can definitely follow up offline. Uh, really appreciate the report again and uh, excited for this motion. Thank you. Okay, great. So I don't see any other questions to administration. Would anyone like to speak to the motion before I go to Mayor Sohi to close? I don't see anyone signing up. Okay, please go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I look forward to the, uh, the success of the Vibrancy uh, uh, Fund and uh, people taking on this opportunity to build small-scale amenities in the, in the downtown. I also want to credit our administration for, for being flexible and creating flexibility actually in the in the application and uh, and opportunities for uh, other private sector or philanthropic organizations to uh, to participate i think that's kind of flexibility is required in uh, in a time of um, the, such a need in the in the in in, in the downtown uh, i think the maintenance and cleaning up of uh, uh, our existing amenities is absolutely important i absolutely hear councillor stevenson around uh, you know uh, the uh, why we are facing these issues and why there are needs that you would not see in suburban community on needle pickup or uh, you know uh, some of the disorder issues but we have those issues in the in the downtown because of the lack of investment in housing lack of investment in mental health addictions and uh, all the other challenges that Edmontonians are facing but those are bigger issues we will continue to uh, work with the province to resolve them but in the meantime we got to create comfort we got to create safety and we got to create the cleansiness for um, for people to enjoy the amenities that we have downtown so look forward to this conversation uh, during the budget and let's see where we where we end up uh, uh, but i hope that committee will be able to uh, be able to support this uh, request for uh, unfunded service package for us to consider during budget thank you thank you mr mayor i will ask committee members to vote on the motion please We have all the votes. Thank you, please display the vote. And that has carried. Great, thank you everyone. Now we'll move on to item 7.3. We'll kind of carry on with the conversation. So administration, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, we are here today to provide information on community park amenity development in Edmonton. This includes updates on the community parks framework and planned implementation work associated with Breathe, the city's green network strategy. Joining me today is Howeda Hassan, Director of Urban Growth and Open Space, Suzanne Young, Director of Open Space Planning and Design, and Corey Churchill, General Supervisor, Urban Growth and Open Space, and Lori Angus, Acting Director, Community Standards and Neighborhood. We have a short presentation that Hoeda will walk committee through. Thanks, Kent. The city's approach to park development is changing. Administration is implementing the direction from the city plan and breathe. Uh, the city plan provides strategic direction for the city's open space network and speaks to the city's systems of parks, open spaces, and natural areas that support celebration, ecology, and wellness. 
Breathe further refines this direction for an integrated, multifunctional open space network and will replace the Urban Parks Management Plan, UPMP. Under the UPMP, playgrounds and basic park amenities are not a city responsibility, and so the Neighborhood Park Development Program, developed in 1983, has provided funding to support the development of shared and enhanced level park amenities, including playgrounds, walkways, lighting, and shade structures. Park development beyond these base, de base level developments was driven by the community on a cost-shared model with the city. In fall 2022, city administration adopted a new approach through the community parks framework to prioritize park community development. This coincided with the retirement of the neighborhood park development program. Under the community parks framework, the city is responsible for the delivery of core park amenities such as playgrounds and sh shade structures, while the community parks framework builds on the, on the strategic direction of breathe, the framework does not align with guidelines still in use and provided in the urban parks management plan. To address the challenges, administration is working to retire the Urban Parks Management Plan and use an updated approach that is guided by both the city plan and breathe to provide equitable access and development of open space. Next slide, please. Up until 2022, the Neighborhood Park Development Program was the primary mechanism by which community park amenities were developed and renewed on neighborhood level parks. The program provided funding of up to $250,000 to support the development of master plans, small playground amenities, playground development, and park renewal work. Under the program, communities were responsible to identify park development priorities and undertake the necessary fundraising to cost share the development or renewal of these amenities with the city. The neighborhood park development program was formally sunset in fall 2022, and projects already underway and approved through the program will continue to advance over the current budget cycle, but no new applications will be accepted. Next slide. The Neighborhood Park Development Program was a funding model rather than a strategic investment plan. The program resulted in inequities in park amenity development between communities and favored those communities with a higher capacity to undertake the necessary cost-sharing funding to support community park amenity development and renewal work. The map shown here illustrates access to, to program funding between 2009 and 2020 and highlights some of these inequities. While each neighborhood would theoretically have access to the same level of MPDP funding, not every neighborhood accessed the program funding. Many neighborhoods, those in white specifically, did not access MPD funding over the assessed period at all. The graphic also highlights existing playgrounds that are listed in very poor and poor conditions, identified by a red circle. This is useful in illustrating one of the concerns of the MPD program. Under this program, communities are responsible for funding the renewal and or replacement of the playground or park amenities through a cost shared program. For communities that lack that capacity to undertake the necessary fundraising, there's a risk that the park amenities would be removed and potentially not replaced. Next slide. The Community Parks Framework reflects a new approach to support the growth and renewal of community parks and is intended to replace the MPDP program. The framework identifies distribution and quality provision targets which will help administration measure and evaluate success. Distribution is considered at a variety of scales including the district level, uh, that 15 minute walk scale, and neighborhood level, a five minute walk scale. Under the framework, the responsibility to fund, develop, and maintain and renew park amenities shifts to the city. The city would be responsible for the delivery, maintenance, renewal, and replacement of community park assets on city land. This will clarify expectations for park amenity development as the city will now be able to assess and prioritize park amenities, both new amenities and renewal of existing amenities. Community-led projects including community gardens, community rinks, and halls that are subject to license agreements can continue to be supported. There is no change to the community-led project process. Next slide. Engagement was undertaken at an advised level for the community parks level, uh, framework. There are several opportunities to provide feedback on the community parks framework, which included targeted meetings and workshops with key stakeholders along with public opportunities. There was overall support for the Community Parks Framework and its vision for improving equity and distribution of park amenities across the city. The framework also responded to concerns that fundraising requirements posed a barrier for community groups access through the Neighborhood Park Development Program. 
feedback from engagement was used to refine the community parks framework, including consideration for core and secondary amenity categories, the, including, the inclusion of experience value as a criteria to help assess park amenities, and collaboration with community groups and ongoing support for community-led projects. Next slide. Council approved funding to support the implementation of Breathe over the 23 to 26 budget cycle has been approved. This work includes two components, updating the standards and provision guidelines to retire the urban park management plan and undertaking an open space network analysis. Collectively, this work will establish expectations for, of the city for the distribution and provision targets of core, secondary, and specialty amenities. It will provide greater clarity and strategic direction to support community and developer-led park development requests. With, with revised open standards, uh, administration will apply the community parks framework to assess and prioritize park amenities, both new amenities and renewal of existing ones. This in turn will inform future budget requests. Administration anticipates providing regular updates to City Council with respect to this work um, associated with implementing Breathe in the first quarter of 2024. This concludes our presentation and we're pleased to take any questions. That's great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now I would like to call our speakers up. Um, Jennifer Janvier, come on up. The clerk will guide you to your seat. Shelley Bell, are you online? <laughs> Yes, I am. Hi there. You'll, Hi be, there. Up. you'll be up. You'll be up, you'll uh, be up second. Uh, second. Jennifer McDonald. I'm not sure if she joined us yet. Benjamin Schroeder. Present. Hi there. You'll be third at this point. Heather Langenhan. Come on up. You can come have a seat up here as well, please. And Laura Chappelle, I think I saw you online still. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Hi. Are you to speak on this one? Or? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'll be speaking okay. on this one. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. And Holly Leader. Are you on? Hi there. All Hi. right. So uh, we're going to start with uh, speaker Jennifer Janvier. I'll just remind everyone you have, you'll have five minutes to speak. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address uh, council. Um, my name is Jennifer Janvier. I'm the chair of the Sarai Hafez Playground uh, Community Park. And we are here to speak on the new community parks amenities program. We are uh, for, for a change in the community parks uh, program because we have experienced some of the inequities that come with the NPDP program. Uh, one example of this is we have quite of an, an extensive community that is, is large in the community of McConaughey. And one park within our community received full funding of 250,000 while we only are able to access 75,000 under the NPDP framework. But both parks are equal in means. They're both adjacent to elementary schools and have quite a large population in these elementary schools. The second inequity that we've kind of faced that is not super related to the parks framework is that we formed our committee in 2021, which of course was under the pandemic, and we had an uphill battle of fundraising because of social distancing um, protocols in place, and a lot of our access to grants were put on hold, so we weren't really able to start accessing grants until 2022. Um, currently, even though we've like, faced these difficulties, we've raised a total of 53,000 in our own uh, community efforts, and this combined with the city funding and provincial funding brings us to about $402,000. We are facing a little bit of inequity because we are unable to transition to a new framework and there has been really no guidance in transition from NPDP uh, program to uh, a new uh, program because we were kind of stuck in this framework. And we were informed in February of 2023 that we now have to have all funds in place by 2024 to build into 2025. And in the reports given in the agenda items, we our cost of our, our full-scale project sits at about $880,000, which is in alignment with what the city suggests as an average park cost between $750,000 and $1 million. 
However, thankfully, the open spaces planning and development have been helpful trying to scope down our project and that budget's about 530,000, but we really do fear if we go with a smaller park and a smaller budget, we won't be meeting the needs of our community. Um, we were quite shocked by this deadline as well because other projects under NPDP guidance were able to kind of move their project deadline as needed depending on the funds available, but of course we're not given this grace at the moment. And they were also able to phase the project. So they were able to do a phase one, you know, maybe a $500,000 park and then add in something else later. But now because this transition is happening, we aren't given that same option. Um, for example, the other park in our neighborhood, McConaughey Park, uh, is actually just starting and is approved for their second phase, the one that received $250,000. And they were also given $15,000 from the city um, to put towards that second phase. Uh, to be clear, we, we are willing to build a smaller scale park because it is so important for us to have a park in our community, but we truly feel like we need, uh, if we go with the smaller scale, we'll be reducing our shaded shelter space, reducing lighting for safety. We, it might affect the type of equipment we can put in place. We have quite a lot of children at the school that it's adjacent to that have developmental disabilities as well as physical disabilities and we fear that it won't address their needs if we go with the smaller scale. Either way, if we go with plan A, our full scale project at 880,000, or if we go with our small scale at 530,000, we only have 18 months to either raise $437,000 or $130,000, which is a big ask for a group of volunteers. Um, while we understand the constraints of, of budget cycles and having to move forward with a new way to develop parks, we're hoping to receive a little bit of grace of possibly being able to continue with our efforts or per perhaps the possibility of being able to phase our park just like other um, playgrounds have been given. Um, I included a graphic which was pulled up at one point that really highlighted how many hours our volunteers have put in. And it's important to note that all of us have full-time jobs and have families and we're doing this in between all of that. Um, and this graphic, which might be a little hard to see, um, highlights the fact that we have highlighted many volunteer hours, how much money we've raised each year. And if we're given the power to continue with this, I'm sure we can reach our fundraising costs, uh, our fundraising goals, but unfortunately, um, we're kind of sitting with a really tight deadline now at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> for thank you very much for sharing that with us and thank you so much for what you do for the community. It's much appreciated. Uh, next, we'll go to Shelley Bell. Please go ahead, Please you, go have, ahead. Five you minutes. have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Shelley Bell and I'm a teacher at Sarai Hafez School. I'm also a member of the Sarai Hafez Community Playground Committee. Um, I won't repeat what Jennifer has mentioned already, but just to look at our large scale project and the importance of allowing us the time to continue fundraising for that program. Um, Sarai Hafez School currently has about 527 students enrolled all between the ages of kindergarten and grade six. Amongst those students are two full classes of interaction students who are all um, diagnosed with higher forms of autism. That doesn't include the students that have mild or more mild um, or forms of autism that are integrated into mainstream programming or our students that have things such as um, mobility delays, um, mental disabilities or other um, medical fragilities. Uh, under the new, under um, our, the constraints of our time timeline, there's a high chance that the equipment these children need to be included fully into the park, we will not have the funds in place in order to, to build them. Um, by giving us more time, we'll be able to um, use our full scale project which will um, better include these children and help them to be able to to have the equipment needed for their gross development as well as their interaction and mental health development as their peers and other children in the community. Uh, McConaughey itself is also a very diverse community. Right down the street we have McConaughey Gardens which is a senior's residence um, which the school has been partnering with and trying to create um, intergenerational um, connections. 
the residents here, many of them um, have been in the, are in the facilities for long term and do not have the outdoor spaces um, in which we can, in which they can use and promote mental health and different activities and active living. Um, under our full scale project, we have included the covered gazebo area as well as a further removed area for seating and meeting spaces in which we hope would meet the needs of many of the residents at the gardens so that they can meet with family and loved ones and hopefully the community would be able to offer some different activities for them through their organization. Um, on any day, you can also walk around Soraya Hafez School and we see large groups of adults that are meeting um, and connecting outside, sitting on the benches, sitting in the parking lot. These are people often without children that do not go to the school or don't have children at all. And they are merely meeting and connecting within the community in any space that they can find. Um, when speaking with these community um, members, they are very in favor of very in favor of a park and um, have even tried to do some fundraising themselves to support our project. Um, by reducing the amount of time we have for, for our fundraising, uh, I worry that we would not be able to meet the needs of these other adult groups by having to remove our secondary seating area, which is a little bit removed from the playground equipment, by having to remove our uh, covered structure, our covered gazebo uh, seating area, um, which really isn't meeting the needs of the community and um, the information and feedback we received in our survey that we placed earlier um, out in the community. Therefore, I feel it would be in best interest um, if we were provided with the opportunity to continue to work on our big scale project so that we could best support the needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll just call one more time for Jennifer McDonald. Are you with us? Not yet. So uh, Ben Schroeder, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Benjamin Schroeder. I'm a resident of the McConaughey neighborhood. I'm a father of a 16 month old daughter. My family and I moved to the neighborhood in early 2021. After a few months of exploring the neighborhood, it was clear that there was something missing. Um, that something missing was a playground. Um, as a new father and a quickly of a quickly growing little girl, playgrounds have already become an important part or pastime of our family. Currently, we have to walk over 35 minutes to the neighborhood the neighboring Shaughnessy playground or 25 minutes to the overcrowded Christ the King McConaughey playground. With there being limited options of amenities in our neighborhood, my family and I have been faced with either moving to the amenity rich south side of Edmonton or wait and hope for amenities to come to our northern neighborhood. Currently, we have chosen the latter. Um, this has resulted in me wanting to contribute directly to bringing amenities to the neighbor to my neighborhood by joining the amazing efforts brought on by the Soraya Hafez Community Playground Committee. Um, I have been working with this amazing group for the past, um, for almost the past uh, two months, and their passion and drive for the success of this project is exemplified with every fundraising event, planning session, grant application, and community engagement activity they have managed. Um, being a new member, I have been made aware of the substantial change that the City of Edmonton made by retiring the NPDP and forcing a hardworking group to change course halfway through the funding, halfway through their funding planning um, of an amazing playground by forcing the committee to by, by forcing the committee um, the committee to building whatever kind of playground they can with the money that they raise by the year's end of 2024. That's approximately 17 months from now. Adding this unprecedented deadline reduces this team's capabilities of providing the community of McConaughey and surrounding area playground that they can be proud of. So I'm here today um, at the City of Edmonton Council meeting requesting that the Honorable Edmonton Council members do the right thing and not force the community, um, not force a community playground committee with a deadline that has never been applied to any other playground planning committee in the past and honor the MPDP platform that the committee has been working with. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Next, we'll go to uh, Heather Langenhan. Please go ahead. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mayor Sohi, City Councilors, and City Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Heather Langenhan, and I'm the principal of Sarai Hafez School. I also represent the Sarai Hafez Community Playground Committee and want to speak on behalf of the significance of their efforts and the importance of their request to extend the new timeline given as the City of Edmonton shifts from the ND NPDP model of community park fundraising to the new community parks framework. While we are in agreement that the Breathe Green Network strategy is a step in the right direction, unfortunately, this passionate but small committee group is left with a deadline of 17 months to raise $480,000. In three years, they have raised just under 55,000 through bottle drives, community spirit builders like carnivals, donut sales, pumpkin walks. They've organized business donations and sponsorships, and the opportunities and lists goes on. However, the group was established during COVID and the pandemic restrictions in 2020-21, despite the barriers that were presented. All they're asking for is an extension of the time required to complete a community playground that is inclusive, that is safe, and serves children and families. They've done all the right things, including surveying and listening to the community at large about what they value in a community playground, just as they were expected to do under the NPDP model. Over 500 students, all of which live in the community of McConaughey, shared what was important to them at school and in their neighborhood as the NPDP model required. Now, with a shortened timeline to build the park, all stakeholders said that they wanted and valued will not happen if an extension of time is not given. This isn't some fancy, you know, state-of-the-art park we're asking for here, um, but it is inclusive and safe, which costs all that money. The park they're trying to build is in the northeast area of the city, an area that is known to be in need of parks and playgrounds. Sarai Hafez School is a growing hub for families after school hours, if you've heard already, and, and they're left to play in a concrete parking lot, and yet they're still doing it. Having been the principal of other schools, I see firsthand the difference a playground makes in the positive development of children's social skills, their ability to learn, their creativity, their resilience, and pure happiness. As a principal, I also see the need for students to be off of technology and outside, to play and to be creative. The NPDP model is what we were given as a community and this group has met all of the required expectations. We're all witness to the challenges of mental health, complex special needs, creating Indigenous representation, and community that need inclusion. This park requires time for these parents to continue their unwavering commitment to a community park that honors each of these important considerations, but it does take time. They are not asking for money, just time to raise it. They told the community based on their feedback that this was happening. How will the city answer these questions when a park they value and committed to will not be built? During the transition from NPDP to the Breathe Green Network strategy, please support these families, this community, this school, and most of all, the children who will benefit from a park by granting an extension to any community working tirelessly to build a safe, inclusive, indigenous honored park one fundraiser at a time. This is a win-win for the city of Edmonton, the Northeast, and most importantly, these children. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you very much for joining us today and your patience as well. Uh, next we'll go to Laura Cunningham Chappelle. Please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? 
I'm yes, coming to you from the plaza today. I'm not, but I think it's prudent just to talk about important public spaces in our city and how dedicated the EFCL has been over many, many decades in this city to ensure that there are good public spaces. So as the executive director for the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, I'm here today to support the community parks framework in order to ensure wider equity and distribution of vital gathering spaces and amenities across the city. So as I said, it's prudent for me to acknowledge that community leagues have helped to build over $500 million worth of recreation amenities across the city in our history. They do this while working full time, raising their families and much, much more. So this has all been built by volunteers who've committed those thousands of hours of their lives to creating safe and engaging infrastructure in their neighborhoods. And this continues to this day, as we've heard from these incredible people already this afternoon. This is a significant shift. This new community parks framework is a significant shift for community leagues to come out of the space of funding playgrounds and spray parks, as over the years it's become increasingly difficult for them to raise those required funds and to keep volunteers motivated. It takes so many years to do this work and to raise the money. So these projects often build really strong relationships in the community. We know that there are other ways that this can happen, but playgrounds and parks are full of hope. They're full of really great things that bring community together. And we know as EFCL will be committed to ensuring there are other ways to bring community together. So we agree that the current NPDP approach has to be reevaluated through an equity lens. However, the loss of direct community funding should be replaced rather than foregone completely. We recognize, as the group has mentioned here today, that there were groups that just weren't ready on that October 15th, 2022 deadline. They had already begun the process of community engagement. They'd been doing some fundraising, and now they have to enter the community parks framework process at some point. And, and at this point, with a priority over the next few years, that's already been identified in the reports. We'd like to understand, you know, where does this leave these new, these communities that have existing aging infrastructure in that renewal process. So I see that there's seven parks that have um, amenities that will be renewed in the coming years. So I'm interested to know how other parks needs will be addressed over the next few years if something comes up for them, if they have other renewal um, instances that are needed in their parks. On the map that we were shown earlier today, there were five sites that were identified as having very poor asset conditions. The playgrounds were in very bad shape, and yet those haven't been prioritized um, for renewal or rebuilding over the next coming years, to my understanding. So secondly, we also believe that the well-intentioned prioritizing co-location with the new elementary schools in the next few years without significant ongoing partnered investments from the provincial government is a missed opportunity. We accept the premise that a playground is preferred to no playground. Again, as I hear from my friends here today. However, it is so worthwhile to also actively engage with the provincial government to provide ongoing funding for this infrastructure that is clearly deemed as essential to elementary schools and to meet the needs of the kids in the community with their wide range of developmental abilities. Playgrounds today are imagined as spaces where the whole community can benefit. As we heard with a previous item regarding downtown, when we build them with this vision, they serve the active recreation and social needs for the whole community with accessible features like benches, adult exercise opportunities, shelters, bike tracks, all sorts of fun things. This not only ensures the longevity of the investment, but it also makes it for a safer community space when there's something for everyone to participate in. So we believe that Community Parks Framework sets out to do the right thing. We are supportive of a more equitable data-driven asset management approach. We're just concerned that with a focus on school adjacent playgrounds with the new growth funding, that it will mean a narrowed vision of who to create the space for, losing a place where the community can showcase its history, promote, promote inclusivity and connection, and create a space that's unique to the needs of the neighborhood. So again, as this report notes, community parks improve personal community well-being and make our cities more livable, climate resilient, and socially connected. The EFCL and its members look forward to working with administration and council to advocate for greater investment in recreation amenities in the next four-year budget cycle with specific investments that should be identified for renewal. 
From the conversations early today, it would be good to be included when the city begins to engage with philanthropists or foundations to look for funding for partnering in parks. Diversifying our funding is really essential right now for these public spaces to be continue to be important spaces in our community. So we'll continue to work with leagues as they raise awareness of the required maintenance and upgrade requirements for their play structures and as they aspire to have spaces in their community which reflect the population and uniqueness of the communities where they live. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to Holly Leader. Go ahead, Holly. You have five minutes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Holly Lear and I'm a parent of students that attend Surrey Hayfez School. I'm also um, a volunteer member of the Surrey Hayfez Community Playground Committee and I've been with them since uh, their inception back in uh, 2021. Um, and I think I just need to echo a few of the things that have been said and uh, I know it might sound a little bit like a broken record, but I think it's important to hear these things more than once, just to understand the impact that it's having now on our committee um, to um, being under the new framework uh, to, to, or yeah, kind of like going to that. And we were starting out under the MPDP um, framework. Uh, and I just think, there's there's some key points here that are kind of being missed um and some of those things are when we surveyed the community they they expressed some things that they wanted to see in our playground what this space was going to look like for um certain groups within our community um we have uh you know a whole host of different age category of people that access this space we have students from this school we have have um, adult groups that, like uh, Shelby was saying, that meet to this space um, after hours from school time. Uh, we have seniors that partner with this school. Um, the list goes on and on. There are many different groups that access this space, um, and to to basically be put in a situation where um, we are now having to scale back this space that we have. Um, essentially said to our community we are doing, we have been, you know, giving them the green light saying this is what is happening. Um, and now, you know, it really was um, kind of thrust upon us that, that we were going to be put under this new framework. It was a, a real shock to all of us, um, including our NRC, Shannon Murray. Um, and so I just, uh, I really would like some consideration put to the fact that, you um, we, we are, like Heather said, just being, we want to have more time to do the things that we're doing um, in order to give our community what is needed. And like was said before earlier, McConaughey is a huge demographic and a huge, um, just the statistically how many, how many families live there. And we want uh, consideration given to that fact, right? Um, and I guess one of my big questions that comes out of all of this is just, what is the harm in letting us go forth with our volunteer time and fundraising because we just want the time like heather said to be able to see this project through and to be able to do our plan a playground um and not have to scale back and see some of those groups of people lose out because of that um and then secondly i guess the other big point is that want to be able to phase our playgrounds. We have um, run into many barriers over the last little while with um, gathering grants. And part of that is because we we realize that we need to kind of have our, like our, our goal, I guess you wanna say, um, kind of be more ready to be able to access those, um, those grants. And so we put off applying for these grants thinking, okay, we're a little ways out um, when we probably could be a bit closer now, but now we, our timeline has become a bit of a crunch essentially. And so um, we're just asking to, for those two big points, to give us the time to be able to um, 
hope to be able to work on our project and to continue and to see it end as as we said it was going to be. And the second thing is just to be able to phase our our, our playground because um, that's important. We need to be able to get through getting a, a portion of it in place and then um, go on to you know phase two so that we can do things like a gazebo and lighting and things like that. So yeah, we would just ask for that consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just call one more time for Jennifer McDonald. Are you with us? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much to all our speakers. I'm going to ask um, Councillor Paquette, would you like to start with questions to the speakers? Oh, sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to thank all of the speakers who came out. Uh, this was very interesting and illuminating for everyone, I hope. And um, uh, my first question, I think I'll because you're in the room and uh, because of your position, I'll go with uh, uh, Jennifer um, to direct my questions, but um, you're sort of stuck in a strange place, sort of a, um, you know, a bridge place where uh, you were operating under the old model. A new model is coming in, um, but instead of making way for what you were already doing, it almost obliterates uh, the work you've been doing and, and set you back. So am I, am I capturing that correctly? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And so I understand that uh, administration, um, is sort of stuck with, um, the way that budgets work as far as these grants go. But from what I hear, what you're saying is like, look, because this is unusual, because we're going from one model to another model, help us bridge that gap with, and, and you're not even asking for more of anything except for time. Although I'm sure you'd accept more money as well. Always. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the big challenges that you touched on, but I think we need to talk about is that under the old model, um, something like $265,000 went to a park in, in the uh, area, which left only $75,000 available for you. And that creates a huge inequity and a huge barrier to get over. And so that's sort of uh, the root of, of your problems. The old model and the inequitable way that parks were funded as far as these grants, and then this new model where uh, it just becomes impossible for you to meet your deadlines before that's it. And years and years and hours and days of frustrating and joyful work though, uh, going into this. So that's sort of where I get the sense the committee is at and the community. Um, anything to add to that? I'm just trying to sum up what I've heard. Yeah, I feel like we have a really unique committee. Um, we have like really committed, <laughs> I mean, that's what a committee is. We're really committed uh, to this cause. And I'm always impressed with our group showing up and putting hours, like whenever we put together an event, like it, it's countless hours of time that goes into it. And we're really impassioned to continue. Like we, yes, we're feeling, we're feeling the weight of time um, on this process, but I think more so we felt like the rug got pulled out from under us um, with this change. And we are really passionate to continue if, if given that time, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I, I, I totally agree. And I'm just wondering, um, cause I don't have the answer. Maybe I'll ask administration, but maybe you have the answer. Do you know how many other communities might be in a similar position to you right now? I think I've heard there's 21 projects that is in the same position. Okay, and maybe I'll jump over to Laura if she wants to add to that. Yeah, I, I think that number is correct from my understanding as well, yep. Okay, and then, um, okay, thank you. That's, that's good to know. Um, it sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it's uh, just a handful of what uh, what we're working on uh, citywide with all of our communities. So, Jennifer, what's a realistic deadline for you? And uh, in a perfect world, what would your timeline be? That's always been a really hard question to answer because you know it's it's very hard to predict what our fundraising efforts will bring in. It's it's kind well, I'm of. I'm sure all world over. events don't put a damper in that. 
Yeah. Um, like pandemics and inflation. Yeah, I, I, I felt like we had a chance of having, you know, funds in place beyond 26, 26 27. Um, I'm not trying to drag out the project at all because we really have the need for a park now. Um, but even if we could just, you know, come up with some extra funds for some seating areas or even just have the ability to phase it. And we're not sure how that will work under the new amenities program. So even no. if we had to, to have a smaller budget and build something within the, the um, city's budget cycle, but having the promise of being able to continue to work to do something more is something that we're really interested in doing. Absolutely. So that didn't I'm really answer, but. <laughs> thank you to you and to everyone who came out to speak. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And we're at uh, 3.30 right now. So we take a 15 minute break at this point and then we'll be back at 3.45 and we'll continue with questions to the speakers, okay? Thank you.
Um, good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mayor Sohi, are you online there? I don't believe he is. He may join us later. And Councillor Wright is here in person with us. Hello. Uh, next, we'll go to Councillor Rice for questions. Okay, so I, I would like to start to thank everyone and then for your patience, wait for so long uh, to have your opportunity to present and your inputs and your perspective. So my first question uh, goes to Ms. Uh, Jen Weaver. Yeah. Um, so I heard the concern about inequity and from two perspectives. I just want to make sure my understanding is correct. So the first one is about the funding size, the funding amount. Yes, which is what um, I believe the administration outlined why there needs to be a change uh, to the program. So yes, yeah. there's that one. And then the inequity of most programs un or most park spaces under the NPDP kind of set up a projected timeline, but depending on funds, that timeline would always shift. Um, and they were also granted the ability to phase projects. And we're, we've been, we, that's been taken away from us. So that's where there's a little bit more inequity placed on us. And so what I heard is more about the Incons inconsistent, inconsistent or this standardized approach and for the different projects. So that is what I heard. So I will confirm with the city administration from that perspective and to ensure we have that standardized guidance in place and apply to the, all the uh, pro projects. So not only for those project to use this way and a different project to use different way. So that is what I heard. So the second, uh, the point from all the speakers that really common, uh, so anybody can, uh, can jump in. Uh, what I heard is the lack of the uh, support for the sufficient fund and for our community or schools pre-grant. So that is what I heard very clear. I I, I just want to make sure my understanding is correct. And I heard from like school and also from uh, our individual uh, citizens and also from community league's perspective as well. I can speak to that in terms of schools for a while now haven't been built with playgrounds and the NPDP model supported community initiatives to ensure that they had input and vision around playgrounds and schools. And so that is a concept that our committee has worked with and accepted uh, mm -hmm. to move forward to build a park. But given now, you know, a less than 18 month window in which to complete a project that still requires, you know, another $480,000 is just unrealistic. And so, having an extension of that time affords us more time to continue to fundraise. So, you know, my, my husband always says, if we win the lottery, the first thing we're doing is we're buying a playground mm -hmm. for that mm. park at your school so you can stop worrying about it. But since that's likely not going to happen, you know, what, what this committee is looking for is just an extension of time to continue if you will, nickel and dime fundraising until we get there. And one thing that I really admire about this committee is that, you know, sometimes I get stuck in, this is just ridiculous that we're having to do this and they, they just don't have time for it. They just say, Heather, moving forward, we've got another fundraiser plan. We're doing another event. They just won't let anything get in their way. And then when we found out not that long ago that this had all be wrapped up, I imagine to you know bring to a close a budget cycle around the old fundraising model. Um, it, it was a shock because we realized we had a very short window of time left and knew we wouldn't be able to achieve what needed to be achieved mm -hmm. in order to uh, build a playground that the community stakeholders said that they wanted. And so it's not just about even the school, but it's about all stakeholders going through the process of the NBDB model. And, and it's not lost on us or me as a principal of the school that 
I'm working with a, gr a group of parents who have the means and the capacity to advocate for something like this. And that's why we're in support of, of the new model coming forward because it yeah. will have more equity for projects. But I, but I think it's also noteworthy that a, a strong advocation from a parent group such as this still isn't capable of meeting these kind of timelines or raising this amount of money. And so having more time to do so is, is we feel a small ask uh, to be able to continue to do something that makes everyone, you know, is a win for everyone. It's a win for the city of Edmonton. It's a win for the community. It's a win for our school. Okay, thank you very much. My time is up. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Mayor Sohi. Yeah, thank you so much. So you had to step out uh, uh, for other, other business. Uh, uh, also, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your support for the, uh, uh, the new framework uh, that we're putting together to deal with some of the inequities that has uh, uh, been uh, created because of uh, not every neighborhood is, has the same capacity. But I understand that you've been under this process and uh, now you're falling through the crack. That's about me. So how much extension do you think is, is necessary for you to be completing this project? Just give me a moment to pull up my financials that we have already. I think you raised about fifty thousand dollars already, right? Yeah, um, community-wise, fifty-three thousand, yeah. which is just our little fundraisers. Yeah. Um, we have the two hundred fifty from uh, pro provincial funding. That is good. Seventy-five from the city. We did receive uh, about twenty thousand from a community grant, and currently we are working towards um, writing a grant for the built together. Um, Blue Cross grant, so we're, we're continuing to work towards it. Our very um, conservative estimate, if we had to have funds in place by 2024, it looks like we estimated about 92,000 more of what we could put in by the end of December, um, because we do have um, a casino coming up with AGLC, so there are things in place happening, um, but we would like to you know, have just that a uh, bit more time. So if, even if we were to fundraise for the plan B, the $530,000 park, that's about $130,000 short. So you would probably need at least two years to even get to that point, dependent on grants. I mean, if we land, you know, the co-op grant at 150,000 or this uh, built together grant at 50,000, we're going to get that much more ahead. And, and we are working on that, but of course that's not guaranteed. So two years means 2026, like, like yeah, to have funds in place by 2026, I, I feel like we could make a dent in our plan. Okay. Or alternatively, have the ability to add something on in the future. Um, okay. Yeah. That itself is, I mean, it takes, I know that's the challenge with community-led projects that uh, you are required to do so much and take so much time to fundraise and build. It's just a frustration. Like I, I used to be part of my daughter's uh, uh, school and we built a park there, but it took us, oh my God, years to to get the fundraising. But you're you are on the way, right? You're on the way, and uh, so if I understand, you got fifty three or fifty three thousand of your money, two hundred fifty thousand from the province. That's secured, right? That's confirmed. Yeah, that's and, any new school build. And seventy five thousand from the city confirmed, right? Uh, okay, then you will need time to raise the rest of uh, whatever the balance is. Are there any other community, uh, 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 other organizations or communities in a similar situation that you are, you're aware of? I believe so. I think there was quite a number of us that kind of started this process with MPDP around 2020, 2021. And so there's a lot of us that are only, you know, two or three years in. And yeah. and um, I think we're the only ones here to speak today. But I do think there's a number of other playgrounds and uh, community developments that are in the same boat. Okay. All right, so today your ask is, uh, it's not about money, you will raise that money, it is about extension of the time, and that be uh, exempted. Uh, I know we use the term grandfather, but that is, uh, we are avoiding using that grandfather term because it has some racist connotations to it, right? But so that, so what you're looking for is more, you know, exempt you from the uh, 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 program in a way that you carry on beyond the expiry of the program. That's correct. Okay, got it. Okay. All right, we'll ask that question to administration. Okay, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, 
Heather, um, thanks for, for spending your summer vacation <laughs> with us today. Um, but you, you had mentioned that the province hasn't been funding playgrounds in quite some time, but, but this 250 that you've got, was, was, is that a CFEB grant or was that new school grant? My understanding is that was a new school, a oh. new school grant. Okay. And, uh, you know, I've been working in administration for over 12 years and I've been at, at numerous schools and there was a time when, you know, parks were a part of the package. A playground was part of the package of a new school, but that hasn't been the case for some time now. And so, you know, when we're looking at schools and new schools coming in, I know some of the, the new schools that have been built, Joey Moss, for example, uh, Garth Worthington, they're looking at also being in need of funding that will move a park forward. So I think that uh, it's a good start, but yeah, as it was mentioned earlier with inflation and some of the, the challenges of finding a committee who can advocate for this kind of work and grant writing, mm -hmm. et cetera, it really does limit uh, schools and neighborhoods and in, in building a park that that is so necessary for children yeah 250,000 barely puts a dent in the cost of these things right? it's just phenomenal yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. okay um, and is there any plans to to, to apply for a CFAP we're uneligible to apply for CFEP because we have the provincial funding through that uh, new school oh. development so because we did we tried to and then we were notified that we aren't eligible Okay, yeah. okay, I didn't know that. All right, thank you. Um, and then, uh, Laura, I'm wondering if you had mentioned there was 21 projects that were kind of in limbo or transition? Yeah, so yeah. that was my understanding is there's about 21 that have moved over, like that are being extended. So okay. to use it, um, Mayor Sohi's okay. words. But I think, um, I think there are some other organizations, some other leagues in particular that I can speak to that you know, have formed with their parent councils that have been a bit left behind. If they weren't ready that October 15th for 2022, I'm just not totally sure where they landed. And as we can hear today, you know, some of them have landed where they're having to now get into a whole new stream. Um, and others, I think just w what we're concerned about is that they're, they're on the edge of old infrastructure, right? So these folks are with a new school build, but what about for schools or groups that were wanting to rebuild their playgrounds if they weren't ready for October 15th I just don't know where they're going to where they're going to fit in for the for the order of when they'll be looked at yeah. so if they weren't able to make you know to, I guess to start things off before the the deadline then they're kind of they're really in limbo then right yeah they had to be at a certain stage um, they had to have like passed I think it was up to concept but again I want administration to to let you know they had to be at a certain stage by October 15th 2022 in order for them to to carry on with MPDP, and if they weren't at that stage, then they weren't able to. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, and I'm just wondering. Um, oh, now I've got another question here, but I think I'll ask Admin that. Um, for for the community community league operating grants, is there any indication that those would be reduced as a result of? of the new framework? I have not heard that. Okay, possibly. okay, no, I know, and I'm just asking. I'm just thinking of other funding. <laughs> I'm just thinking of other funding sources that the community leagues use. Um, and so, man, maybe I'll, I'll ask and mend that as well, too. Um, yeah, and generally they can't use the operating grant or the CLIP grant can't be used on things outside of their treasury tight license land. Okay, okay. Um, and, oh, in the... Um, in the engagement that was done with the community leagues, I noticed the list seems to be the more established community leagues. Did, did the request go out to, to all community leagues, including new ones? Do you know? Yeah, we sent okay. it out. Um, we, it was a bit of a tight timeline. It was last spring. And so, you know, June is not always the best time for engagement, but it's yeah. the time that we had. And so, you know, we, do, we did send it out a couple times uh, through our newsletter and through direct emails. Um, so I, I think probably generally speaking, it's the leagues that probably have done the most builds or have the most sort of investment. Um, which might speak to again some of the inequities in the in the program. Okay, but, that's what um, I was wondering. Those were, okay, those were the ones that came. So. Okay, um, yeah, the newer ones don't necessarily have that volunteer base, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm out of time. Thank you. That looks like.
that is it for questions to the speakers, except uh, Councillor Paquette, more questions to the speakers or to administration? Okay, to administration. So I'll just ask our speakers, if you don't mind, you can sit back at those chairs. I hope you can stay with us for the rest of the conversation. You can make yourself comfortable at those chairs and I'll invite administration to come on up. Okay, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so um, just a few questions, just to just to get it on the record. Um, how many projects are sort of in the same position or similar position as uh, Soraya Hafez that need funding secured by 2024? Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Um, we currently have a roughly 21 MPDP projects that submitted prior to the October 15th deadline, uh, but Soraya Hafez has been the most vocal about the funding challenges to date. So we, we actually haven't heard much from the other 21. Okay, and, and very, very quickly, high level, what's the rationale for the project deadline? We know it's budget related, but uh, from your perspective. Yeah, it, it twofold. One is some of the discussion we had earlier was we were trying to ensure that we had a good handle on how many projects were going to be advanced through 23 to 26. And as you know, we were at budget through December. So it was trying to ensure that those capital budget asks were appropriate for what we knew was coming in through the transition from MPDP and then ultimately trying to phase it out through this budget cycle through 2026. So it was in line with the four year capital budget. Okay. All right, so makes sense on paper for sure. I get it. Okay, so um, shifting gears a little bit, where does uh, Soraya Hafez fall on the priority for parks funding under the new community parks framework? Uh, so currently, because they were advancing through MPDP, we had secured funding through the funding that was identified through the capital budget for MPDP, and so they weren't prioritized through uh, the community parks framework process as they were advancing through MPDP. Right. Sometimes we ask questions we know the answer to. Uh, but uh, <laughs> lastly, um, like, how do we get this playground and other similar, not grandfathered as the mayor said, uh, similar legacy projects advanced while transitioning from NPDP to the new framework, considering the fact that these timelines just may not work. Uh, thanks, pa Councillor Paquette. I think, you know, right now we are working towards the 2024 deadline to have all funds in place, which would then allow administration to deliver through 2025 and warranty through 2026. So we're meeting the capital budget timelines. We are, you know, prepared to work with these com communities. We know that MPDP projects historically have taken many years and so uh, I think we're, we're at the point right now where we're thinking that in 2024 we would assess where all the projects are at and then determine if an extension is needed but we want to do it in a more wholesome way a uh, fulsome way with with all 21 projects being assessed to see who can who, yeah. you know who, what the challenges are for everyone okay uh, madam chair I think I've got a, a motion that might help with that would you like me to Put it forward right now or um, come back around with it sure if you have a motion you can present it now okay sure um, and I think the clerks have it I'll just double check with Chris I just received it so just reading through it we'll get it loaded once you read it in I'll tell you what uh, uh, madam chair I'll swing back around in order to give clerks time to take a look at that all right sounds good we'll go next to you mr. mayor yeah thank you so much so the 21 projects that are in this uh, uh, dilemma uh, do they have all, all of them have their provincial and the city money secured? So all 21 projects are different, Amir yeah. Sohi, yeah. and so and some might be just a gazebo and some lighting. So they, they, they all differ. I would, I can't, I don't have a list of just okay, the playgrounds, that, but this is the ask. only one that I'm aware of that has the provincial funding. Got it. Maybe let me ask another, another way. Uh, how many of these 21 projects at this time, as you said, no one has asked for extension other than uh, 
on the uh, this row of his school, right? Uh, but they might be asking for extension, uh, but they will be able to finish their, pro but do they have, all have to finish their projects by, what what is the deadline, uh, 2024? Yes, yeah, so our aim was to, for all of the projects to have their funding in place by 2024 so that we could this deliver. December 2024? That's right, end of 2024, so we could then procure through 2025 and actually deliver those projects through 2025 and complete them by 2026. So what would be the challenge for administration if, uh, say, half of those projects or five of those projects were to go beyond the extend, extension or deadline required to fundraise? Like, what, what are the implications that you're seeing from your point of view that will become a challenge for you to not give them the extension? So I guess, um, Mayor Sohi, ultimately we would carry it forward as a recommendation through the capital budget if we needed to hold those additional funds okay. in order to deliver them. Yeah. And it, it would really be a, a budget process for us to okay. extend. Oh, that being said, you know, it does take staff resources to continue to work with these communities to advance those projects. So there is a bit of staff time, but also the capital budget request. Oh, so the, the capital budget process, I understand, because we do kind of roll over money from one capital budget to the other, so that that may not be a huge challenge, but on the resource side, because if you're gonna end this program, right, then res uh, city staff resources that you're talking about, right, do we have a sense? Are we talking about one year? In this case, it's two-year extension in this in this school's case. But like, how many resources are we talking about? It's really hard to tell. Yeah, it's and it's so dependent on the on the size and type of project. Some of them are quick, and we can and we can work through them within a year or two. Okay. Some of them, like this one, is much larger, much larger investment for the community, and they take longer. So what I'm hearing is that you're willing to work with all of these 21. Uh, uh, projects, right, and uh, communities, and as need be, willing to grant them extensions. You are hearing that, yes, Councilor Mayor Ma Sohi, and I think our, our intention is to look in 2024, and if we need to come back with an update to council or committee, we can certainly do that. Okay, all right. Uh, you had that con conversation with uh, the school folks? We've had a number of conversations. We currently to date with Sarah Hafez, we've looked at the two options, as they mentioned, about scaling back their projects so they could deliver some kind of amenity at, at the price tag of roughly 500000 or 800000 So we've given them several options. We've had lots of discussions with the community. Um, what you, I think what we all heard today is they're looking for an extension to deliver the larger option. Got it. Okay, so if they want to deliver the larger option, uh, you will grant them extension, work with them, right? I just want to know you're on the same, you're, you, that you're on the same uh, common understanding. At this point in time, Mayor Sohi, we're recommending that all community groups work towards the 2024 deadline. Yeah. We are working with them to meet that. If in 2024 we're seeing that many of the community groups can't meet that deadline, we're going to have to reassess and, of course, come, come back to committee and council with an update. Okay, so maybe that's where the confusion is. Yes. Then, because they're looking for certainty now because right. they can continue fundraising, but you cannot give them certainty. I think we're early in the budget okay. cycle and we're working with those 20 other, 21 other community okay. groups and, and we'll know more in the coming months. Okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll see what the Constitutional uh, uh, Paquette's motion is, but I think, you know, we need to figure out a way. Uh, we, you know, we need to make sure that communities that have fundraised, uh, they have a plan in place that they should be able to deliver on that pla uh, plan. We, have, we need to have some flexibility in there. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. If I need to, I'll come back for a second round. Okay, sounds good. And thank actually, we'll come back at some because they have other questions. <laughs> okay. Equity, equity part here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. So, what I heard is there are two challenges here, and one is about the time, and then during the transition piece. Uh, so, I think the Councillor Picard and the Mayor Sohi brought very good points for that. So, but I'm going to look at it from different angle and then specific from funding source perspective because that's his, actually that's his fundamental factor will resolve the timeline issue as well. Um, so, based on the report here and we indicated very clear and we have the uh, project or already advanced before October 15, 2022 under um, 
NPDP and the program, but that NDPT is going to retire soon. Um, from financial perspective, $4 million is already fully allocated and to the project advanced before that deadline, right? So and based on the information in the report. There's two MPDP pots at this point in time. Yeah. There's one that's growth and one that's renewal. And so the renewal um, co portion was four million. This is yeah. a growth project, which I think we allocated five million in the budget for partnership. Um, uh, so I'm, I will go to that on 5.5 .5 million dollars later. So I, I want to get the confirmation from first four million dollars. That one is already approved under 2023-26 budget is already allocated based on the reports you provided here. And however, there are another $6 million. $6 million and in the report indicated um, will be allocated to advanced renewal priority. But this $6 million already approved also, right? So in 3200, CM 3200, which is a renewal composite, we have four million allocated to MPDP and six million allocated to the renewal priorities that were prioritized through the community parks framework. So we use the community parks framework to identify our renewal priorities. Uh, but this, you don't have the six million dollars approved. Is it under the unfunding package? No, the six million is under 3,200, which was approved through the budget process. It is part of a renewal composite. Okay, so then my related questions about in the proposed capital budget, uh, page 657, that is $5.5 .5 million, and under community park amenities growth profile. So that one is unfunded. That remained unfunded through the capital budget process, correct. Uh, but that one is more uh, under the new approach. But for other million dollars, millions of dollars already approved is under the old approach. We try to wrap up for the old one. There is a combination. So the combination. We are, because the focus for the capital budget process was renewal priorities, we have advanced renewal of MPDP projects and renewal of projects prioritized under the community parks framework. The only growth funding for neighborhood community parks was the five million of partnership dollars identified for MPDP. There was no funding, growth funding identified for community parks amenities outside of MPDP. But what, what I heard today from today's conversation and even from previous public speakers, but we do need, we do say that needs for the community park amenities. So right now we're only talking about the pre-grant, but the community amenities is not only cover the pre-grant. There are many other communities as well, right? Yes. So, and also, uh, if that is the case, uh, I'd rather see this conversation at a council level, not only focus on pre-grant. And pre-grant is really important piece, but that one we need to finish and under the motion and uh, Councillor Pracat may provide it, will provide it later. And, but I also I would like to have that opportunity for Council to discuss our community park amenities and how that amenities could really and support the presentation mentioned about the new approach, new implementation for the Edmonton Green Network strategy and also community parks framework as well. So, Madam, Madam Chair, I have the motion and I prepared already, and then should I put it right now or put? Sure, you can put it on right now. Give me one second, I get the wording here from City Kirk already. So that administration bring forward an unfunded capital profile for consideration during the 2023 supplement capital capital budget adjustment is that provides one time funding of 5.5 million to the community parks amenities growth program as outlined in the July 11th that's today 2023 urban planning and economy reports UPO 1630 
Thank you, Councillor Rice. We do have a motion on the floor. Uh, Clerk Martin, I just wanted to ask you a question. We still can um, vote on two motions for this item, correct? Correct. Depending on what they are, um, you could have this main motion and a subsequent later as right. an example. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rice. Next, we'll go to Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you. Um, I have some maybe general questions about the report. I, you know, obviously I can understand there's a lot of uh, concerns and uncertainty, but it also sounds like there's a, administration has a commitment to work with groups and there's other checkpoints that's coming up um, that, you know, we'll, we'll hear about the updates, whether or not, you know, that's working out. So um, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and I also just wanna say, you know, I really enjoy this report. I thought it was actually fairly clear. Um, and I really appreciate the approach in thinking about parks amenity. Um, I just, I, I guess there's a part about how uh, the urban park management plan updates coming back for Q1 2024, after which you'll be looking at the equity assessment and the prioritization of park development. I'm wondering how long this next phase would take. This phase of equity assessment and prioritization. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Tang. I think what our team is working on is um, uh, getting underway probably early Q1 of 2024. Uh, we're currently just refining our description of work, scope of work, and uh, consultant procurement work uh, through um, Q3 2023. Uh, so I would anticipate the bulk of work to play out in 2024. Um, that initial update to council will probably be a highlight, highlighting the approach that we're taking and um, in, as much information as we have available. Um, but so, that the analysis will probably be 2024, 25. Okay, great. Thank, that's helpful. Thank you. And then, and, and you're working with, for example, leagues to understand what amenities we do have and would need to refresh, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and I guess just a, a, a bit of a question on um, on parks, not on sorry, on non-city-owned land, like school board land, I know this has come up quite a bit um, in the past, and I'm just wondering any if any of the conversations at the joint use agreement table together with this current framework, is it is it helping to, um, how is that going? You know, is it helping to clarify some issues there? Uh, I would say the conversations are playing out concurrent, so absolutely. Okay. Um, It'll be an ongoing discussion, but uh, we do recognize that um, that component is an important component, uh, both as part of the joint use agreement and how we reconcile that through brief implementation. And I imagine um, maybe those conversations will provide some clarity on directions, um, but ultimately it still comes down to a funding question, would it not? Yes. Okay, and uh, and that's not necessarily related to the, the, the funding that's in, encompassing the motion here, but it will be further down the road. Correct. Because it will be non-city owned land. Um, and and so with some of these uh, different neighborhoods, we're talking about uh, really a lot of issues seen in mature neighborhoods and, and, and newer developing neighborhoods. And I'm wondering if you can clarify how this framework applies in these two instances. Uh, sorry, Councillor Tang, in terms of new development and redeveloping areas, is that your question? Yeah, exactly, because, you know, in the in the developing area, in the new developing area, it's, you know, the developers who, who put in these amenities, and I'm, I'm just, if you can just kind of uh, clarify for me how the framework will be applied sure. in these different instances. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Tang, uh, for the clarification. I, so I guess for clarity, first thing is, we know that the one of, one of the reasons we advanced the community parks framework is because for the last two budget cycles, the partnership, um, the, the opportunities for community to advance renewal of amenities wasn't advancing. And so we had 
identified partnership dollars or MPDP dollars for renewal of amenities, but they weren't advancing. And so under the community parks framework and under that uh, amount that uh, Councillor Rice identified, six million, we're able to actually advance those parks and those park amenities that are in the most need of renewal. And so it now allows us to prioritize the renewal where appropriate. On the growth side, we still are advancing um, community park amenities where we're doing the grade level seed or GLS is our common term for that. And so there's, there, we are still advancing that. Uh, the big change, and I think we, this is where some of these um, challenges are with, with some of the, the recent school announcements, but we will be developing the playgrounds and base level amenities as part of the grade level seed. So that'll be, an, um, a, there will be an increased provision levels under the community parks framework and the playgrounds will go in at the same time as base level development. So I, I think we will start to see some changes once the funding's in place and we're able to advance that. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you, so the, the amenities don't just include playgrounds. Like we're looking at benches, we're looking at covered picnic tables, um, I know there's a, there's a park in, in, in my ward that also has adult fitness equipment to work out with. Um, I don't know how popular that is. Okay, so, th so this is everything that will be considered in this framework, all, all those different amenities. Yes, yeah, so on okay. page four of the report, yeah. Councillor Wright, we have identified what's core, secondary, and specialty amenities. Right. Okay, okay. And then, um, lost my train of thought. Oh, I was just wondering, have we gone out at all and asked those 21 groups if, if they think they're going to meet the deadline? Or we're just waiting for them to tell us that they can't? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, those projects that advanced past checkpoint one, we have project managers assigned and are engaging with those community groups. We haven't specifically asked. They're all working towards that, but we haven't polled them. We are also in the first seven months of the budget cycle. And so we're, you know, we're still working through that in the hopes that the 2024 deadline will be reasonable for most of them. Okay, and um, I, I understand there's a significant um, needs assessment that's done. So if, they, if this group has to scale back, do they have to go out and do another, like a reassessment of, of the community needs for what's supposed to be scaled, what might need to be scaled back? I don't believe that no. would be required. Okay, no. okay, that's good. Um, and then so there is still the option for them, like next year we can look at maybe extending their... I think we're their, prepared to do that, yes, okay. Councillor Wright. Okay, um, and then... Oh, and you said there was gonna be no change to community-led process. So that's still the community doing the needs assessment and all that stuff. What if a community league or another organization just wants to pay for some amenities up front themselves? Can they make those arrangements to do that on city land? So to date, we, we do have that through the uh, community garden process. And um, I, I think there, there are rare cases where that's happening where it's a straight donation. They still have to meet our provision, the provision levels and we have to meet CSA standards. So there are some challenges with that. For the most part, we are directing communities to the community-led process where they can put amenities on league licensed land and the community garden process. Okay, so they can't just say, I wanna buy 10 benches and put them on some land somewhere. That is not a process we use at this point in time. Okay, thank you very much, that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, uh, so I just wanna loop back to give some certainty to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, folks from the uh, Soroya Hafiz School, right? They're here, they have an issue. I just wanna get your thought, like how do you, I know you're working with this deadline, right? And you might have to come back but they need some certainty today that uh, if they need to go, which, which they would have to go beyond 2024, right, that you will work with them to grant an extension. I, 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 our answer is yes. I mean, our preference ultimately from administration is that we take a, an equitable approach and try and work for everyone towards the 2024 deadline. If they cannot meet that for the small or the larger uh, options yeah. they've pursued, we can we can certainly do that. Okay. I, I hope you'll have that conversation with them, right? Sure. Because, you know, we want to, uh, if they're ready to fundraise and do that, right? So extension is, I think it's, it's you know, very reasonable 
request, right? So I absolutely got to keep other other projects in mind as well. I want to come back to the inequities that the uh, uh, NPDP program has created. Uh, moving forward, I know you have money for renewal under the community parks framework, uh, but you don't have money for growth. Um, can you give us further breakdown around, uh, you know, the the core amenities and the secondary amenities have, as you define in the in 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 the report uh, and the uh, uh, you know have core secondary and specialty, right? Uh, can you give us a more breakdown about like? which communities are lacking core? Because uh, I hear from north side, uh, you know, developers in the southwest and west and others build amenities as they build parks and others, right? There are kind of cores to some scale. I want to get a sense, because I really want to ap apply this equity lens to the entire city and catch up on some of the inequities that I hear about, particularly from north side of the city. Can you give us a breakdown, not maybe today, but as you bring forward the unfunded service package uh, that will hone in a little bit more and provide us more details on the uh, inequities related to core uh, uh, aspect of the amenities. Is that possible? Yes, we can certainly do that. The map in the council report does provide a bit of that on, at a general level, Mayor Sohi. We do know where the inequities currently exist. And that being said, we also know there is the 250 uh, partnership dollars from the province. And previously, we, you know, we were planning to advance playgrounds development where we had partnership dollars. That was always, you know, where, where we can leverage existing funding. We were going to start there. Uh, but then through future budget approvals, ultimately, yeah. or budget requests, uh, hopefully start to address the yeah. inequity. I know you identify Northeast, Northwest, Southwest, West Handy, Ellerslie, White Mud, but they are based on all, all three categories, core, secondary, and specialty. What I'm interested in, uh, breakdown of that further and understanding which communities are actually lacking the core. Amenity. We can certainly come back to that, that. That's within 400 meters of, uh, that's the distance, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, the so because in order to have that discussion, uh, how much at uh, the maybe I'll stop here because I, I that's that's where I want to get maybe have that discussion during the uh, during the during the during the budget discussion. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Anyone to speak to it? Councillor Rice, would you like to close? Uh, thank you very much, and then I really appreciate today's conversation and also the opportunity for us to heard uh, during this transition piece and our communities, our schools, and face certain challenge and also some um, inconsistent or inequity issues. Um, uh, to me, I think there are two issues here. One is the transition time non-standardized process or guidance, and that one is already including our next step and in our city administration presentation. So I'm really looking forward and for that be reflected in Councillor Pricat motion and then to really address that with a specific uh, timeline to uh, resolve some uh, concerns there. And so this motion on the floor specifically want to focus on some uh, broad scope and for the community parks amenities. And because we heard uh, from our Edmontonians not, and uh, uh, during develop, from under development to the development, to the renew, and to the mature neighborhoods, and there are so many demanding and the needs for the community amenities, amenities, not only about the uh, one important piece, there are some other like spring uh, parks and other benches and other type of things and we talked about earlier. So this also covers entire city and including our downtown uh, existing park as well for how we can identify uh, the some priority and to add some amenities to the existing parks. So i really looking for the conversation and uh, will happen and in the uh, fall for our budget discussion, seeing if we could find resources to support 
those piece of developments and across our entire city, specific after COVID-19, our people are, at Mentonians get out to our community parks, we need to have more facilities, amenities to support, to enjoy their daily life. And so that is really important for the quality of life or our Edmontonians. So I hope my colleagues support this motion and we can open the opportunity for the further discussion and in the fall. And thank you very much. Thank you. I'll ask committee members to please vote now. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Councillor Paquette, do you have anything to add? Thank you, sorry, I was doing a cut and paste for the mayor. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, um, I've got uh, a subsequent motion, uh, which is great, because I don't have to ask for money in it now, um, that administration work with Legacy Neighborhood Park Development Program playground projects currently underway, including the Soraya Hafez Playground Committee to develop a phased approach to navigate through the transition period to attain the full playground amenity project completion past the previously defined 2024 fundraising deadline. And to quickly introduce it, um, I mean, it's everything that we heard today and everything that the community needs. and. Um, that administration has also said uh, they can do. So this motion um, is intended to um, address all of those uh, comments and concerns and possibilities and um, give surety both to the city and to uh, our communities. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, I just wanted to check with administration to make sure that um, it's understood that we're looking to see if um, the time could be extended, also a, a phased approach if necessary, uh, I guess depending on where or who is um, suggesting that they would like a phased approach. That's the understood. only flag I would make is that it is capital budget and so we would need approval to uh, you know, carry those funds forward from council at the, at the appropriate time. Right, okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, anyone to speak to it? Mr. Mayor? I just have a, this is great motion, thank you, Councillor uh, Paquette. Uh, I just have one question, uh, which uh, I don't wanna limit the, the community's ability or, or have some flexibility for the community because the only question I have is related to uh, the attaining the full playground amenity project completion because they may phase back or do less or more, right? So I don't want to be restricting their ability, Councillor Paquette, in a, in a way that uh, if the motion talks about full park development and amenity, that might, they may not be able to raise all the money, they may be able to raise 80% of the money. So I think give them flexibility on plan B, right? So maybe if we take out uh, the word full and just keep the attain the playground amenity project completion, uh, then they can work with the administration. Uh, give them that flexibility. Is that okay? Yeah, I, my only worry is that we, if we take out full, then uh, we may not be uh, giving the direction that uh, all of the plans get fulfilled if possible, um, and that it would leave a door open for scaling back when maybe that's not what the community is uh, interested in. Okay. So I'm, I'm open either way. Maybe maybe administration's understanding of that. How do you, how you interpret uh, the full completion? You know, as as we are trying to phase it out, our, we do we do need a, a completion deadline ultimately. If every year we're if every budget cycle we're extending the deadline, so I, I do think I, I my preference is that it it is there still is an expectation that they complete it at a certain stage, not extending past each budget cycle. Yeah. So does that does this motion give you that kind of flexibility, like uh, or uh, is is too prescriptive, right? My preference is we move away from full completion, if it, especially if they want to phase them. Yeah, is is I just gonna get, want to get a nod from the community if, if that does give you that flexibility, or you want to have a full in, included. In, I know you can't speak to it. Uh, this is the process that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll stop here, maybe, Councillor. Uh, 
Madam Speaker. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just wanted clarity on that as well to make sure that uh, the community would still have that ability to phase the project if necessary. Um, and I'm comfortable with what administration has said. Uh, Councillor Paquette, would you like to close? Uh, sure, and I'll just say, if we're worried about the, the wording of flow um, and we're having the same conversation in 2030, there may be bigger issues at hand, which might be good to flag as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I will just say uh, thank you once again to the community, the community who came out to speak. Um, this is only one small portion of the extensive efforts they make, as uh, the mayor uh, indicated earlier, the, the hours and the, and, the, and the sweat equity that people put into these things is astounding. And um, I would just say that, in my opinion, um, parks should be paid for uh, out of taxes because essentially we're making people work even harder to to uh, create a playground than if it was just right in the tax base. It would be a lot easier for families and for communities, but this is what we've got for now and uh, we will carry through, but at least this way, um, it takes some of the stress off the table, um, provides a little bit more support and um, a little bit more clarity uh, for both administration and for the community that uh, this is sort of something that council is very, very interested in. So thank you. Uh, I hope I get support from my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Please vote. We do have one councillor asking to be put on the board, so we're just putting them on right now. Okay. No, it, no. I, I asked to be on the board for questions before Councillor Paquette closed, so it's too late now. Thank you. Okay, my apologies. We'll get the vote loaded. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. So next we're off to item seven, or sorry, 8.1. Thank you everyone for being with us here today. So I'll ask administration to come forward and whenever you're ready, please uh, make an introduction or presentation. Good afternoon, committee members. At the March 20th, 2023 Community and Public Services meeting, administration was directed to provide a report summarizing information on the current status of city-enabled and city-provided Indigenous business supports. This report has been prepared in collaboration with the Social Development Branch, the Indigenous Relations Office, and outlines both the city-enabled and city-provided Indigenous business supports. Administration has identified three types of support for Indigenous businesses within Edmonton. Starting with city-provided business support, the City of Edmonton provides direct support to Indigenous entrepreneurs and businesses through the one-on-one -on -one business support service and the Economic Action Plan grant. Economic development programs and supports offered by the City are intended to be inclusive and accessible by all business owners and entrepreneurs and help them navigate city processes and overcome barriers to opening or expansion. In addition, the Indigenous Procurement Framework is working actively to create pathways for Indigenous businesses to realize social and economic impacts through the city's existing purchasing needs. The Indigenous Relations Office produces the Indigenous Edmonton Directory and Community Bulletin that has a wide range of available resources for individuals and business owners. Secondly, city-enabled Indigenous business support is support for Indigenous businesses provided by city-funded organizations. The city currently has a multi-year funding agreement with ACCESS, Edmonton's Indigenous Business and Professional Association. ACCESS provides a variety of Indigenous business supports with the vision to make Edmonton the Indigenous Business and Professional Capital of Canada. 
The City of Edmonton also provides financial support to enable the Indigenous Artist Market Collective and covers their costs to participate in the Downtown Farmers Market. Lastly, the economic development ecosystem in the Edmonton region fosters Indigenous business support provided by external organizations and other orders of government. These organizations and orders of government operate within the local business ecosystem and are vital to the success of local Indigenous businesses. Support by these external parties range from grants and funding to mentorship and business accelerators and is listed in Attachment 2 of the report. All three types of support work towards growing an inclusive and diversified economy and the implementation of Edmonton's Economic Action Plan. Administration will also continue to advance economic reconciliation through the Indigenous Framework and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Municipal Response Plan. Utilizing the Indigenous Framework as a guide, Administration's role is connecting Indigenous peoples to programs, services, people and resources that enrich the community and foster relationships to create positive change. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and we welcome any questions you may have. Well, and thank you. Next, we will go to our speaker, Brooks Hanowich. Are you online? We received notification he had to leave at 4.30. Oh, sorry, Brooks. Okay, um, so I guess we'll go to questions of administration now. Please, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. And you are muted, Councillor Paquette. Once again, don't you wish you had that in real life? Uh, so, um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't get to see Brooks' notes that he apparently sent over, uh, so we'll miss that. But uh, this is a great, uh, like, um, what do we call this? Great inquiry response. So thank you for that. And um, I just have a quick question um, with these programs. Are we measuring uptake and results, success, challenges, that sort of thing in order to sort of uh, more streamline um, and make more efficacious our offerings? That is what we uh, strive to do with all of our programs. Um, I think one of the challenges we have, uh, particularly with Indigenous business supports is, although our programs are inclusive, um, whether uh, we're supporting an Indigenous business or not is um, not mandatory for any of our programs. So that's um, disclosed um, voluntarily. So we know um, we have a small proportion of our existing uh, programs that is supporting um, Indigenous community businesses directly, but it could be much larger than that just simply because we've got a little bit of a, a data gap with our existing uh, programs, but okay. in terms of are the programs meeting the needs, especially with our grant programs, that's a requirement to um, have the results and outcomes specifically related to the intention of uh, which that funding was provided. Okay, interesting. Um, do we have a plan for closing that data gap? Given that the information related to Indigenous community is not mandatory, um, we'd have to take a look at whether we could even make um, requesting that, uh, that information mandatory for existing programs and services. When it comes to understanding the Indigenous business community in Edmonton overall, one of the things we are doing to close a major data gap is the Edmonton Business Census, which is currently being piloted in person in O'Damon Ward and then is open virtually to businesses right across the city. So it won't necessarily be specific to our programs and services we offer, but we can have a better understanding of that business community in the city of Edmonton. Okay, uh, switching gears, um, part, of, part of what we've been talking about the city of Edmonton for a while is special economic zones or uh, urban reserves and um, you know that is one way through uh, TRC and the federal government that we can also support indigenous businesses. I, I know that that wasn't contemplated in the report so I'm not trying to uh, um, get a jump on that but uh, I'm just uh, wondering if that's something that uh, we've seen any movement on. I know that Councillor Hamilton made a motion on that several years ago and I know that this is something that the mayor has spoken about as well. 
I'm wondering if Jamie from um, Indigenous Relations Office is on the line that could comment. If not, we can put a pin on that one. Seeing that there's no comments, I, I'm guessing she's not, so that's something we can follow up on. Okay, so um, rather than make a motion about that, is it possible to get a memo update on our progress to date? I, I think a memo is reasonably to, reasonable to provide you with the information that we do have. So leave that with me, Councillor Paquette, and I'll work with Indigenous Relations Office to uh, provide a memo on what we do have. Okay, and just uh, just a heads up, I might actually be uh, making a motion on that at some point in the future if it doesn't look like we're getting a lot of uh, progress, just in order to help spur that. There might be some extra uh, help that's required in order to move that work forward. Okay, and I, I, my clock didn't start, but I'm going to assume I'm out of time. Yeah, I was trying not to count in my head. Um, but uh, any, are there any other questions, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Would you like to go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Chair Principal. Uh, how, how are you like, in the, in the uh, business-friendly Edmonton uh, team, uh, the training to best support the employees of... Uh, your department to support uh, the indigenous businesses? How do we give them resources and training? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll start with this one and then hand it over to my colleagues in Business Friendly Edmonton to comment. So one of the things that we do as an approach with any business that approaches us is meet, meet them where they're at. So we sit and we first listen to find out where what needs do they have as a business community? Because not everything that they need is supported by the city of Edmonton. Okay. So when there are things that we can do to support by the city of Edmonton, we connect them to those resources or provide them directly. When it is through those city-enabled resources, we connect them to those resources. And when it is um, other um, organizations that offer services outside of the city of Edmonton, mm -hmm. um, that's where we connect them to those additional resources. So our starting place with an indigenous business or any business is looking at meeting where they're at. Now, in terms of training, we go through training in our organization that's mandatory about indigenous awareness. Okay. It's something that happens on an annual basis. So it's not just something that the business Business Friendly Edmonton team is exposed to its yeah. staff right across the organization. Okay. Tom maybe, or Jackie, anything? Yeah. Maybe to add? Uh, the reason I'm asking this question is that we we still hear from Indigenous youth and racialized youth that uh, they're having difficulty uh, kind of have navigating the resources that are available and the uh, and the grants and business support and sometimes very unique cultural specific business regalia, regalia and. Uh, ribbon skirts and others. I suggest trying to, that's what I'm trying to understand. This is an area, um, Mayor Sohi, where, um, again, if there is a, an Aboriginal business or, or youth that is trying to access city services, this is where one-on-one -on -one business supports meets with the, the um, individual one-on-one. -on -one. Now, should the staff in uh, the Business Friendly Admin team run into a space that is you know, culturally we're unfamiliar. That's where we've got Indigenous Relations so Office and other partners that we can get that advice to ensure, again, we are meeting the needs of, of the business or the individual that's looking for that business support. Go ahead, I didn't mean to stop you, but I just wanted to give you context for my question. I just wanted to add that that feedback is very helpful actually, and we're um, looking at a program review of one-on-one -on -one support in the fall. So in the spirit of continuous improvement, I do also think that um, cultural specific training and awareness for our staff specifically would be amazing and I would welcome a conversation about that and how we would better uh, better equip our staff to support all entrepreneurs yeah so the uh, I think action three in the uh, in the economic action plan speaks to uh, uh, like how, how would you have data maybe this could be part of the memo how many indigenous businesses have access to that grant Uh, at this time, we don't have any, uh, there has been no Indigenous owned businesses apply for, or sorry, receive a grant under Action 3 through the Economic Action Plan grant. Okay, how many applications have you received overall? 
I don't have the number of applications in front of me. There's uh, more than more than many dozens uh, of applications received. Mm. A number of them are still being worked through the evaluation okay. process. Yeah. Um, and a number of grants have been awarded and some have yeah. been paid Because that, that does raise, raise a flag for me because that if uh, indigenous businesses are not, not applying for that grant funding, maybe there's a gap of knowledge, right? So we might have to uh, kind of scale up some of the communications to uh, businesses to X, X, is it X, ask, ask, right? Ask, right? Access. Yeah, access, access, right? That's a great organization that work, uh, that we support as well, right? So I think just raising that awareness uh, that these support systems are available to uh, indigenous organizations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Rice. Uh, I just want to follow on uh, the Mayor Sohi's question. Uh, at access and specifically uh, I look at the access from different level and because w one and then we already discussed uh, with the question here so he asked about the 30 services but I want to ask access to the existing uh, different organization actually receive the grant to support business community for example um, Edmund Unlimited and then do we have like certain like this type of agencies who uh, that already received the city grants to provide support and access resources or training program, educational program, awareness program, and to the uh, business pro, uh, community, including uh, we're specifically talk about indigenous community here. Because that's just different level access. Councilor Rice, we would only have information um, that would pertain to the programs that we administer, uh, such as the Economic Action Plan grant. So if there are uh, other grant streams through the city that uh, might build uh, Indigenous awareness, knowledge, and those sorts of things, we wouldn't have that information at our fingertips. We could look it up for you. So you, you are able to look at that, that type of information? We can look and see what we can find out. Uh, for me to ask this question, and. I do believe the uh, support for the access to the resources and city services is not only one way and is not only the resources or services provide directly by the city and it could be different resources and the different services and from different organizations actually operated on behalf of our city because they received the funding to support the business community. I, I do want to make sure our uh, indigenous community be aware of that, that type of resources. That is why I ask that question. So to what extent the um, indigenous community is aware of resources yeah. that are delivered by city enabled as well as those other organizations yeah, yeah. that aren't city enabled. I can't speak specifically to that. That's a, something that we can work on in terms of our existing agreements and to ask that exact question, to what extent are they promoting and speaking to um, community. They have outcomes that they need to achieve in their own grant funding agreements with us. So they also have a, um, a need to be ensuring that, that their programs are also su successful. I like that point specifically <clears throat> uh, through agreement pers review perspective. And because if they receive funding from our city and then we have agreement with them and then by look at that scope of agreement and then to ensure and certain support and resources in place and it could provide additional support to our indigenous business community as well. So I just want add that point there. Okay, that's my question, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I think I will have a motion about this. So um, I'm wondering if it would be better to just recommend switch this uh, to council so we can take care of it after break, or we can just close the item now because I'm still kind of and based on the responses, I, I think I have to tweak my motion a little bit. So uh, I'll just seek some guidance from chair. We can requisition, uh, or I can start the whole process 
Fanu with a brand new motion after the break. After the, uh, the when we reconvene in council. It might be cleaner and easier to just requisition this up so we have a placeholder. The real culprit here is an excellent report. Uh, Councillor Paquette, would you uh, consider we receive this for information and then you bring a motion forward uh, at the next Yeah, so we can do that. We can receive for information and then select it a council. Even yep, that would a work notice well. of motion? Even a notice of motion today? Um, I'd like to tweak it a little bit like based on the responses. It it's got to be a little bit better than it is. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So how so about? And I, I don't want to. I don't want to send the revised version to our clerk, who then has to try to clean it up <laughs> in the remaining three and a half minutes. <laughs> but, but if thank you only, for that consideration. Uh, just clar clarification: If it's received for information, then this does not go to council. That's right. Correct. Right, so Councillor Paquette would not be able to exempt it and make a motion there. So I think the only option for him to make a motion is to requisite to Council. No. If you wish for this to go to Council, requisition is the option. If you want to come back to committee, you could do a postponement of the item, or you could receive it for information and do another motion. I'm open to all of it. Okay, whichever works for you, Councillor Paquette. Well, yeah, I was just seeking advice from the Chair on that one because... Yes. Whatever is easiest. So we could postpone it to the next committee meeting or to another committee meeting. Uh, or yeah, let's do that. Or we could, uh, or you could do a notice of motion. You don't want to do a let's, notice of motion today, but you could do a motion at another time. Would you like yeah, to let's postpone, postpone it. this? So it comes back to committee. Um, it's a smaller scale conversation, a little bit more manageable. All yeah, right. I like that. Okay. So, uh, is so I would move that we postpone. Okay, yes, and that, uh, Clerk Martin, I guess we have to vote on postponement? Yeah, we'll just, just load that right away for you. Okay, great. So let's vote on postponement, please. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Thank you. And one last process question. Because we're postponing, does that mean that we can reopen by a vote uh, to hear from public speakers so that Mr. Hanowich can uh, I give believe us his so. Thoughts? Yeah, I believe we can. We can make note of that in the okay. committee report. Yes. Great thinking. Look at you. Good job. Great. Okay, next private, You're the best, <laughs> next private reports, none. Motions pending, none. Notices of motion and motions without customary notice, none. We are adjourned at 4.58. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>